Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we riff, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month, on up as high as you want, and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there. And uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Child's Play A fan novelization of the first film by Jeremy Terry Prologue Dark Beginnings The frigid north wind blew along the streets of Chicago, Illinois, carrying the message that winter was here to stay. That spring's warming embrace was a lifetime away. Mothers and fathers lay asleep in their beds, dreaming uneasy three o'clock in the morning dreams. They shivered, but not from the cold, for a shadow had fallen over the city. It's been said that three in the morning is the soul's midnight, that more people die in their sleep at that time than any other. It is a time for fear when old men wake, listening for the cry of the death watch beetle, and roll over to hold their wives tighter. Three in the morning is a time of loss. It had been three in the morning in Chicago for more than a year now. A specter haunted the bustling streets. Charles Lee Ray sat in the passenger seat of the black van parked along the curb across from Tookie's Bar, lost in his own thoughts. He was a handsome man of thirty, well-dressed in a gray suit and fur-lined overcoat. His hair hung down to his shoulders, caught the light from the streetlight outside. He was lucky. He had a face that let him get close to people, made them drop their guard, unaware of the monster in their midst. By the time they found out what he truly was, it was already too late. Eighteen times. Eighteen useless pieces of trash that he had given purpose. Their pitiful short lives may have been worthless, but their souls were not. He remembered the feel of their skin against the palms of his hands as he squeezed the life out of them. He cherished the memory of his voice as he said the prayer, as he made the offering to the great Dambala, and he knew that Dambala was pleased. Chicago had not known such fear since the 70s, when the fat sodomite John Wayne Gacy had terrorized the city in his clown suit. The fat fuck had gotten 33 before he slipped up. Charles would take more, so many more before he was finished. He thought about his teacher, John Elsop Bishop, the man called Dr. Death by the fearful down in Little Haiti, where he held sway. Charles laughed to himself, thinking that he would never be finished thanks to John's teachings, thanks to the great Dambala. Wet smacking sounds and a stifled burp to his left, Charles grimaced and glanced to the side as his sometimes partner, Eddie Caputo, Eddie was a few years younger than Charles with shaggy dark hair and sunken eyes. Eddie stared out the windshield at Tookie's, unaware that he was being watched. 
He lifted a greasy cheeseburger to his lips and took a huge bite, stuffing his cheeks with shredded meat and chewing noisily like a big dumb cow chewing its cud. Smack, smack, smack. Charles saw a bead of grease or drool dribble down the man's chin and felt his blood boil. Hey, Eddie, Charles said through gritted teeth. Do you think you could chew any louder? It's fucking disgusting. Eddie froze with the burger halfway to his glistening lips, his skin growing pale in the ghostly glow from the van's dashboard. He glanced over and blanched at the anger that he saw burning in Charles' eyes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chucky. I, uh, I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. Eddie's warm breath washed over Charles, and he recoiled against the passenger side door, covering his mouth and nose with one hand. Jesus Christ, Eddie! What do you use to brush your teeth with? Your own shit? Eddie shifted his face away, really scared now. Charles had been on edge the last couple of days. There had been problems with his girlfriend, Tiffany, and some pregnant woman Charles had been seeing on the side. Shit like that is why Eddie never saw a broad more than once. Fuck them and forget them. That was his motto. That and occasionally, fuck them and kill them. He felt the reassuring weight of his forty-four Magnum revolver in the shoulder holster beneath his left arm, and wondered if he would even have time to reach for it if Charles snapped. There was movement across the street and Charles turned away. Eddie breathed a sigh of relief, thinking it might be time to make a powder after tonight, thinking that he might need to get out while the getting was good, before Charles unraveled and took him down with him. The woman was tall, her hair and face obscured by the thick orange scarf she had wrapped around her head against the cold. She stepped out of the bar onto the sidewalk and paused for a moment, glancing around. She wore a pink dress patterned with white flowers. Charles stared daggers at the dress. His mother wore dresses like that. Charles remembered the dresses and the cloying scent of whiskey on her breath as she beat him. Mina Ray was an abusive alcoholic midget who blamed all the big people for her problems because Charles's father had been a big person and he had left them before Charles was born. Charles had grown up afraid that he would be just like her, and had been ecstatic when he found out he wouldn't be. Mina Ray was furious. She lashed out at him, shouting that he was just like his bastard father. Charles bore the abuse for years until one day he realized that he could literally pick her up and throw her like a rag doll. Oh, how he had laughed that afternoon, and how she had screamed. That was until he wrapped his fingers around her scrawny little neck and cut off her air supply. She'd been his first. He studied the woman across the street as she started walking and nodded to Eddie. She would be the next. Eddie shifted the van into gear and pulled slowly away from the curb. The woman didn't seem to notice. They're all sheep, Charles thought. They're completely blind to the wolves around them. Eddie pulled the van up behind the woman and stopped. Charles got out and started up the sidewalk. Eddie hit the gas and drove up the street, turning right at a corner half a block away. Charles studied the woman as he paced her. She glanced over her shoulder, realizing that she was being followed. She walked faster, and Charles grinned. He loved this part, the chase, the fear, the tears. It wouldn't be long now. Oh, how she would beg, and oh, how he would savor it. There was an alley ahead on the right. It was time. Charles charged forward and dragged the woman into the dark between the buildings. She tried to pull away, but froze when he held his knife up in front of her eyes. His heart raced, excitement built. This was what life was all about, sports fans. He reached out and took a handful of the scarf. Okay, bitch, let's see what you look like. The woman moved quick as lightning, and pain exploded between Charles's legs as she kneed him in the balls. Charles collapsed to the wet concrete, the knife falling forgotten to the ground as he clutched his throbbing testicles. He looked up in shock as the woman discarded her scarf 
and dress to reveal the rugged, tan face of a man dressed in jeans and a brown leather jacket. His hair was black, his chin strong and chiseled, the picture of an American hero. What? Am I pretty enough for you? Detective Lieutenant Mike Norris asked, kicking the knife away from Charles's hand. Fuck you, pig, Charles moaned. He rolled over, trying to catch his breath, trying to get his feet under him. Mike pulled a pair of sneakers out of the purse dangling from his left shoulder and kicked off the high heel shoes that he'd been wearing. He glanced down to step into them. Now was Charles's chance. He surged to his feet, grabbing a metal garbage can and bringing it down on Mike's head. Mike fell onto his back and Charles ran for the mouth of the alley. Seconds later, he heard the cop's footfalls behind him. Charles turned the corner and fled up the sidewalk in the direction Eddie had driven. They had planned it all out. He knew Eddie would be waiting around the corner for him to bring the broad. All Charles had to do was reach him and he would be home free. Mike raced out of the alley, drawing his 38 revolver from the hidden holster under his jacket and shouting into the police wire taped to his chest. I got the strangler! He's at the corner of Wabush and Van Buren! Fuck! Charles thought as he rounded the corner and drew his own gun from an overcoat pocket. He's calling for backup! He looked ahead and saw the black van idling a hundred feet away. He was going to make it. Mike turned the corner and brandished his firearm. Stop, Ray! There's nowhere else to run! There was a parked car ahead. Charles leapt over the hood and slid to the ground on the other side, just as Mike fired a shot. <laughs> the bullet spanging off the car's front fender. Charles crouched behind the hood and snapped off a shot of his own, <laughs> driving Mike back around the corner. Charles turned and ran out into the street, waving for Eddie. Mike glanced around the edge of the building, saw that the strangler was running and fired. The bullet took Charles in the lower leg, sending him sprawling across the macadam. Fire seared Charles's leg, and he cried out. He heard sirens shrieking and tires squilling as a patrol car sped around the corner behind him. Charles limped towards the van as fast as his injured leg would allow. Eddie, help me! The van's taillights flared on, and then the vehicle was speeding away from the curb away from Charles. <laughs> Charles stared after in horror. This couldn't be happening. He was blessed by Dambala. He wasn't supposed to go down like this. Eddie! He screamed. Don't leave me! Oh God, no! The cop blurred past him in pursuit of the traitor. Charles wished the Flatfoot the best of luck. It would be better for Eddie if the cop caught him and put him away for the rest of his life. Life in prison would be far better than what Charles was going to do to him if he ever saw the bastard again. Footsteps behind. The hero was coming on strong. Charles whirled to the right, onto the sidewalk, and under the awning of a garish toy store. The sign overhead read, Play Pals. Charles leaned out and fired at Mike. Driving him behind the parked car, he leapt over moments before. Give it up, Ray! Mike shouted. It's all over! Fuck that! Charles thought as he eyed the street for a way out of the trap he was in. Fuck that and fuck you! No escape that way. He turned to the toy store and shot the lock. <laughs> the bullet punching a black eye in the hardware. He kicked the door in and limped inside. The burglar alarm began to blare, sending a spike of pain through his fevered head. Garish advertisements covered every free surface of the store in primary colors. Stuffed animals sat beside miniature tools and trucks. Action figures and dolls. Dolls everywhere, all with the same freckled face and red hair. Charles passed by the registers deeper into the store. He had seconds at the most before the cop came sniffing along this trail. He reached an intersection and turned left where a large display of a medieval castle dominated the aisle. He slipped behind it and waited.
Detective Lieutenant Mike Norris was scared. He knew what he should do. He should secure the scene and wait for his partner or other officers to arrive before he cleared the building. That would be the safe thing to do. Ray was injured and his getaway vehicle was gone. Surely he wouldn't get far. Backup would arrive and they would find the creep huddled in a corner inside. The city rejoices. Schedule the ticker tape parade because the good guys triumphed again. But what if he waited and Ray did manage to escape? The next dead body would be on his head and Mike couldn't live with that. He took a deep breath to still his pounding heart and broke from cover. He scanned the front of the toy store, saw no movement, and walked inside. The alarm sang its siren song, making it almost impossible to hear if Ray was nearby. He raised his revolver, taking comfort from the mean weight of it. He passed the checkout counter and paused, kneeling down to examine a single drop of blood that marred the pristine tile floor. Bingo! He looked farther along the aisle and saw another blotch ten feet along where the shells formed an intersection. Mike moved along the path to the branch. Movement at the edge of his vision. He spun, relying on muscle memory earned from countless hours on the firing range. And there was Ray. The freak was hiding behind a display. Mike registered the gun in the killer's hand and fired his own. The round passed through the toy castle's window, and Ray spun out of sight with a strangled cry. I got him in the chest. There's no way he can get away now. Mike ran forward, revolver at the ready. He jumped around the display, and Charles Lee Ray was gone. Blood poiled on the floor where he had landed. It dripped from the shelves behind the castle and ran in rivulets down a poster of one of the red-headed dolls taped to the wall. Ray's overcoat lay abandoned five feet down the next aisle. Mike followed the path until it reached another intersection and paused to look around. The blood trail stopped there. Ray was in the wind. Charles stumbled along a dark aisle near the back of the store his slow progress marked by the beady eyes of countless fairy tale critters. He tried to take a deep breath and pulled fire into his lungs. He coughed a fine mist of blood into the hand, not holding his perforated chest, and moaned. He leaned against the wall between two shelves and looked down at himself. The gray suit was soaked through with gore. He could feel it running down his chest beneath his shirt to pull at his waist. He took another breath and felt a strange sucking sensation from his chest wound. He couldn't seem to catch his breath. Oh, God, he whispered. I'm dying. He was special. He had Great Dimbala's favor. Things were not supposed to go like this. He clamped a hand over his chest, trying to plug the hole, and felt hatred blossom in his rotten soul. He took a deep breath and gave vent to the vitriolic rage inside. You hear me, you son of a bitch! I'm gonna get you for this! I'm gonna get you, and I'm gonna get Eddie! No matter what! Charles coughed again, and he moaned as the pain in his chest deepened. It felt like something inside had ruptured when he screamed. This was agony far beyond anything he had ever endured before. This made all the beatings he took at the hands of his bitch mother feel like a gentle breeze. He pushed away from the wall and staggered on, clutching the shelves for support. Darkness was inching in at the edge of his vision, bringing numbness with it. He was running out of time. I gotta find somebody, he said. I gotta find somebody. He reached the end of the aisle, tried to turn, and and went sprawling into a shelf piled to the ceiling with large yellow boxes. They tumbled down on top of him in an avalanche. Charles rolled over on his side. He tried to stand and found that he didn't have the strength.
I'm never gonna get up again, he thought with wonder. I'm gonna die here on the floor in the middle of this shitty little toy store. And all the gree gree John taught me isn't gonna amount to a damn thing. If only someone would come near. Why wasn't there a security guard? Where was the depressed manager working late to avoid his miserable wife and bratty kids? If only... Charles turned his head and saw the freckled face of one of the dolls staring back at him from the cellophane window in the front of its box. It was dressed in a rainbow-colored shirt and blue overalls, and its eyes were the color of a cloudless afternoon sky. An idea bloomed in his twisted mind then. The prayer was only meant for humans. Could it work? Charles fumbled with the box, smearing it with his life's blood, and managed to get the lid open. He reached inside and pulled the good guy doll out. This must be the biggest goddamn toy store in the state of Illinois, Mike thought as he turned down yet another empty aisle. No, check that. I bet it's the biggest toy store in the continental United States. Why in the hell do they need a store so big? You hear me, you son of a bitch. I'm gonna get you, and I'm gonna get Eddie. The hair stood up on the back of his neck. He had made more than his fair share of enemies over his career in law enforcement, and this was far from the first time a perp had threatened to kill him. And yet, Mike had never heard such raw hatred in another person's voice. It had reverberated from the very walls in almost physical waves. How had the man shouted like that? The shot in the chest almost certainly punctured a lung. He should be drowning in his own blood, unable to draw breath. You better be careful, bud. He might be livelier than you think, lively enough to make good on his promise. The chanting started then, seeming to come from every direction at once. Give me the power I beg of you! Mike spun on the spot, trying to pinpoint the direction the voice was coming from. He grimaced as the chanting continued, the nonsensical gibberish like fingernails on a chalkboard. Something very bad was happening. Mike moved towards the center of the store, where a mountainous display of good guy dolls reached up to the skylight overhead. There was a low rumble he felt in his chest, a flash of light. Mike looked up at the skylight and felt his blood run cold. Where there was a clear starry sky five minutes ago, there was now a roiling cloud of darkness that blocked out all lights, save for that produced by itself. The mass billowed and pulsed as if thousands of maggots writhed within its black bulk. Oh God, oh God! Jesus, what is that? The chanting was nearer now, only an aisle or two away, but Mike was frozen beneath the cloud that was not a cloud. Here was the midnight thing that hid beneath his bed when he was six years old. Here was the thing that hunched in the closet with slimy claws and wet teeth. Here was the thing that watched. He sees me. Mike a lapsed Catholic ten years from the last time he darkened a church doorstep, crossed himself. Ray's voice reached a crescendo that was echoed by the thunder outside. There was a crackle, a blinding purple flash, and Mike found himself tumbling backwards through the electrically charged air as a bolt of lightning arced down through the skylight, and the store exploded. He struck a column, heard the strident bring of a phone, 
as it tore loose under his weight and skidded across the floor amongst the flaming remains of stuffed animals and melted pink plastic good guys. He lay there beneath a snowfall of cotton stuffing, the eviscerated remains of fuzzy rabbits and anthropomorphic dogs surprised that he was still alive. All was quiet now. The lightning had done for the blaring alarm just in time for Mike to hear the distant warble of approaching police cars. Backup was finally on the way. He stood and nearly fell as the whole world swam around him. Pain flared at the base of his skull, and he winced. Let it pass, he told himself. Shake it off. You still have a job to do. Easier said than done. Dizziness persisted as he shuffled to the destroyed display beneath the shattered skylight. Flaming bits of toys lay everywhere around him, victims of an unnatural act. A breeze stirred his hair and he turned to see that the plate glass windows at the front of the store were now so much detritus decorating the asphalt outside. Impossible, he thought. This is all impossible. He looked up through the skylight and saw a tiny star wink at him from the once again cloudless night sky, seeming to say everything was all right. He could forget the cloud and his dark thoughts and begin to fit the world back inside the neat box he built for it with his rational mind. Mike looked away and saw a brown leather shoe sticking out from beneath a mound of yellow and red boxes ten feet away. He walked to it, gun raised, and kicked the boxes aside. Charles Lee Ray lay on his side, his unseeing eyes fixated on a good guy doll he'd removed from its box for some reason, known only to him. A single well-manicured hand stretched out to rest on the doll's forehead. He's dead. The bastard is actually dead. A crunch behind him, Mike turned gun-raised to find his younger partner, junior detective Jack Santos, standing five feet away with his hands raised in the air. Whoa, Mike! Careful where you point that thing! Mike frowned, confused for a second, and then he noticed the revolver clutched in his hand. He lowered it with a sigh. <sighs> Shit, Jack, I'm sorry. Did you get Caputo? He's stewing in the back of the car as we speak. He lowered his hands as Mike holstered his gun, a big shit-eating grin spreading under his bushy mustache. You got him! You killed the Lakeshore Strangler! Yeah. Mike said, looking around at the destroyed toy store. It's over. Chapter 1 Breakfast in Bed the first rays of morning sun shone through the large kitchen windows, catching notes of dust dancing on the air. A thin ream of frost crusted the edge of the panes and the world beyond, a typical winter morning in Chicago, Illinois. Six-year-old Andy Barkley paused in the middle of rummaging through the kitchen island's cabinets to stare at the ice. It was going to be Christmas soon, and that meant Christmas movies like Rudolph and Frosty. Those movies always showed big snowflakes falling from the sky and great crystal shapes, but Andy had never seen one. He wondered if they really existed. It would be really neat to see one, he thought, as he turned back to the cabinet and pulled out one of their scuffed dinner trays. I'd catch it and keep it in the freezer for the whole year so I could look at it whenever I liked. Andy stood and placed the tray on top of the island beside a box of Play Pal cereal and a loaf of bread. He was small for his age, with a quick smile and his father's brown hair. He wore blue and red Play Pal pajamas and Good Guy pajama sneakers. Cheery music floated to him from the living room, and Andy grinned. A child's sad voice rang out. I've got no friends. No one will play with me. Andy ran through the arch into the living room and watched as a cartoon hot air balloon drifted down the television screen towards a forlorn boy sitting on the curb in front of a red brick apartment building, similar to the one he and his mom lived in. A rope ladder descended from the balloon's wicker basket, and a good guy climbed down, resplendent in his overalls and red hair. The good guy waved to the boy and said, Uh-oh! I hear a friend in need. Cheer up! 
Who are you? asked the little cartoon boy. I'm a good guy. I've come from the Playpass Clubhouse and I'll be your friend till the end. You will? Mm, I've seen this one. Andy groaned. He turned back to the kitchen, his eyes scanning over a banner hung in the living room window that said, Happy Birthday, Andy, and the two wrapped packages on the bench beneath. He walked to the island and grabbed the box of cereal, upending it over a bowl, sending a rainbow of pieces cascading over the countertop. Next comes the milk. He crossed the kitchen and grabbed a gallon of milk and a carton of orange juice from the refrigerator. They were heavy, but he managed to make it back to the tray without dropping them. He laid them each on the counter and then mimed wiping sweat from his brow, unconsciously mimicking an action he'd seen his father do many times. He unscrewed the cap from the milk and poured the milk overflowing the bowl and sloshing more cereal onto the tray. He added three large serving spoons full of sugar to the mix to top it off. Now for the toast. He fumbled the bread tie off the loaf and took out two pieces of white bread. Mommy liked whole wheat, but Andy knew that white bread was the best. He put the bread in the toaster and pushed the button down. The noise from the living room changed. The cartoon replaced by an adult voice. Andy walked to the archway and saw the Playpals Clubhouse made real on the television screen. A real-life boy sat beside a life-size good guy who was talking. Hi, good guys. Boy, have I got news for you. Now you can have your very own good guy doll. That's right. You can have all the adventures we have on TV in your very own home. Good guys say three different sentences. We even turn our heads and blink our eyes when you talk to us. Right, Oscar? Hi, I'm Oscar, and I'm your friend to the end. Heidi ho ha ha ha. Every good guy has a name all his own, so he can be your very own best friend. Oh, wow. Andy whispered. He looked to the two presents under the banner and saw that one of the boxes was much bigger than the other. Big enough to have a good guy doll inside? Andy sniffed. Something was burning. He spun back to the kitchen and saw tendrils of smoke wafting from the toaster. He ran over and pressed the switch, ejecting the charcoal black bread. He grabbed the pieces, shrugged, and put them on a plate on the tray. Almost done, he said as he grabbed a tub of butter from the counter and the serving spoon he'd used for the sugar. Mommy will love it. He dipped the spoon into the tub and dug out a softball-sized yellow glob which he deposited on top of the blackened bread. He finished the breakfast off with a glass of the orange juice and then he picked up the tray and headed into the living room. The Play Pals commercial was just ending, and Andy caught a glimpse of the big good guy holding a good guy doll in its box. He stopped and glanced back and forth from the screen to the biggest present, comparing the sizes, and felt his heart skip a beat. The box was just the right size. It had to be a good guy. Mommy! Andy shouted as he carried the loaded tray out of the living room and down the hall towards his mother's room. Milk and orange juice sloshed about, overflowing and leaving a trail of drops the length of the hall. Behind him, the commercial was replaced by a stern-looking man in a suit sitting behind a desk. Good morning, he said. This is your 7 o'clock news break. I'm Casey Ferguson. Today's top story, Charles Lee Ray better known to Chicagoans as the Lakeshore Strangler, was shot and killed by police shortly before 3 a.m. this morning. Mommy, wake up! His mother's door was open a crack. Andy nudged it open with his foot, spilling even more of the tray's contents and walked inside. The room was neat and smelled of vanilla. Andy liked the way his mommy's room smelled, but it also made him a little sad. Something was missing now. The sweet scent of pipe tobacco and aftershave. They were his father's smells, absent for months now. Andy pushed the bad thoughts aside and placed the food tray on the bedside table, knocking a large hardback book to the floor. It landed face up, the cover showing a dark street curb with the scaly monster hand reaching out of a storm drain. The word IT was written on the top in big red letters. Mommy! Andy said again, pouncing on the edge of the bed. Wake up! 
A groan and muttered curse from beneath the blankets. Slowly, a pale hand emerged and pulled the covers down to reveal Karen Barclay. She wore red checked flannel pajamas and her short, tasseled blonde hair stuck out at odd angles from her head. Andy thought she was the most beautiful lady he had ever seen, and there were more than a few men who would agree with him. Karen opened one sleep-crusted eye to look at the alarm clock beside the food tray and groaned again. Oh, Andy, it's seven in the morning. But, Mom, it's beautiful outside. Karen sighed and then smiled up at her son. It certainly is birthday, boy. How long have you been up? Uh, since forever, Andy said. Look, I made you breakfast in bed. He grabbed the tray of food and brought it over to Karen, who took it all in with the eye of a veteran soldier who has seen it all and lived to tell the tale. She picked up the charcoal toast and let the huge blob of butter fall to the plate with an audible thunk. This looks just excellent. That's so sweet of you. I'll tell you what. Why don't I eat this a little later, okay? Andy nodded and put the tray back onto the bedside table. Karen watched him, waiting until it was safe, and then she snatched him onto the bed with her in a fit of giggles. Andy felt her grab the hem of his shirt and knew what was coming next. He opened his mouth to shout, and then she was blowing raspberries on his belly, and all he could do was howl with laughter. Finally, the assault subsided, and she hugged him close. Andy closed his eyes, knowing he was loved. Happy birthday, pumpkin, Karen said. Andy sat up beside her on the bed. Thanks. Can we open my presents now, Mommy? Can we? Can we? Karen laughed and nodded. Sure, kiddo. Let me get my slippers on. Ah, uh, terrific! Andy shouted. He jumped off the bed and raced into the living room where the newscaster was still talking. Eddie Caputo, Ray's accomplice, was captured by the police six blocks from where the shooting. Karen walked in and turned the television volume down and then walked over to where Andy was bouncing on his toes beside the presents. He reached out and touched the big package, wrapped in yellow paper with red fire trucks racing across it. Can I open this one first? Don't you want to start with the smaller present first? Andy shook his head back and forth, and Karen couldn't help smiling at him. Okay, go ahead and open it. Andy did a little happy dance, a miniature Fred Astaire in good guy pajamas, and then he tore into the present. Bits of shredded paper filled the air, and then Andy was ripping open the plain brown cardboard box to find three pairs of stonewashed blue jeans. Andy pulled each pair out with a sinking sensation in the pit of his stomach. He peered inside the box to make sure, and saw it was empty. Nope, there was no good guy doll hiding in there. Andy felt a prickle of tears at the corners of his eyes as his mother took one of the pairs of pants and held it up to his waist to measure. What do you think? she asked. You need these so badly, they look like they're going to be okay. We'll just have to take them up a couple of inches. Karen trailed off, finally noticing her son's silence. She looked up and felt a familiar ache in her chest. What kid wanted clothes for their birthday? It didn't matter to him if he needed them or not. I know things are hard, kiddo. I'd buy you everything you wanted if I could. It's hard being a single parent. She reached up and brushed a finger across his cheek. What's wrong, Andy? Andy tried to force his lips into a smile, but couldn't quite manage it. Nothing's wrong. They're great. Karen lifted Andy's chin. I know what it is. You wanted toys, didn't you? You didn't want boring old clothes. Andy nodded, remembering there was another present. Hope rekindled in his tiny chest. Karen grabbed the smaller package and handed it to Andy. Here you go. Open this. Andy took the box from her and ripped the wrapping paper off to reveal a Play Pals lunchbox with a good guy waving at him from the lid. This wasn't bad. He would like carrying the pell to school, but it still wasn't a toy. He unlatched the lid and opened the lunchbox. This was better. There was a good guy's tool belt complete with all the tools he could want and plastic nails, screws, and boards to use them with. 
a ghost of a thought floated into his mind. Daddy had tools like these. Well, what do you think? It's really neat, Mommy. Thanks. Karen frowned, wondering what she'd done wrong now. This was turning into one stinker of a birthday for him. Neat? she asked. Is that all? Just neat? Andy knew he should be happy so that Mommy could be happy. She was a great mommy and he liked to make her happy, but there was something beginning to boil up inside of his chest and he knew it was going to come out whether he wanted it to or not. He picked up the tool belt and felt the child-sized hammer's real metal head cool against his skin. I really wanted a good guy doll to go with it. There it was, the damned doll. Why did those bigwigs at Playpals have to make the thing so expensive? Karen took Andy's hand in hers and gave it a gentle squeeze. I know you do, buddy. I'm sorry. I didn't know that you wanted one and then enough time to save up for it. Andy stuck his lower lip out and tried to look away from her. I know. It's okay, Mommy. A single tear spilled over and ran down his thin face, breaking Karen's heart. Oh, Andy, what's wrong? Nothing. That's not true. Come on, tell me. Andy glanced over Karen's head to the mantle over the fireplace, where a small framed photograph of his parents rested beside a fake ball of yarn that held matches inside. It's my first birthday without him, isn't it? Karen froze. That was the last thing she expected him to say, though it had been on her mind for days now. She looked over her shoulder at the picture, remembering the day in the park when it was taken. She was four weeks pregnant with Andy at the time, although she wouldn't find out for another week. I guess that makes that the first picture of the three of us together, our first family photo, she thought. She turned back to him and nodded, tears filling her own eyes. Yes, it is. Andy's lips started to quiver. Why can't he be here with us? Do you remember what I told you before? She asked. Daddy is in heaven now. The dam broke inside, overwhelming Andy. He pulled away from her and ran from the room. I don't want Daddy up in heaven. I want him here. He raced down the hall into his room, hearing his mother's heavier tread following behind. He burst through the door and flung himself onto his bed, burying his face in his pillows. A second later, he felt his mother's warm hands pulling him up. She wrapped him in her arms and rocked him back and forth as he sobbed into her chest. Shh, she whispered into his ear. I know, baby. I miss him, too. I miss him so much. They stayed like that for a long time until Andy's tears began to subside, and he pulled his face from her breasts. He looked over to his bedside table where there was another framed photo, this one of the three of them. They were all smiling, in love with life and full of love for each other. Karen watched Andy for a moment and then had an idea. She grabbed him by the shoulders and made him face her. I'll tell you what, how would you like a good guy doll for Christmas? Some light returned to Andy's eyes and he nodded. I'd love it! Then that is what you will have, she said as she kissed the end of his little nose. Your very own good guy, I promise. Cross your heart and hope to fly? Karen drew an X over her heart with her finger. Hope to fly. Yay! Thank you, Mommy! Andy cried, giving her a big sloppy kiss. <laughs> You're so welcome! laughed Karen. Wait a minute, Andy said. He pulled back to stare gravely into her eyes. How long is it until Christmas? Karen laughed harder. <laughs> It'll be here before you know it, sweetheart. It'll be here before you know it. Chapter 2, A Fortuitous Find Karen leaned against the jewelry counter, staring morosely at the milling crowd of customers going about their pre-holiday business of buying happiness. They made it look so easy with their fur-lined coats and polished shoes. She glanced down at her own scuffed loafers and felt like crying. 
Why did everything have to be so hard? After all, it didn't used to be. Everything had been fine just ten short months ago. Bob and her were happy. She never had to worry about where their next meal was going to come from or if she would have to go without so that Andy would have enough. More than that, she'd had a confidant, a steady rock that she could lean into when things got her down. She'd had someone special to share a laugh with or a good book. She'd always thought it was funny that her husband and best friend would turn out to be one and the same. Life was a dream that she had to wake up from, a careless step away from the curb, an elderly gentleman who should have never been allowed behind a will, and everything changed. God, how it hurt. It still did. She could see Bob's handsome face every time she closed her eyes, could hear his laughter as she walked down the streets. Andy looked so much like him. He was so young, younger still, when the accident carried Bob away from them. How long before Andy began to forget who his father was? Two years? Five? How long until Dad became an abstract idea instead of reality? What a melancholy day, she thought. She better snap out of it before Andy got out of school. Andy had already had enough sadness on his birthday. She'd be damned if she brought any more home to him that afternoon. The rapid click of heels behind her. Karen turned to see her co-worker and favorite person in the world, beside her son, approaching in a hurry. Maggie Peterson was in her early thirties with shoulder-length curly brown hair and an expressive face. Hey Maggie, what's going on? Maggie reached the counter and Karen saw small puffs of snow melting in her hair. Karen, you know that doll you wanted for Andy? The one that cost over a hundred bucks? You mean a good guy? Maggie nodded. Sure, whatever you call it. There's a peddler in the alley behind the store selling stuff, and I think he's got one. Karen raised one eyebrow. What would a peddler be doing with a good guy doll? Who cares? Grab your purse and come on. We can get a deal on the thing. Karen looked around at the jewelry department and housewares beyond. But I can't leave the cash register. Maggie reached over the counter and grabbed Karen's arm. Look, do you want the damn thing for Andy or not? Of course I do. Then come on, Maggie said, pulling Karen from behind the counter and marching her towards the rear of the store. Karen looked back, caught a glimpse of a younger man dressed in perfectly ironed slacks and a vest. Hey, Dave, would you do me a favor and watch my register for a few minutes? Dave blushed and nodded. Maggie pulled Karen on before she had a chance to thank him. Shame on you, Maggie said in mock indignation as they passed through a door into the building's rear stairwell. Look at you taking advantage of poor Dave. You know, he's got a crush on you. Oh, don't, Karen said. I know he likes me, but I'm not ready for anything like that, especially not with someone I work with. Don't have a heart attack. I was just joking around. Besides, that kid would have a stroke if you so much as touched his shoulder. That boy needs someone to teach him a thing or two before he's ready for a lady like you. Oh yeah? Karen smirked. Are you volunteering to teach him? Maggie shrugged. I don't have a hang-up about guys I work with. They reached the bottom of the stairs and walked out into the frigid morning air. Snow drifted down into the alley between the buildings, softening hard edges. Karen looked and saw a disheveled-looking man with greasy black hair that hung limply from beneath a dirty beanie hat. He was dressed in a torn trench coat and was haggling with a couple more of Karen's co-workers over the contents of a rusty shopping cart. Maggie pointed to the man. There he is! She took Karen by the hand and pulled her forward. The two women saw them coming and walked away talking quietly. The man watched the women go with avid interest and then turned to face Karen and Maggie. He flashed a grin at them and Karen saw that his teeth were like worn, moss-covered tombstones, resting uneasy in his gums. Go ahead, Maggie said. Show it to her. The peddler reached into the cart and produced a large yellow box with red lettering. Karen took it from him and turned it around so she could see through the cellophane window on the front. A carrot-top, freckled-faced doll with blue eyes stared back at her from inside. 
Jesus, look at this thing, she thought, as she noticed a couple smudges and a dent on one corner of the box. It's an ugly little bugger, isn't it? What does Andy see in this thing? Well, Maggie said, is it a good guy or not? Karen felt her heart leap in her chest. Yes, yes it is. See, I told you, Maggie said. She turned back to the peddler. How much do you want for it? The peddler looked from Maggie to Karen's excited face, considering, and then said, mm, Fifty bucks. Fifty? grunted Maggie. Are you out of your mind? She'll pay you thirty for it. The peddler reached for the box. I'm not running the charity out here. The price is fifty bucks. Take it or leave it. Somebody else will buy it. No, Karen shouted, pulling the box back from the man and reaching for her purse. I'll take it. Maggie spun on her. Karen, don't. That's too much. Karen pulled her change pouch from the purse and began to count out bills. No, it isn't. You have no idea how much Andy wants this. But we don't even know if the damn thing works or not. Karen opened her mouth to reply, but stopped when the peddler snatched the money from her hand and pushed the box back to her. Done deal. May it bring you and your kid a lot of joy. He turned to his cart and began to trundle it away from them down the alley. Karen studied the doll, feeling truly happy for the first time since Andy's outburst earlier that day. But Maggie wasn't finished. She took several steps after the man and shouted, Hey, creep! How do we know this thing isn't stolen? The peddler apparently had his fill of Maggie. He turned to the two of them and thrust his hips at them in a vulgar gesture. Hey, steal this! Maggie shot him a bird in return as he turned and walked away. Yeah, steal this yourself, slime ball. Karen checked her watch and gasped. Maggie's haggling had taken longer than Karen had anticipated. It was her turn to pull Maggie along by the arm back towards the stairwell. Maggie went reluctantly, a strange expression on her face as she stared after the peddler. You know, I think I dated him. Karen and Maggie walked arm in arm back into the sales floor, talking excitedly about the doll and how happy Andy was going to be when he saw it. Karen glanced up as they drew near her workstation and felt all her good cheer drain away. Shy Dave was nowhere to be found and the day shift manager, Walter Criswell, was waiting with arms crossed at her workstation. Welcome back, Miss Bartley, said the stuffy little man. It's so nice of you to drop by. Did you have a nice break? Karen moved behind the counter, the doll's box held out in front of her like a shield. I I'm sorry, Mr. Criswell. I was only gone for a minute, and I asked Dave to cover for me. Dave has his own area of responsibility, as do you. Have a heart, Criswell, Maggie said as she leaned over the counter and pointed to the good guy. We were just downstairs buying her little boy a birthday present. We have specified break times for activities like that, Mrs. Peterson. Criswell replied, staring at the garish box with the jaundiced eye. Mrs. Barclay, Miss Howe has taken ill and we're shorthanded tonight. You're going to have to fill in for her. Great, Karen thought. More good news. She glanced at her watch. I'm sorry, but I can't. I have to pick Andy up from school in an hour. Criswell lowered his head to stare over his glasses at her. Mrs. Barclay, are you happy with your job here at Sears? Karen suddenly felt sick to her stomach. Y yes of course I am. Then I suggest- Hey, Maggie said, coming around the counter and putting a hand on Criswell's arm. Would you chill out, Walter? She turned to Karen. I'll take care of Andy for you. Oh, Maggie, you can't do it again. Maggie waved Karen's protest away. Don't be silly. It'll be the hottest date I've had in months. 
I can't imagine why. Criswell said, pushing his glasses back in place and walking away. I can manage long enough for you to get your kid, but I need you back here by seven, Mrs. Barclay. Karen watched him go in shock. The nerve of the creep to say something like that to Maggie. He was one big brown asshole, Maggie muttered. Exactly, thought Karen. Chapter 3 Andy's New Friend Karen walked by a sign declaring, Welcome to Sunnyside Elementary School in chipped white and red paint. She paused to take in the rusted chain link fence that surrounded the playground, the cracked asphalt parking lot out front, and thought, Everybody is struggling these days. She passed through a gate onto the playground and saw Andy sitting against the fence, pulling blades of grass out of the dirt alone with his thoughts. Just you wait, sweetheart. I think your day is about to get better. Karen looked left and saw Mrs. Waters, Andy's teacher, supervising recess. The younger lady noticed Karen and waved her over. Karen went and took a seat beside Mrs. Waters on a bench near a group of children playing a game of tag. Hello, Mrs. Waters. Andy had a bit of a rough morning before school today. How has he been? Mrs. Waters brushed a stray strand of yellow hair from her forehead and smiled over at Andy. He's been fine. I have to tell you, Miss Barclay, Andy is a delight to teach. He's so smart and polite. I wish all my students were like him. Karen sighed. Did he happen to mention anything about his father? He didn't come right out and say anything, but I can tell when it's on his mind. He becomes more withdrawn like he is now if one of the other children talk about their fathers in front of him. Stepping away is his way of coping with the loss, I guess. Karen stared across at her son, the little boy who'd had occasion to learn the hard truths of life far too soon, and had to bite back a sob. Oh, Andy. Mrs. Waters patted Karen's hand. Don't worry too much, Mrs. Barclay. It takes time to recover from the death of a parent, especially when the loss is so sudden. That's all that he needs, though, just some more time. Karen stood. Thank you. Andy isn't the only one who needs reassurance every now and then. You are very welcome. You and Andy have a great day. Karen crossed the playground to her son, and he looked up at her when her shadow fell across him. Hey, champ, are you ready to go home? Sure, he replied. He stood up and shouldered his backpack. Karen watched him walk from the playground to her battered old Ford with slumped shoulders. She needed to distract him from his unnatural brooding, remind him that he was a little boy. She sped up and bumped him playfully with her hip. How was your day? Okay. Do you have your new lunchbox? Did your classmates like it? Uh-huh. Billy's got one just like it. He spoke quietly, dragging his feet along the ground like a lifeless zombie. That's enough of this. It's time to light a fire under him. They came to her car and Andy climbed into the back seat. Karen leaned over to help him buckle his seatbelt and whispered into his ear. I may have something to go with that lunchbox and your tools you got this morning. Andy squinted up at her. What? You'll have to wait until we get home to find out, she said as she closed the car door. She laughed when she heard his muffled protest from the other side of the window. The elevator wasn't fast enough for Andy. Karen leaned against the corner and watched him bouncing up and down on his toes, begging the doors to open, depression from moments ago a thing of the past. The old-fashioned dial above the door moved slowly from one to two and on. Karen glanced to the side, endlessly fascinated by the elevator's design. There were openings in the metal walls of the elevator car and shaft that allowed the occupant to look out at the staircase that wrapped around the shaft. They passed by Karen's neighbors, an elderly couple named Glenn and Brenda, who were making their way down the stairwell. She waved and they waved back. 
The dial reached four, the top floor of the apartment building. The ding of the elevator was like a pistol shot signaling the start of a race. The doors ground open and Andy was off in a flash. Karen followed him laughing again. Now this was more like it. It was good to be a parent. Their apartment was the last one down the right path from the elevator. Andy was already at the door, seeming to vibrate in his skin. He looked at the doorknob and then back to Karen. Come on, Mommy! Hurry up! I am, she said, shifting the large package from one hip to the other so she could reach into her purse and pull out her key ring. She paused for a split second as she always did when she held the keys in her hand. A simple silver keychain caught the hallway light, the initials B plus K engraved on the surface. I wish you could see him, Bob, she thought as she stuck the key in the lock and opened the door. You'd be so proud. Karen barely had time to pull the key back before Andy rushed by her into the apartment and shouted, We're home, Mom! I know, darling, she said as she shut and locked the door behind them. Andy held his hands out, his fingers grasping, as if saying, Gimme, gimme, oh, Mommy, please! Karen held the oblong present out to him, and Andy took it and ran into the living room. She walked behind him and watched as he tore the plain brown paper free to reveal the bright yellow box beneath. Andy's face lit up. He recognized the box. A good guy, doll, he said, turning the box around to look through the cellophane at the freckled face on the other side. I knew you'd get me one. Karen sat beside him on the couch and ruffled his hair. Happy birthday again. Thank you he said, pulling the doll from the box and setting it on his lap. Look at him, Mom! Well, isn't he something, she said. Show me how he works. Okay. He turned to face the doll and said, Hi, I'm Andy. What's your name? The doll's eyes blinked and then its head turned back and forth as if it were searching for the person speaking to it. It stopped facing Andy, and spoke. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Heidi ho ha <laughs> That's amazing! I love you, Mommy! Oh, I love you too, she said, as she wrapped him in her arms and gave him a big hug. Today turned out to be a pretty good day after all, she thought. A knock at the door. That'll be Aunt Maggie, Karen said, standing up and walking towards the hall. Play with Chucky, I'll be right back. Andy was too engrossed with his new friend to respond. Karen shrugged and stepped to the apartment door and opened it to find Maggie standing outside with the present under her arm. Hi, Mags, Karen said, taking the box from Maggie so she could shrug out of her heavy coat and scarf. Is this for Andy? Bingo, Maggie replied. Oh, you shouldn't have. Maggie reached out and took the present back from Karen. Nonsense, it's his birthday for Pete's sake. Besides, what else am I going to spend my money on? So how are things going with your red-headed stepchild? Karen raised an eyebrow. I'm sorry? Maggie pointed towards the sounds coming from the living room. How are things going with the doll? Did Andy like it? Karen opened her mouth to speak, but stopped when Andy raced into the hall with the doll clutched to his chest, yelling, Aunt Maggie, look what Mommy got me! Maggie leaned down to get a better look and smiled. Wow! He's almost as big as you, sport! That is some cool toy! Uh-huh. He talks and everything! Andy said, holding the doll up for her to see. Oh yeah? Show me. Andy turned the good guy so he could see its face. Go ahead. Say something to Aunt Maggie, Chucky. Chucky blinked his blue eyes and turned his head towards Maggie. Hi. He said in the voice that spoke of innocence and virtue. I like to be hugged. I'm sure you do, she said. 
she offered the box to Andy. Here you go. I got one more present for you. Andy's eyes lit up, and he wrapped his arms around her neck and gave her a sloppy kiss on the cheek. Thanks, Aunt Maggie. Maggie turned to Karen as Andy tore the paper from his new present. He's so sweet. Why can't all men be that nice? Karen shrugged. Maybe you've been picking the wrong ones? Oh, Mommy, look! Karen looked and saw Andy holding up a battery-operated AK-47. He pulled the trigger and automatic gunfire filled the apartment. Why did you have to get him a gun of all things? Karen asked, frowning down at her son. You know I don't like things like that. Maggie dismissed her complaint with a wave of her hand. He's a boy, Karen. Boys love to play with guns. Besides, it's a cold, cruel world out there, Karen. He'd better start learning how to defend himself. Right, Andy? Right. Frustrated, Karen glanced down at her watch and sighed. Oh no, it's almost 6.45. I better get going or I'm going to be late for work. She grabbed her coat from the rack by the door, put it on, and then turned back to Maggie. There's some leftover Irish stew and a salad in the refrigerator. You two can have it for dinner if you like. That sounds perfect, Maggie said. Don't worry about us. We're going to be just fine. You go and sell a bunch of jewelry so that pencil neck Criswell will lighten up. Karen laughed and gave her a quick hug. You got it. You're a great friend, you know. Oh, shucks, Maggie said in a bad southern accent. You're going to make me blush. Karen knelt down and gave Andy a kiss on his forehead. I'm going to miss you bunches, love. You be good for Aunt Maggie and do what she says. I'll be home as soon as I can. Hey, Andy said, holding up the doll. What about Chucky? Don't you want to kiss him goodbye, too? Sure, she said. She leaned closer and kissed the doll on the cheek. Goodbye, Chucky. The eyes blinked, seemed to follow her as she stood up. Hi, I like to be hugged. Weird, thought Karen. It really feels like it's talking to me. Karen looked at her watch again. Time was moving on while she was standing still. She threw them one quick wave and strode out of the apartment. Maggie locked the door behind her and then turned to Andy. So, are you ready for some dinner? Andy started to speak and paused when Chucky looked at him and asked, Hey, wanna play? Andy shouted sure and all thoughts of dinner were gone from his mind. He picked up Chucky and his gun and ran down the hall towards his bedroom door. Maggie watched him go wistfully and then walked towards the kitchen to warm up some stew. Chapter 4 The Nine O'Clock News Isn't this something, Maggie thought, as she picked up another crumb of chocolate cake from the piece she'd cut for herself and shoved it in her mouth. You're thirty years old, single, and the only thing you have to do is babysit? You're going to end up an old cat lady if you aren't careful, girl. That might be true, but as family went, this wasn't bad at all. She really enjoyed when Andy called her Aunt Maggie and hugged her. Children love so completely, without fear of rejection, and without worrying about what others would think of them. Maggie thought there might be a lot to learn there. Adults spent more time posturing than being truly honest with themselves about their true feelings. She glanced down at the cake, frowning. To eat the whole cake or not, that was the question. Not, she decided. She could try to eat her feelings away, but she knew the loneliness would remain. She picked the plate up and dumped the half-eaten slice in the trash bin. Noise from the living room. She leaned over and saw Andy sitting in the middle of the room with his new tool set spread around him, and the television set turned to a game show. The good guy doll sat against the sofa beside Andy, seeming to watch as he played. God, look at that orange hair and all those freckles. That is one ugly doll. Oh well, she said to herself as she picked up a stack of clean dishes from the dish drainer and carried them towards the cabinet. The kitchen isn't going to clean itself.
Andy grabbed his hammer and plastic nail and began to drive the nail into a toy board before dropping it and taking up a small toy handsaw. See, Chucky? This is how you use a saw. He scraped the dull saw teeth over the board, enjoying the clicking sound they made. One day I'm going to have a real tool set, he thought. Then I'll be able to make all kinds of neat stuff. Suddenly, the game show on the television faded into a hiss of white noise and was replaced by a newsman in fancy clothes who seemed to be staring right at Andy. Andy didn't like the news. All they ever talked about was boring stuff. He dropped the saw and picked up a screwdriver. Breaking news, said the newscaster in his all-so-serious voice. Eddie Caputo, reputed accomplice of the deceased Lakeshore Strangler Charles Lee Ray, has just escaped from the 34th Precinct Jail. More details on the news at 9. Andy heard a small click and looked up to see Chucky staring wide-eyed at the TV. Andy frowned and tapped the doll on the foot with his screwdriver. Hey, Chucky! You're not watching me! Chucky looked at the newscaster for a long moment and then turned his head to Andy and said, Hey, wanna play? Maggie finished rinsing the stew pot and put it in the drainer. Sighing, she wiped her hands on a dish towel. Washing dishes by hand was a drag. She'd have to talk Karen into investing in a dishwasher if she was going to keep up this babysitting gig. She glanced at her watch and saw that it was past 8.30. Time flies when you're having fun. It's past Andy's bedtime. She walked through the archway into the living room, surveying the clutter of toys. It's time to clean up, sport. I let you stay up past your bedtime. Andy said okay, gathering up his tools and putting them in the bag that served as their new home after he took them out of his new lunchbox. Finished cleaning up, he held the bag under one arm and picked Chucky up with the other. He took a step and then paused to lean closer to the doll as if it were whispering in his ear. Kids and their imaginations, she thought with a smile. Andy looked up at her. But Aunt Maggie, Chucky wants to watch the 9 o'clock news. Sure he does, Maggie said. She snapped off the television and picked Andy up. He lost his grip on the doll and it tumbled to the floor to land on the top of its head. Its butt aimed up at her like it was mooning her. Chucky! Andy shouted, squirming in her arms. Maggie leaned down and picked up the doll by one of its red sneakered feet. Oh yes, we can't forget about Chucky! She carried them down the hallway, Chucky's head bouncing repeatedly off the hardwood floor, and deposited Andy outside his bedroom door. She handed Chucky over and then pointed to the bathroom. And now, young man, it's brush your teeth and under the cover time for you. Go put your toys away and then brush those puppies. Yell for me when you're ready to be tucked in. Andy set Chucky down in the rocking chair beside his bed and then walked to the closet to put his tools away. Chucky turned his head to watch, seeing where Andy put the bag. Andy turned back and saw Chucky watching him. He smiled. Hey Chucky, you want to see my room? Andy took Chucky's stare as a yes, so he started around the room pointing out the treasures he'd collected. Chucky's eyes followed him every step of the way. This is my train set. And this is my electric car. And this is the baseball bat my daddy gave me last Christmas. He was going to teach me to play baseball, but he was too busy. Now he can't. He walked over to his bedside table and picked up the small framed photograph and showed it to Chucky. This is my dad. His name was Robert, but mommy called him Bob. He died in a car wreck, so he's in heaven now. Mommy says he's looking down and watching out for me. I miss my daddy. Andy put the picture back down and then walked to the bedroom door. Okay, you stay here while I brush my teeth. 
Chucky stared for a moment and then turned his head to Andy's bed. Maggie opened the refrigerator and pulled out a half-empty gallon of whole milk and carried it over to the kitchen island where a glass set waiting to be put to good use. She heard first one door and then another open and then water running in the bathroom sink. You brushing your teeth, Andy? She shouted. Andy's reply came a moment later, muffled by toothpaste and brush. Yes, Aunt Maggie. Good boy. She poured the milk and was crossing the kitchen to put the jug back when the television in the living room suddenly burst into life. She gasped, nearly dropping the jug. What the hell? She set the milk down on the counter and inched towards the archway. The sound of water still came from the bathroom. Andy finishing his nighttime routine. So if this wasn't Andy, then who could it be? Police say Caputo escaped from the prison transport bus in transit to his arraignment, said a voice from the television. A massive search has begun. There was a heavy glass rolling pin on the counter by the stove. Maggie glanced over at it, wishing she had thought to grab it before investigating. Too late now. She eased into the living room, her arms raised to fight, and then let them fall to her sides in exasperation. The doll was sitting on the couch facing the TV as if it were actually watching. Aunt Maggie, Chucky wants to watch the 9 o'clock news. Cute, she muttered. She walked over to the TV and switched the set off before grabbing the doll once again by the leg and carrying it down the hall. Andy was just coming out of the bathroom and he stared at her and Chucky in confusion. Well, young man, Maggie said, her free hand on her hip. What do you have to say about this? About what? Come on, she said, taking him by the hand and leading him into his bedroom. You have to learn when I say something, I mean it. What did I do? You know very well what I'm talking about, turning the TV on and putting Chucky in front of it when I told you it was time to go to bed. Andy frowned, looking back and forth between Maggie and Chucky. I didn't do that. Oh, no? Maggie asked, motioning Andy towards his bed and pulling back his covers. What did Chucky do? Walk into the living room and turn it on by himself? Andy sat on the edge of the bed and looked up at Chucky's upside-down face. Did you do that, Chucky? Wow, he's really trying to sell this thing, isn't he? Andy, stop it! She put Chucky under the blankets beside Andy and tucked them both in tight. But, Auntie... Nope, she said, kissing her fingertips and placing them on his forehead. Not another word. But I didn't put Chucky in front of the TV. She moved her fingers to his lips. Shh, enough already. Good night, Andy. Happy birthday. Good night, Aunt Maggie. She turned off the lights and walked from the room. Andy watched her go and then turned to kiss Chucky on the cheek. See, Chucky, I told you she'd be mad if you watched the news. Andy rolled over on his side, his back to Chucky, and closed his eyes. Five minutes later, his breathing had slowed with the arrival of sleep. Chucky's eyes shifted to stare at the closed bedroom door. Chapter 5 Maggie The harsh north wind blew around the eaves, moaning like the souls of the damned, and Maggie shivered. She reached down to the end of the couch and grabbed a soft quilt that had been sewn together by Karen's grandmother before she was born. Maggie wrapped it close about her, savoring the warmth, and then picked up the book she'd been reading. She found it on Karen's bedside table and had been intrigued by the blurb on the dust jacket, so she decided to give it a try. Sitting alone in the quiet apartment with most of the lights off, she thought it might not have been such a good idea. She opened the book and continued to read about a little boy named Georgie and the paper boat his big brother Bill made for him. It had been raining for days, and the gutters were overflowing like swift running rivers, the perfect environment for a kid with an imagination. Maggie turned the page. Georgie's boat was outrunning him. He looked ahead and saw the rushing water disappearing down a drain into the sewers under the street. 
Georgie picked up his pace, but it was too late. With a cry, he leaned down to stare after the lost SS Georgie and gasped when he saw something staring back. Maggie pulled her feet under her butt, superstitiously afraid that something might be reaching from beneath the couch, with cold, dead fingers to grab her toes. It was a clown. A clown! A fucking clown! She hated clowns. Had since she was a little girl, and one had frightened her at a carnival. This Stephen King sure knew how to push the right buttons. She heard the creak of a floorboard and spun around in time to catch a glimpse of something blue and red passing by the archway to the hall. She folded a page corner to mark her spot and lay the book down on the sofa. Something scraped across the floor. I saw something blue. Andy's pajamas are blue and red. They look just like his doll's outfit. Andy? Is that you? Who else would it be, girl? Chucky, get a grip. Pretty soon you're going to be seeing Pennywise under the kitchen sink. She walked slowly out into the hall, glanced to her right, and saw that Andy's bedroom door was cracked open. She turned left and froze. A chair had been pulled in front of the apartment door, and someone had undone the chain lock. This wasn't funny anymore. Andy was about to see a different side of Auntie Maggie if he was running about playing games. She strode to the door and saw that the deadbolt was unlocked as well. Andy wouldn't go outside at this time of night, would he? She reached for the lock and let loose a scream when something crashed to the floor in the kitchen behind her. She spun around, scanning for an intruder, and saw only the empty hallway. Still, the atmosphere felt different, as if something malevolent had found its way in. The air moved against her skin, sending goose flesh down her spine, and suddenly she knew that she and Andy were not alone in the apartment. Andy? No response, except did she just hear something shift in there? She felt the door at her back. Could she reach Andy and get back to the door before whoever it was pounced on the two of them? She tiptoed towards the kitchen door, her heart pounding in her chest, sweat beating on her forehead. She remembered the glass rolling pin on the counter. That would do nicely for whoever had come calling uninvited. She took a deep breath to still her nerves and then charged around the corner. The kitchen was empty. She flicked on the lights and saw a large pile of sugar spread across the island and on the floor beside a broken jar. Now how did that happen? The telephone rang shrilly behind her, and she nearly jumped out of her skin. She twisted around, yanked the receiver from its cradle, and held it to her ear. Hello? A low hiss came from the phone, as if the wind had found its way into the phone lines. And then, a familiar voice spoke into her ear. Hey, how's it going? How's Andy? Karen? Yeah, who else would it be? Is something wrong? Maggie closed her eyes and sighed, feeling some of the tension leave her taut muscles. Oh, oh no, everything is fine. Something strange just happened, that's all. What do you mean? What's going on? Nothing. I've just got a good case of the alone at night willies. I'll tell you all about it when you get home. Now do me a favor, quit worrying, and go give Criswell a good kick in the ass for me. Karen laughed. You got it. Hey, listen to me. Thanks again for watching Andy. You're a real pal. Oh, yeah? Maggie said. You know it, Karen replied. Give Andy a kiss for me. Bye. The phone went dead in her ear, and Maggie hung it up. He watched the bitch from his hiding place beneath the table in the hallway. She never would have dragged him around if she knew who she was dealing with. Now it was time to show her. He gripped the hammer in his small hand, felt its reassuring weight. It would do the trick. The woman was getting over her fright. She rationalized the chair, the spilled sugar. Little Andy's gonna be in for it. That was if he let her live long enough. Too bad. 
Her time is out. She paused in the middle of the kitchen with a broom and dustpan in her hand, staring at three wooden planters nestled under the apartment windows. Andy, are you hiding back there? She asked. I'm going to paddle your behind if you are. She crept up to the planters with their half-dead ferns on top and yanked one aside. There was nothing there. She put the planter back down, her shoulders slumping. Everything was all fine in her world. What's wrong with me? She said. I'm scaring myself to death. She was turning. It's time. He burst from under the table, amazed at how effortless sprinting was in spite of his short legs. He leapt on a bar stool and mounted the island, the hammer raised over his head. She saw him and her eyes went wide with shock. He brought the hammer down as hard as he could, the blow landing above her left eye. He heard the bone break and then she was spinning away towards the windows, pinwheeling her arms for balance. The glass gave way beneath her weight and then she was falling. He heard her scream and then a crash as she landed on top of a parked car on the street below. Laughing maniacally, he climbed down from the island and looked out the shattered window. Glass from the apartment windows and from the destroyed car littered the sidewalk and street, looking like little tongues of fire under the streetlights. She lay face down on top of the caved-in vehicle, a growing pool of blood seeping from her ruptured cranium and bowels. There's nothing like a good bludgeoning to get the old juices flowing. He cackled. He tossed the hammer behind the planters as he passed and then padded down the hall back to Andy's bedroom. Chapter 6 Footprints The street in front of the apartment building was a zoo painted red by police bubble lights. Karen pulled her car to a stop by the curb and jumped out, sprinting by police officers and curious onlookers dressed in their night clothes. She passed through the front door at a jog and charged forward in time to stick her arm in the closing elevator door. She punched the button for the top floor and had time to think how funny she must look, pacing the car, willing the dial to move faster. Now I know how Andy felt earlier. Damn this slow piece of junk. The elevator opened with a ding, and she ran out, nearly knocking a young forensic technician over the railing. Her apartment door was open, and unfamiliar voices floated to her from the opening. Oh God, Andy! She picked up the pace, trying to outrun her panic and ran inside. There were strangers everywhere. One young mustachioed man saw her enter and walked over, hands held out to stop her. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but you can't be in here. The hell I can't, she said, ducking under his hands and moving further down the hall. I live here. The detective said something, but she ignored him. Where was Andy? Where was Maggie? She glanced into the living room on her way by and saw three men in coveralls leaning against the mantel, apparently taking a break. Two cups of coffee set on the mantel over her fireplace, steaming up the picture of she and her family. She came to the kitchen and froze when she saw the shattered window. Andy! she screamed, running and turning from the dreadful hole and its implications. Where was he? Why didn't somebody tell her what was going on? She passed her bedroom and the bathroom, more strange faces, but no Andy. She reached his bedroom door and burst through. Mommy! He was there, still dressed in his good guy pajamas. He sat on his bed beside his new doll and another detective. The man stood as Andy leapt into her arms and gave her a fierce hug. She squeezed him back. Oh, Andy, I was so worried. Are you okay? Andy nodded against her neck, and she could feel him trembling beneath her hands. 
She pulled away to look at him and didn't like what she saw. He was pale, his eyes too wide. They danced around, never settling on one place for more than a second. I'm so glad, she said, when I saw all the policemen. She paused and took a deep breath, afraid to ask the next question. Andy, where's Maggie? Tears glistened in Andy's eyes. She had an accident. The image of the broken window swam through her mind and she shivered. What kind of accident? Someone cleared their throat beside them and Karen looked up into the detective's handsome face. She'd been so concerned with making sure Andy was all right that she'd forgotten he was in the room with them. He held out a hand to help her to her feet, his grip strong and sure. Mrs. Barkley, my name is Mike Norris. I'm a detective lieutenant with the Chicago PD Homicide. Could I speak with you out in the hall? Karen dropped her hand from his, hearing his words echoing through the deepest pits of her soul. She studied his rugged face and saw kindness, patience, sympathy. Did you say homicide? Mike glanced pointedly at Andy and then back at her. Out in the hallway, please. All right, she said, looking back to Andy. Is that okay? Andy nodded and she kissed him on the cheek. I'll be right outside if you need me. Okay, Mommy. Andy replied. He walked over to his bed and taking Chucky in his arms and watching as the detective and his mother walked out the door. Karen spun around on Mike as soon as they were past the threshold. She gripped his shirt sleeve in one hand, taking him by surprise and asked, What is all this about? Where's Maggie? Mike put a hand on hers and led her further down the hall, out of hearing range from Andy's door, and then faced her, his expression grim. Look, Miss Barkley, uh, Miss Peterson is dead. The world seemed to stop spinning all at once, and Karen swayed on her feet. Maggie dead? She'd been with her only hours ago. It just wasn't possible. Black stars burst at the edge of her vision. Her best friend was gone and she was going to pass out at the feet of this stranger in the middle of her home. She took a deep breath, felt the world come back into sharper focus. The detective was standing there, his eyes full of professional concern. How many people had he seen faint during his career? A dozen? Two dozen? She shook her head to clear the rest of the cobwebs and felt like herself again. How? she asked. How did she die? They had come to the kitchen doorway where a sharp breeze was carrying little puffs of snow through the new opening. She fell from your kitchen window. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Mike nodded. I know it's hard to accept, but... Accidents happen all the time, unless Miss Peterson had some reason to do this to herself. Are you talking about suicide? He shrugged sheepishly, abashed. It's a touchy subject, but I have to ask. Maggie didn't kill herself. She loved life way too much. Yeah, I got that impression from Andy earlier. Wait a minute, Karen said, holding her hand up. You've been questioning Andy? Not questioning, Mrs. Barkley. He said, giving her a disarming smile. I was just talking to him a little. Anger flared in her chest, pushing sadness to the side. You shouldn't be asking a six-year-old questions about something like this. I had to, Mrs. Barkley. He was the only other person in the apartment when it happened. And besides, there are loose ends. What loose ends? she asked. What are you talking about? He took her gently by the arm and led her down the hallway. Come on, I'll show you. They passed the living room, squeezing around two forensic techs who were spreading black fingerprint powder over the small table in the hall, and came to the front door. Mike nodded to it. This door was opened when we arrived. Andy says he doesn't know how it got that way. Maybe Maggie opened it? Mike shook his head. And left it that way? That's an odd thing to do at this time of night, don't you think? Especially in the middle of Chicago. Karen shrugged, her head spinning. I don't know. I guess so. Did you talk to her at all tonight? 
I called her from work about an hour ago. She said something strange had happened, but she didn't say what it was. She said she would tell me about it when I got home. Too bad. He said. He walked down the hall and into the kitchen. Two detectives acknowledged him and gave them the room. He stopped by the island and waved a hand at the countertop, where a fan of spilled sugar spread out across the surface. Karen looked and saw a set of small shoe prints, clearly pressed into the sweet dust. The print was very distinct, with the words good guy etched in the middle, surrounded by various tools and other objects. Any idea what these are? Mike asked. A suspicion began to grow in Karen's mind. She looked up from the mess, angry again. Exactly what are you implying? I don't know. Nothing, really. I mean, what would Andy be doing on the counter? Besides, I already checked his closet and none of the shoes matched the print. Karen felt her blood boil. She opened her mouth to give the detective a piece of her mind and froze when she saw Andy standing in the kitchen doorway with Chucky in his arms. Mommy... He said, Chucky wanted to know what was going on. Karen walked over to him and knelt down. Now is not the time for playing games, Andy. The detective and I are very busy. I want you to go back to bed right now. But, Mom... Right now, Andy. Ho hold on a second. Mike said, taking a knee so that he was eye to eye with the little boy. What have you got on your feet, Andy? Karen and Andy glanced down and at the brightly colored soft shoes he was wearing. His father had given the shoes to him shortly before his car accident. The good guy PJ sneakers. Andy said. Wow. Said Mike. Those are really something. Can I see the bottoms? Sure. Replied Andy. He turned and lifted one foot so that the detective and Karen could see the mixture of tools and words printed on the sole. The pattern was an obvious match to the footprints left in the sugar, though the size didn't seem to quite fit. Mike took Andy's proffered foot in hand and examined, the shoe bottom with avid interest. Look at that! There's a gun, a baseball bat, a cowboy hat, a hammer, and an axe. Karen had reached her limit. She took Andy by the shoulders and pulled him away from the detective and then got into his face. That's it. Andy, go to your room. I'll be in to tuck you into bed in a moment. But, Mom... Right now! Andy's eyes grew wide and he took a step back. His mommy never shouted at him like that. Silently, he turned and walked away, tearing Karen's heart into pieces with his passage. She waited until he was out of sight in his bedroom once again and then turned on Mike. What's the big idea, huh? Why are you treating Andy like this? If he says he doesn't know how those footprints got there, then he doesn't know. Mike wasn't cowed by the mama bear act. Look, somebody made those footprints. If not Andy, then who? I don't know, and I don't care. All I know is that I just lost my best friend to a horrible accident, and I would like some time alone with my son, who I'm sure is just as upset as I am. Okay, you're right. Mike said, holding his hands up in surrender. I truly am sorry for your loss. I'll clear everybody out of here right away. Karen took a deep breath and let it out slowly, trying to release some of the tension festering inside. Thanks. No problem. Mike said, flashing her a lopsided grin before turning and clapping his hands together. Hey, you guys done? Come on, let's go. Everybody out of here. Andy lay beneath his blankets, his cherubic face lit by the light shining from the open closet door, his mind full of thoughts too big for his young mind. What happened to Aunt Maggie? Had she tripped? Where was she now? Was she in heaven with his daddy? Andy hoped so. Aunt Maggie was really nice. She deserved to be somewhere special. His eyes drifted from the closet to where Chucky sat silent in the rocking chair his blue eyes like twinkling stars in the dim illumination. What do you think was so important about my sneakers, Chucky? He asked. Chucky sat quietly, listening. Andy moved a small hand under his cheek, shifted in the bed. 
You don't know either, huh? Andy yawned and then froze as he caught sight of something that gave him pause. Maybe Chucky did know how the footprints got there. He had to be sure. Andy threw his sheets back and crouched down in front of the chair, his face inches from the soles of Chucky's shoes. Andy saw tools and a fireman's helmet, all covered in the fine white coat of sugar. Andy gasped and lunged for the door, unaware of Chucky's head turning to follow his progress from out into the hall. Most of the policemen were gone. He saw his mommy and the nice detective who had made him feel better before mommy got home. They were talking near the apartment door. He ran for them and yanked open his mom's sleeve to stop them. Mommy, mommy, I know who was on the kitchen counter. Karen turned to him, a tempest of anger raging in her normally kind eyes. Andy, for God's sake, I told you. Mike knelt down between Karen and Andy, cutting her off. Who was on the kitchen table, Andy? Chucky. You mean your doll? Andy nodded. Mike opened his mouth to ask more questions, but Karen stepped between them and gently moved Andy back towards his bedroom. Andy, that's enough. Come on, back to bed. I mean it. Andy went. His head hung low. He was confused and sad. He thought he was doing a good thing by coming to tell his mom and the detective who was on the counter. His teacher, Mrs. Waters, always said that they could trust policemen. They were their friends. He'd wanted to help the detective, but Mommy was acting like he had done something bad. Andy's eyes burned as fresh tears threatened to spill out. This sure had been one busy, overwhelming day for such a little boy. Mike didn't know what to think. More specifically, he knew where the evidence and the scene was trying to take him, and he did not want to go there. To make things even worse, here was this striking woman turning on him in a blaze of righteous fury, and suddenly it was hard to think objectively. It had been a long time since a woman had affected him like that. She put her hands against his solid chest and pushed him towards the door. He could have resisted her easily, but what would be the point? Everyone else was already out of the apartment, leaving him alone with Mrs. Barclay and her son. Good night, detective, she said as she moved him out the door and tried to shut it. Mike stopped on the threshold, one finger up to stall her. It's Lieutenant. Lieutenant Mike Norris. Karen pushed harder. Good night, Lieutenant. Mike held on. You gonna call me? Karen stared flabbergasted. You don't give up, do you? It's just that I hate loose ends. And I hate people who don't know when to stop, she said, giving him one final mighty push and slamming the door in his face. He stared at the wood, running over the end of their conversation in his mind. Gonna call me, he thought. Were you really only wanting to clear up loose ends? Or was there more to the question? Be careful, Mike, that you don't blur the lines here. Someone whistled behind him and Mike turned to see his partner, the mustachioed Jack Santos, who was staring at him with raised eyebrows. Ouch, he said, as Mike fell into step beside him on their way to the elevator. She's a spirited lady. You could say that, Mike replied as he pushed the down arrow and the elevator doors opened. I want Miss Peterson's autopsy report on my desk first thing in the morning and anything else you can find out about Mrs. Barclay and her son. Jack snapped off a sarcastic salute. You got... Is there anything else I can do for you, sir? Yes, smartass. Mike said. He reached into his jacket and pulled out an evidence bag containing Andy's play pal's hammer. Get this to the lab. I found it in the corner of the kitchen behind those wooden planters. Jack took the bag by one corner, smirking at it. He seemed to be waiting for the punchline of a joke. What is this? Mike stared unsmiling as the elevator started down towards the lobby. Possible murder weapon. Jack laughed and then stopped when he saw the expression on Mike's face. You're kidding me, right? Mike lit a cigarette and said nothing.
Chapter 7 A Bedtime Conversation The quiet in the apartment seemed deafening in the absence of the activity from moments ago. The only sounds, the hiss of the cold wind rushing through the broken kitchen window, and the pounding of her heartbeat in her ears. She stood in the archway, staring at the opening at a loss for what to do about it right then. She supposed she could tape tinfoil or wax paper over it until tomorrow, when the building superintendent had said he would have it fixed. She shrugged and turned away. Why waste her time and energy when she was already emotionally and physically exhausted? Neither those or a bed sheet would keep the cold out, and Andy wasn't careless enough to get too close. She walked down to the bathroom and switched the light on, stopping to study her reflection in the mirror above the sink. Her hair was lank and listless, and there were purple bags under each red eye. She thought she looked quite a bit like one of those shell-shocked victims she'd seen on the nightly news stories about the conflict between Israel and Lebanon, their eyes wide and staring as their family home burned in the aftermath of another bombing. Dark thought, love. Maybe, but the day had taken a dark turn. She turned on the faucet and splashed cold water on her face. The water was bracing, refreshing. She glanced over at the shower, wanting nothing more right then than to sit in the tub while hot water washed over her body, carrying with it the day's pain. Soon. First, she had to tuck Andy in and make sure he was okay. She had been more than a little short with him a while ago and had hurt his feelings. She turned off the faucet, reached for a hand towel, and stopped. There were voices in the apartment. Karen dried off quickly and stepped out into the hallway, listening. The voices were coming from behind Andy's closed door. They were talking low, Andy's high, sweet voice, and another deeper voice that sent a glass shard of panic through her heart. Impossible as it was, there was someone in Andy's room. She charged forward and burst into the room to find Andy sitting on the edge of his bed, facing his doll, who still sat in the rocking chair across from him. He looked up at her, a question in his gaze. Karen walked over and sat down beside him on the bed. Who are you talking to, Andy? Chucky, he said. You were talking to Chucky? Sure, he said, pointing to the doll. He's sitting right there. Karen looked over at the freckled doll sitting passive in the chair and then back to her son, wondering if maybe it might have been a mistake to get him the doll. She put her arm around his slender shoulders, seeking to take as much comfort as she gave. Chucky has been talking to you too, hasn't he? What's he been saying? All kinds of things. His real name is Charles Lee Ray, and he's been sent down from heaven by Daddy to play with me. Chucky is Charles Lee Ray? That name sounds familiar. Where did I hear... He has, has he? What else did Chucky say? He said Aunt Maggie was a real bitch, and she got what she deserved. Andy! Karen hissed. How can you say something so horrible? I didn't say it, Andy said, shaking his head. Chucky did. Karen stood to grab Chucky by the arms and shook him in front of Andy. Andy, stop it. You know perfectly well that you're making this up. But I'm not making it up. Chucky is alive. Really, he is. Karen sat back down beside him and handed Chucky to Andy. Touch him, Andy. Do you feel that? Chucky is a doll. He's made of plastic and stuffing. Look at him. Now, does he look like anything else to you? You don't really think he's alive, do you? But he is. Stop it, Karen shouted. Please. Andy grew quiet for a second, his lower lip trembling with sobs just over the horizon. He looked up into her eyes. It's because of Aunt Maggie that you're yelling at me, isn't it? Karen's hitched in breath, ashamed that she had lost her temper with him once again, and sighed. Yes, I guess it is. I'm sorry, he said, wrapping his arms around her neck to hug her. I'll stop making up stories. Karen hugged him back. Thanks, champ. I'm sorry I yelled at you. Do you want to sleep in with me tonight? Andy let go of her and hugged the doll to him. 
No, that's all right. I have Chucky. Okay, she said, pulling the sheets back for him to lay down and then tucking him in. She leaned down and kissed him on the cheek. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, Mommy. Andy said. I love you. I love you, too. Karen walked out and pulled the door closed behind her, then waited. A few seconds passed, and then she heard Andy's soft voice from inside. You were right, Chucky. She didn't believe me. I like to be hugged, replied the doll. Good, said Andy. I like to hug you, too. Karen listened for another minute and heard no more. Troubled, she walked down the hall and into her bedroom. On the other side of the door, Chucky lay beside her sleeping son. His head turned towards the door. He waited until the shadow of her feet vanished from the crack at beneath it, and then he shut his eyes. Chapter 8 Field Trip Morning Comes The sun rises as inevitable as the coming of spring, offering the chance for new beginnings. For Karen, it offered the chance to help Andy begin to forget the events of the previous night. There was too much weight, far more than a child his age should ever have to carry. It was time for him to be a kid again, carefree and happy. She pulled her car in line behind the other parents who were dropping their kids off at Sunnyside Elementary School and waited her turn. Andy sat beside her in the passenger seat, adorable in his silver and red snow pants and jacket. There was a red football on the back of the coat and a white puffball on the top of his red and yellow striped beanie hat. He stared out the frosted window like he didn't have a care in the world, clutching Chucky to his side. Karen looked past him to the line of children entering the school and saw several of them carrying identical dolls in their arms. "'Are you sure you're all right?' she asked as she reached over to straighten his collar. "'No bad dreams last night about Aunt Maggie?' Andy shook his head. "'Good. And Chucky is only a doll, right?' "'Right.' It was their turn in line. Karen reached over to open his door and gave him a quick kiss on the cheek. Off to school with you, then. Have a great day. Andy jumped out and waddled towards the front door of the school with Chucky on his hip. Karen watched him walk inside and then drove away. Andy watched her go and then walked back outside into the chilly morning air. He turned left and headed quickly up the sidewalk in the opposite direction. School wasn't on the agenda today. He reached the corner and took another left. He came to the train station three blocks further down and climbed the stairs to the elevated platform where the ticket taker punched his ticket without a second glance. She didn't get paid enough to care. The train arrived five minutes later and Andy boarded, drawing interested looks from a few of the other passengers. He took a seat by himself, holding Chucky on his lap. Two minutes later, they were on their way. Andy sat quietly looking out the window as the city of Chicago passed by outside. Apartment buildings and high-rise towers gave way to gentrified old neighborhoods, which in turn gave way to more, seedier environs. Andy felt Chucky squeeze his hand and leaned over so Chucky could whisper in his ear that they were getting close. Andy sat back up and looked out over the sprawling acreage flashing by. Trash littered the streets down there, piled up in snow-covered drifts against brown apartment complexes that had been defaced by graffiti. One particular painting caught his eye. Not gang tags, but an actual mural that depicted a black man's distorted face and hands. Pieces of candy lay on the open palms above the cryptic message, Sweets to the Sweet. Chucky, Andy said, holding the doll up to his ear. What does that painting mean? Never you mind, said Chucky. That's bad medicine. Bad medicine? Like the nasty tasting cough syrup mommy makes me take when I'm sick? Chucky chuckled low. <laughs> Not quite. 
That painting's about a scary old story the people who live in that neighborhood pass around. Don't worry your little head about it. You just focus on getting us to the right place, okay? Okay. Andy replied as the train began to slow. An announcement came over the intercom stating that the next stop was the Cabrini Green Station. Chucky squeezed Andy's hand again. It was time to get off. Drug dealers, pimps, and prostitutes watched the little boy and his doll pass along the streets beneath the train tracks. None moved to harass him. He had nothing of value. Andy turned right and walked two blocks down where the street dead-ended at a rusted chain-link fence. Mountains of stinking garbage rose up on the other side, surrounded by clouds of white dump birds. A large bulldozer droned somewhere nearby. The loose panel was right where Chucky told him it was. Andy pulled the stiff metal aside with a grunt and stepped through the opening. He saw a worn trail through the litter ahead and followed it around large piles of refuse, finally coming out the other side to see a derelict two-story house on the far edge of the dump. Most of the windows were shattered and half of the shingles were missing from the sagging roof. Andy stopped to glance down at Chucky and ask, Is this Eddie's? Chucky didn't answer. Andy looked around and saw a patch of reeds growing taller than him and suddenly felt the urge to pee. He sat Chucky down on an old high back chair. You wait here, I have to tinkle. Chucky watched him go, waiting for him to disappear into the undergrowth, and then he leapt down the chair and sprinted across the snowy ground towards the dilapidated house. Rats, rats everywhere. They crawled over counters and floors in, in the sink full of dirty dishes alive with the squirming carpet of maggots. Chucky let the back door slam shut behind him, not bothering to be quiet and eyed the mess. The place had really gone downhill since the last time he'd been there. How the hell did I ever end up partnered with scum like this? he thought as he punted a curious rodent across the kitchen. It struck the far wall with an audible thud and limped away on broken legs. Its friends watched it go hungrily. Chucky hoped they would cannibalize it. That would be fun to watch. This is incredible. Look how strong I and how fast I am. I was never so fast in my old body. I can run forever and never grow tired or run out of breath. Speaking of which, there was someone in the house that needed to stop breathing very soon. Chucky crossed the room to the old stove and blew out the pilot light. Then he twisted the dials. He heard a hiss and smelled the unpleasant scent of gas and smiled. Andy was finished making yellow snow. He pulled his pants back up and made his meandering way back through the overgrown reeds, whistling the Play Pals theme song as he went. He came out and froze. The chair was empty. Chucky was gone. Andy looked around, fear filling his mind. He thought back to the neighborhood outside the dump, remembered the curious looks from the people he had passed. What if one of them had followed them and took Chucky? Chucky! He shouted. Where are you? Andy Caputo jerked awake, unsure of where he was, still in the grip of the dream. He'd been sitting in the corner of a dark room watching Charles working his special kind of magic on a teenage girl. 
She was naked as the day she was born, her body covered in complex runes drawn in chicken blood. Andy had been waiting for his turn to work his own magic on the girl before Charles came back to finish her off. It had been a pleasant dream. Eddie sat up and reached for the half-empty brown bottle of Popsicle resting on the floor by the mattress. Running his dry tongue over his desiccated lips, he unscrewed the top, lifted the whiskey, and stopped when he heard a raised voice outside. What the fuck? He dropped the bottle to the floor and pulled a huge five-shot forty-four Magnum revolver from under his threadbare pillow. He stood, checking the cylinder to make sure the gun was loaded, and then walked out onto the landing. Wind susurrated through the house from a dozen broken windows and holes. Boards creaked as the house shifted. Everything seemed to be in motion, making it almost impossible to pinpoint the sound of an intruder. Eddie thumbed the revolver's hammer back and started down the stairs. Hello, Eddie. Eddie froze, his heart in his throat. He knew that voice. Hadn't he just heard it cackling over a dying girl in his dream only minutes before? But that was impossible. He'd heard the bastard cops bragging about it the night he was arrested. Charles Lee Ray was dead. He took another step and peered over the splintered banister into the shadowed foyer below and saw nothing. Ch Chucky, he breathed, arming nervous sweat from his furrowed brow. I is that you? Who else would it be? After all, this is our hideout, isn't it? Where had that come from? He should be able to tell, but the voice seemed to be moving through walls and floorboards. Hell, why not? If Charles was truly dead, then this must be his ghost, and ghosts certainly could pass through walls. Sure it is. Uh, I was just surprised to hear your voice, man. I, I thought she got off by the pigs. Nah, Chucky said, laughing that mad laugh of his. <laughs> I wouldn't go and do that. Not and leave you alive anyway. Fear and dread gripped Eddie. He squeezed the gun's handle tighter and inched further down the creaking stair. What are you talking about, Chucky? A door groaned open towards the rear of the house. Did he hear footsteps along the bare wooden floor? You left me, Eddie. You chickened out and left me behind. Do you really think I'm gonna let you live after something like that? Eddie reached the bottom step and swept the foyer with his magnum. Something fell over in the room to the right of the front door. He charged in, saw an old rocking chair turned over on its side. Not in there, Eddie. <laughs> Chucky called from somewhere near the back of the house. I'm in here, you asshole. Eddie charged past the fallen chair and through an open doorway into what was once the living room. He glanced around, breathing hard, looking for any sign of his old partner behind the sagging couch and moth-ridden armchair. He heard a voice to his left and spun to see a young boy walking around outside the house. He was dressed in gray and red snow pants and jacket. Eddie tracked him with the gun, the sights hovering over the boy's chest. Chucky! Called the little boy. Where are you? Chucky! Forget the kid, Eddie. It's me you want. Come on, you better get me before I get you. Eddie turned and stared at the closed door to the kitchen. He was sure Chucky's voice had come from there. He had him now. He moved forward, put his free hand on the doorknob. It turned easily in his grasp. I got you now, he screamed, throwing the door open and firing wildly into the space. His first bullet struck a spark off the metal stove. There was a huge whomp, and the last thing Eddie Caputo felt was the concussion wave as the gas ignited and the house exploded around him.
Chapter 9 Andy at the Police Station Karen's heels pounded at a staccato beat on the tiled floor of the police precinct, the clicking sound echoing from the high vaulted ceiling of the lobby. She passed by a wall of black and white photos of uniformed men and women who were forever immortalized there for having given the ultimate sacrifice to the city. The polished brass plaque on the wall over the pictures named it the Wall of Remembrance. She passed by the solemn gathering and caught the attention of a young woman dressed in a plain brown skirt and white blouse. Pardon me, Karen said. I'm looking for Detective Lieutenant Norris. The woman opened her mouth to answer but stopped when a familiar voice called out from down the hall. The two women turned to see the man himself trotting up, his signature half-grin on his face. He held out his hand to her and she shook it. Thank you for coming down here, Miss Barkley. He said, placing a gentle hand on her shoulder and leading her down the hall past detectives and patrolmen busy about their own work. What's wrong? she asked. I came as soon as I got your message. Have you been home yet? Karen shook her head. No, I came straight here from work. Why? Mike stopped walking and faced her. He chewed on his lip for a moment as if unsure exactly how to go on, and then said, We have your son here. This was the last thing she'd expected to hear. Why is Andy here? He's supposed to be at school. Mike motioned to a door to their right. Let's step into my office. She followed him inside and sat in a plaid pattern armchair that sat in front of his desk. The room smelled of aftershave and leather. Good smells. She took the opportunity to look around as he moved to sit not behind his desk but in another armchair beside her. The office was neater than she would have expected. The stacks of papers on his desk each organized and straight. There was a framed commendation for valor in the line of duty on the wall over his desk chair and a small trophy featuring a tiny bronze man aiming a pistol that sat on top of his filing cabinet. He cleared his throat to get her attention and she turned back and met his troubled eyes. I don't know how to tell you this, Mrs. Barkley. Tell me what? He looked away, unable to hold her gaze. Something bad then. She reached out and put a hand on his to draw him back. Please tell me what's wrong. His shoulders slumped and he sighed. I've had to arrest Andy. Shock and fear washed over her and she pulled her hand back, wrapping her arms tightly around her chest as if to keep it from bursting wide with the power of her emotions. Mike leaned forward in his seat, his hand raised to comfort but stopped halfway to her and let it fall back into his lap. He looked helpless. Can I get you water or something? He asked. Karen took three deep breaths to calm herself and felt the spinning world around her begin to slow. She shook her head. What did you arrest him for? Murder. Mike said. What in the world? Exactly who did he kill? Your friend Maggie Peterson, for one. Karen stood up, waving her hands in front of her face. No way! That's crazy! Andy loved her! She was like an aunt to him! I know that, but... He reached over and pulled a tan folder from the top of the nearest stack of papers and showed it to her. This is the coroner's report on Mrs. Peterson. The autopsy showed that she was hit very hard on the forehead with a hard instrument before she went out the window. That doesn't prove a damn thing, she sputtered. Maybe she stumbled and hit her head before she fell. Mrs. Barkley, do you remember the footprints on the kitchen counter? If your son stood on the counter where those prints were, he would have been at the exact height to hit Mrs. Peterson in the forehead. Karen began to pace the small office, biting her nails. I'm telling you that's impossible. I know my son. Andy would never do a thing like that. There's something else. Mike said, interrupting her. Eddie Caputo died this afternoon. Karen stopped pacing and stared at him. Who? Haven't you heard about him on the news? Mike asked. Karen shook her head, so he continued. Eddie Caputo was the Lake Shore Strangler's partner. They'd drive around town, pick up women, then take them back to one of the hideouts where they would torture and kill them together. All right, Karen said. So a psychopath died this afternoon. What's that got to do with Andy? 
Caputo escaped from jail. Someone blew up his hideout today with him inside. Your son was found sitting outside clutching the doll when we arrived. A wave of nausea came over Karen, and she had to fight to keep her lunch down. I don't understand any of this. I dropped Andy off at school this morning. How did he get outside some psycho's murder house? Where is he? I want to see him. Mike stood. Don't worry, he's fine. We have him in the next room being questioned. She turned for the office door. Let me see him. Mike grabbed her hand to hold her for a moment, staring into her wide eyes. Are you sure you're in the shape for this right now? Maybe you should take a few minutes to calm down first. She put the hand, not holding the doorknob, on top of his and gently pulled it off her. I'm perfectly calm. Please, let me see my son. Mike watched her for a few seconds more and then nodded. Karen opened the door and he pointed to another across the hall from them. They crossed to it and stepped inside a small dim room where several people stood staring through a window that looked on to another room. Karen moved to the window and saw Andy and his doll sitting on a couch beside the mustachioed detective whom she'd spoken to upon arriving to her apartment the night before. The detective opened his mouth to talk and Karen realized she could hear his voice coming from a small speaker set into the wall above the viewing port. So, what happened then, Andy? I went looking for Chucky and the whole house blew up. Do you have any idea why it blew up? Andy shook his head so the detective continued. What were you doing there anyway, Andy? Why weren't you at school? Chucky wanted me to see Eddie. Jack, the mustachioed man, glanced over to the window, unable to see them but aware they were there, and then back to Andy. Do you mean Eddie Caputo? Now why did Chucky want you to see him? He said that Eddie was an angel and he could take me up to heaven to visit my daddy. Karen pulled back, pain exploding in her chest. Mike was at her side in an instant. What? Andy lost his father recently. I, I know. He said. I read the police report on the accident. The car went off the road and Andy was thrown clear. I think something like that could give anybody emotional problems, especially a small child. Did your report also tell you that Andy saw it happen? That he was walking behind Bob, holding his hand when it happened? One second, his father was there, and the next, Andy's hand was empty, and people were screaming. No. Mike said quietly. It didn't. Andy ran out into the street to help his father. Bob was dead already, but Andy didn't realize that. He kept shaking Bob, begging him to get up. He was covered in Bob's blood when the police got there. They had to drag Andy off his father. Of course something like that will hurt a child, but Andy is doing better every day. He doesn't hurt people. He's just a little sad. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barkley. Karen turned back to the window. So am I. His father was a wonderful man. Jack was still questioning Andy. What about Aunt Maggie, Andy? Do you have any idea why she fell out that window? Jack leaned closer to Andy, a bloodhound smelling its prey. Andy looked over to a small table where his doll sat watching them. She saw Chucky, and it scared her so much she fell out. Karen stiffened and Mike turned to her. What? It's that damn doll, she answered. Ever since I bought Andy the thing, he's been insisting it was alive. Mike nodded. Yeah, I know. That's all he keeps talking about. Let me talk to him. Maybe I can find out what's going on. Mike hesitated, glancing over to a gray-haired man who wore large bifocal glasses and an odd necktie covered with cavorting ducklings. Mike had asked the man once why he wore such outrageous ties, and he'd answered that the kids loved them. What do you say, Doc? The older man's brow wrinkled in thought. Finally, he nodded. I think that would be a great idea. Karen frowned over at the man. I'm sorry, who are you? The man smiled to her and shook her hand. I apologize. Where are my manners? I'm Dr. Rufus Ardmore. I'm a state-appointed child psychologist assigned to review Andy's case here. He motioned towards the door. Please don't let me hold you up. We can talk later. 
Your son is waiting. Thank you, Karen said as she and Mike stepped out into the hallway and walked through another door into the little room. Andy saw her when she walked in, and he leapt into her arms. They hugged each other tight, and then Karen set him down on the couch and took the place beside him that had been vacated by Jack when they came in. Are, are you okay? she asked. Sure, I'm all right, Mommy. Andy, you've got to listen to me. Nobody believes you about Chucky. Unless you start telling the truth right now, they're going to take you away from me. Andy looked around at the two detectives and then rushed across the room to grab Chucky. He held him up, staring him in the freckled face. Do you hear that, Chucky? They're going to take me away unless you say something. Please say something! The good guy stared implacably back, refusing to make a sound. Andy raised his small fist and began to pound Chucky's body over and over again, screaming. Come on! Say something! Tell me why you lied to me about everything! Tell me why you lied about my daddy! Come on, Chucky! Tell me! Servos whined inside the doll and it turned its head. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Heidi ho Ha ha ha! Andy slammed his fist into Chucky one more time and then ran to his mother with tears in his eyes. Mommy, he's doing it on purpose. He told me never to tell about him or he'd kill me. A soft buzz filled the room, interrupting them, and then Dr. Ardmore's voice came through. Mrs. Uh, Barclay, I've heard more than enough. I think Andy should spend a couple of days with us at County General. The whole world shattered around Karen and she slumped to her knees beside the couch. She looked up at the mirror to where the psychologist had been standing before. Please don't take him. I'm begging you. I'm sorry. I know this is difficult for the both of you, but my hands are tied. I must insist on an evaluation. He'll spend three days with us, and then hopefully I'll be able to send him back to you with a clean bill of health. What happens if you decide you can't? Silence spun out for a long moment, and then he said, Well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Karen felt hope die. She looked around at Jack and Mike, wishing they could be the heroes she needed at that moment, wishing Mike Norris could swoop in and be her very own knight in shining armor. Mike grimaced and looked away. Karen looked back to her son and began to cry. Chapter 10 Revelation Karen Barkley had never felt more lost and hopeless in her life. The elevator door slid open and she trudged along the hall to the home she shared with her son. The home that was silent, cold, and empty now that Andy had been whisked away where she could not reach him. She reached the apartment door and shifted Andy's doll from one hand to the other so she could dig through her purse for her keys. The doll, Chucky, the one thing Andy wanted above all else, the thing that was supposed to make him happy, the thing that had seemingly destroyed their lives in a matter of hours. She glanced behind her at the balcony, railing beyond which lay a four-story plummet to the lobby below. She looked at the doll, considered tossing it over the edge, and decided against it. She found her keys, fumbled them, and watched them fall to the tiled floor at her feet. Damn it, she moaned, leaning her forehead against the wooden door frame. She didn't have the energy to perform the simple task of bending down and retrieving them. But what other choice did she have? She bent slowly, picked them up, and managed to open the apartment door without dropping them or the doll. She was met by the smell of fresh sawdust as she shuffled inside and shut the door behind her. It was warmer inside than she'd expected. She walked down the hall and peered around the corner into the kitchen, where she discovered a large panel of plywood tacked up over the broken window. Her landlord had been busy while she was out. She dropped her purse on the little table in the hallway and then carried Chucky into the living room, setting him on the coffee table. 
She collapsed back on the couch and stared at the smiling, freckled face with its chubby, dimpled cheeks and red hair. The doll stared back. She leaned forward, elbows on her knees, waiting. Silence spun out around them. Finally, the quiet was too much for her to bear any longer. She reached out and tapped Chucky hard on his sneakered foot. Well, say something, you little bastard. Nothing from the doll. Karen struck his foot again, knocking it to the edge of the table. Noticing the fine powdery remnants of spilled sugar that still clung to the soles of his shoes. Say something, damn it! Chucky blinked his sky-blue eyes and turned his head as if he were studying her as she studied him. Hi, I like to be hugged. Karen stared for a second and then burst into laughter. She stood shaking her head as she made her way into the kitchen where she drew herself a glass of water from the tap. Jesus Christ, what am I doing? I can't be buying into this lunacy. She drained the glass in three large swallows and set it aside for later use. She turned in a circle, listless, unsure of what to do. Normally, she would be washing the dishes from dinner and making sure Andy was brushing his teeth and taking his bath. After that, she would settle in beside him in the bed and read him a story. Tonight, there would be no story because there was no Andy, and this fact left her adrift in a sea of anxiety. She glanced around and her eyes fell on the bright yellow and red box resting in the corner beside the trash can, a cartoonish drawing of Chucky waving from the side panel. She walked over and picked up the box. A good guy doll is a kid's best friend, she read, snorting derisively. Yeah, sure. She tipped the box over, meaning to jam it into the trash bin, and froze when something fell out of the open box onto the linoleum floor. Karen stared down at the things in wide-eyed horror, her hands numb. Two big batteries wrapped in plastic lay at her feet. Karen twisted the box in her hand, searching through the product descriptions and copyright legalize, finding what she was looking for near the bottom. Batteries included. It read in bright red letters. But that's impossible. I've seen it move. I've heard the damn thing talk. She dropped the box by the trash can and slowly inched around the corner into the living room, expecting the doll to have moved or vanished entirely but it was exactly where she'd left it. She took a breath, her muscles rigid, and found that she had to force her feet to move. She did not want to go near the thing, did not want to be alone with it. Suck it up, buttercup, she thought. Something weird is going on here, and Andy needs you. She crossed the room and picked up Chucky with shaking hands. He felt perfectly normal in her hands, his rigid plastic arms and head cool to the touch. She flipped him over and undid the Velcro holding the back of his clothes together, revealing a little hatch in the small of his back, with the words, Batteries Go Here, written on it in raised lettering. She fingered the catch and opened the hatch to reveal what she dreaded to find, an empty battery compartment. Suddenly, Chucky's head revolved around completely backwards on his neck in an uncanny imitation of little Reagan O'Neill and the Exorcist. Clear blue eyes stared up at her, not vacant now, but seemingly full of malevolent menace. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? Karen shrieked and let the demonic doll fall to the carpet. It hit the floor and rolled out of sight beneath the couch. Karen took a quick step back, her heart jackhammering in her chest. It talked without batteries. It really did. The world seemed to be spinning apart around her, revealing hints of unexpected dark gulfs beyond. Madness lay down that path. Karen didn't have time for that, so she forced the darkness away and forced herself to focus on Andy. What if Andy was telling the truth? She stepped towards the couch and knelt down, ready to spring back if something tried to grab at her from the dark space beneath. She lifted the fringe, looked under. Chucky lay motionless on his back. To Kieran, he looked like a poisonous snake poised to strike. She reached out and dragged him to her by his limp foot. She picked him up and stood, holding him up. 
He stared back at her with blank, glassy eyes. Karen narrowed her eyes, staring back. She wasn't falling for this act anymore. Talk, she demanded. Come on, talk to me. Chucky remained silent. She shook Chucky as hard as she could, his red hair flopping back and forth. I said talk, damn it. I know what you're doing. You're doing the same thing to me that you did to Andy, aren't you? Well, it's not going to work anymore, you little shit. Say something if you're alive. Nothing. Karen growled deep in her throat. She looked over to the mantle to the fake spindle of yarn with its collection of matches within and came to a decision. She looked back to the passive doll. I've got something for you. Oh, yes. I'm going to make you talk. She charged across the room to the fireplace and twisted the knob to turn on the gas, then fumbled a match from the jar, struck it against the mantle and tossed it into the fireplace. The gas ignited with a whoosh, filling the grate with bright orange flames. Last chance, she shouted, holding Chucky over her head. Talk to me or I'm going to throw you in the fire. Life returned to the evil doll's face, changing its vapid, wholesome face into that of a deranged maniac. You stupid bitch, he shouted, flailing his arms and legs, trying to break free of her grasp. You think you can fuck with me? Nobody fucks with me. Karen gripped him harder, trying to hold on, but it was like holding on to a bag full of writhing worms. Chucky lunged forward, his mouth opened wide to reveal a set of gleaming teeth and clamped down on the tender flesh of her forearm. She screamed as her skin tore and blood began to flow into the crook of her outstretched arm. She opened her hands and let Chucky fall to the floor. He landed on his feet, lithe as a cat, and charged forward to wrap Karen's legs in a surprisingly strong grip. She fell on her face, felt a new pain bloom in her calf as Chucky bit her again. She kicked him away and sat up. Hidey ho, bitch! <laughs> Chucky cackled, dancing and fainting like a boxer just out of her reach. Don't you know who I am? I'm the bringer of pain. Don't fuck with me or you die. You can't stop me. No one can. Chucky charged towards Karen, intent on inflicting agony upon agony, but she was ready this time. She reached with her left hand, took a fireplace poker from a rack, and whipped it across side-armed in front of her. The poker struck Chucky in the chest and sent him flying through the air. He hit the wall with a soft thwap and bounced up immediately, beginning his boxer hop again. Didn't you know? I'm indestructible. Do you hear me? Indestructible, bitch! <laughs> Karen brandished the poker at him, waving him closer, fire in her eyes. Indestructible, huh? Come over here and let's test that theory. I'll show you who the real bitch is, little man. Chucky looked from the improvised weapon to his new warrior woman and laughed again. He took a step towards the archway to the hall. Hey, do you know who isn't indestructible? Your bratty little kid. He's gonna fry for what I've done. Isn't a damn thing you can do about it. Do you hear me? He's going to fry. No, he won't. Not after I show them you. Oh, yes. <laughs> he cackled. He gave her the finger and then spun and sprinted into the hall. Karen heard the apartment door being opened and realized the little bastard was leaving. No, she thought, scrambling to her feet and limping as fast as she could after him. I have to stop him or Andy's going to be gone forever. She heard the ding of the elevator as she exited the apartment, heard Chucky's laughter as the elevator door slid closed. <laughs> no, wait! The elevator car started down too fast. Karen hobbled to the top of the stairs and gave chase down one flight of stairs, two, 
she was closing in, could see Chucky's orange mop of hair through the elevator shaft's cage. She reached the next landing and then her injured leg turned traitor, spilling her to the hard tile floor. She scrambled to her feet, charged to the lobby one flight down to find the elevator door open and the car empty. No! No! She ran outside and spun around, searching the sidewalks and streets for any flash of red or blue, and saw nothing. Chucky was gone. Chapter 11 Back at the Station Detective Lieutenant Mike Norris sat behind his desk staring at a report he'd been trying to finish for the last 30 minutes, not seeing the words on the page, looking through to the white void behind. The events of the recent past played on the white expanse like a film projected on a movie screen. He saw Charles Lee Ray fall, fatally wounded by his bullets, the first person Mike had ever killed in the line of duty. Granted, Charles Lee Ray was no great loss, but it was no small matter to take a life. Mike still felt an icy chill around his heart when he remembered. He saw a shattered skylight in a cloud that wasn't a cloud. Its throat choked with living lightning and the vilest thoughts. It was a cloud that saw through flesh and bone to the very soul, and oh, how it hungered. Mike closed his eyes, forcing the terrifying image away before it could take root and breed bad dreams. More images floated out of the darkness behind his eyelids. A broken window, a body bag, and the tearful faces of a child and his mother. Mike couldn't remember a time when he'd felt so heartsick as when he'd had to stand by and watch Andy Barclay taken away. What a day. He muttered, glancing up to the clock mounted on the wall above the door. He should have left 20 minutes ago. He looked back to the incomplete report and decided it could wait until the morning. He stood, grabbing his coat from the rack in the corner, and strode out into the hall and towards the precinct's front entrance. He paused on the sidewalk outside to fasten the top button of his jacket against the chilly evening air, and turned when he heard a car door slam to his left. He felt a strange flutter in his chest, at the unexpected sight of Karen Barkley coming towards him. What was that? Guilt? Fear? That she would blame him for Andy's predicament? Or was it excitement at the chance to see her again? Lieutenant Norris! Hello, Mrs. Barkley. What are you doing back here? She skidded to a stop in front of him and gripped his arm. Andy was telling the truth. Chucky is alive and he killed Maggie and Eddie Caputo. Wow, Mike thought. I don't know what I was expecting, but it certainly was not that. Excuse me? It's true, Karen said. I swear, I took him back to my apartment and was about to throw away the box he came in when the batteries fell out. Don't you see? Chucky has been moving and talking for days now without batteries in him. What are you talking about? I'm talking about how I found out Chucky is alive. I threatened to throw him in the fireplace and he came alive in my hands. I dropped him and he got up and ran out of the apartment. Mike had heard enough. He turned away towards his car. Good night, Mrs. Barkley. Karen stepped between him and the car, forcing him to stop. Wait a minute. I'm telling you the truth. He killed Maggie and Eddie Caputo. Mike felt an uncharacteristic flush of anger and had to take a deep breath to calm himself. Go easy, Mike. Remember that she's been through hell the last couple of days. Look, Mrs. Barkley, I sympathize with you. I really do. I hated what happened in there today, but lying is not going to help your son. He said, Lying? She said, pulling her shirt sleeve back to reveal the bloody wound on her forearm. Does this look like I'm lying? She bent over and lifted the hem of her long skirt to show an identical mark on her calf. Does this? Mike was taken aback. That looks bad. How'd you get those? Chucky bit me. Mike rolled his eyes and stepped around her. Oh, for God's sake. Karen slapped the hood of Mike's car. 
All right, don't believe me, but I'll tell you this. That doll is a killer. It's done it before, and it's going to do it again. With that said, Karen spun on her heels and started back towards her car. Mike watched her go. Something in her gait and the set of her shoulders worrying him. He took a step after her. Where are you going now? I'm going to find Chucky. How are you going to do that? Karen yanked her car door open and turned back. I bought him from a peddler in the alley behind Sears where I work. I'll start there. Worry became fear as he realized what she was planning. Wait a minute. This isn't a good part of town to be in this time of night. Karen climbed behind the wheel, ignoring him. She cranked the car and pulled away from the curb. A woman on a mission. Mrs. Barkley! He shouted as she accelerated past him. Do you hear me? You don't want to go down there this time of night. She reached the corner and turned out of sight. Mike felt like kicking something. Oh, God damn it! He shouted, jumping behind the wheel of his own car and speeding off after her. Chapter 12 The Peddler Karen walked the seedy back alleys of Chicago, past steaming, stinking sewer drains and equally smelly people. They watched her from the shadows with dull, downtrodden eyes that spoke of utter madness and crushing despair. She felt their gaze like a physical weight. Did they hate her for the things she had that they did not? Did they covet the warm coat she pulled tight against the numbing chill? These forgotten dregs truly lived life on the razor's edge, not knowing where their next meal would come from or if they would be safe when they lay down their heads to sleep. A snowflake drifted down past her nose, and she had the realization that some of these people might freeze to death before the winter was over. She crossed the street towards a ramshackle gathering of lean-tos that had been erected in a vacant alley between two shuttered businesses and tentatively approached their occupants. The woman in the right shelter fled before her, muttering in response to voices only she could hear. An old man with a tangled beard watched her go with a shake of his head and then turned to Karen. What are you doing down here by yourself, miss? Don't you know there are crazy folks roaming these streets? I need your help, Karen said. I'm looking for a clean-shaven man with black hair and really bad teeth. He sells things out of a shopping cart around here. Have you seen him? Can't say that I have or haven't, replied the old man. People around here tend to mind their own business most of the time. It's safer that way. Oh, please try to remember. He's taller than me and he wears a long black coat. It's really important that I find him. The old man studied her for a moment, running grimy fingers through his knotted beard. And then he pointed behind her. Go down that direction a couple of blocks. There's another lot like this one where a bunch of people like to get together to drink and sit around a fire. You might find who you're looking for there. Karen thanked him and pressed on, the echoes of her footfalls keeping pace with her as she went. She had the strangest feeling that she was being followed, but there was no one there when she turned around. Could it be Chucky? He was certainly small enough to avoid being seen, but why would he follow her? She came to the clearing a couple minutes later and paused on the sidewalk, an outsider in their desperate world. There were perhaps twenty of them, men, women, and a few children, huddled close about burning barrels of trash and scavenged wood. She scanned each face, looking for the peddler. She finally caught sight of him near the rear of the lot, his arm draped around the shoulders of a middle-aged woman with the careworn face of an eighty-year-old. He saw Karen staring at him and disengaged himself from the woman. Hey, Karen called. You, over there! The man was no innocent and he turned to flee, fearful of reprisal for any number of misdeeds he'd committed in the past. She chased after him, her hands held out before her to show him she was unarmed, and cornered him between a junk car and the wall of a building. Don't run, Karen said. I just want to talk to you. Don't you remember me? I bought a doll from you behind Sears Department Store a couple days ago. Doll? 
Recognition lit up his shifty eyes, and his burned-out brain began to work. Oh yeah, uh, doll, what about it? I need to know where you got it. A sleazy half-grin came to his face, and he took a step closer to her, his musky scent like a solid wall that pushed her back. What do you give me if I tell? Karen reached into her purse and pulled out a small wad of bills and offered it to him. He took it with a shake of his head. That's not enough. What else do you got? I don't have anything else. He took another step towards her, forcing her to step back, and she felt the backs of her legs come in contact with the rusted out car. He devoured her body with his black rat's eyes, his half grin becoming a salacious sneer. He reached out in the flash and took her by the arms, his fingers digging painfully into her flesh. That's not true. You got a lot. Karen suddenly realized what he meant and tried to pull away, but it was too late. He shoved her backwards onto the car's hood and began to crawl on top of her. This couldn't be happening. She pushed against his book, tried to squirm away. She felt his weight settling between her legs and then he was gone. She looked up to see Mike Norris land three quick knee strikes to the peddler's crotch, sending him crumbling to the cold ground. Mike didn't miss a beat. In an instant, he had his service revolver drawn and was brandishing it around at the crowd of vagrants who had snuck closer to watch Karen's violation. How about the rest of you? He shouted, such anger in his voice. You want a party too? Apparently, they did not. Karen stood up shakily and watched as the crowd dispersed into the night, leaving she and Mike alone with the creep groaning in pain at her feet. Satisfied they were safe, Mike turned to her, his eyes wide, and Karen realized that he had been scared for her. Are you all right? He asked. I, I think so. How did you get here? Did you follow me? He lowered his gaze, ashamed at being caught out, but then nodded. Didn't I tell you this was a bad part of town to be in this time of night? I couldn't let you come down here by yourself, Karen. Touched, she reached out and brushed his cheek with the back of her hand. Thank God you didn't. A louder moan from the ground. My balls! You broke my balls, you bastard! I think I'm bleeding! Mike bent and yanked the peddler to his feet and shoved him back against the car. The gun aimed at the sky yet clearly visible to the man. That was far less than you deserved, asshole. Now you're gonna answer the lady's question, where did you get the doll? I don't know nothing about no doll. Mike lowered the gun until it was pointed directly at the man's throbbing testicles. You aren't gonna be knowing anything about anything in another minute unless you stop talking. The man shook his head and then froze as he heard Mike thumb the revolver's hammer back. Okay, man, okay, I got it at the burned out toy store on Wabash. Karen saw something dark pass over Mike's face as he pulled the peddler to his feet and shoved him away. Get the hell out of here. The peddler didn't have to be told twice. He jogged off as fast as his swelling gonads would allow and was swallowed up by the night. Karen turned back to Mike, met his haunted eyes. What? What's wrong, Mike? Nothing. He replied, turning to walk away. Now wait a minute, she said as she grabbed his arm and forced him to stop. Something the peddler said upset you. Talk to me. Mike held her game for a pregnant second and then sighed. All right, the toy store on Wabush and Van Buren, the one where he said he found the doll, Charles Lee Ray died there. Karen frowned, sure that she was missing something important. Who? The Lakeshore Strangler. The men was partners with Eddie Caputo. Karen spun on her heels, headed for the street. It was Mike's turn to pull her to a stop. Where are you going now? She shrugged out from under his hand. To Wabash and Van Buren. Why? There's nothing there. It's just an abandoned wreck of a store. She tried to pull away again, and he held her tight, refusing to let her run off into danger again. Oh, why, you don't believe me? It was struck by lightning the night Charles Lee Ray died. Karen finally stopped struggling and turned to face him. How do you know that? Because I was there. I'm the one who killed him. Silence fell between them and Karen saw pain etched in the lines of his handsome face. Why, why didn't you tell me? Mike looked away towards the cloudy night sky and shrugged. 
It's not exactly the kind of thing you tell someone. I did what I had to do, but I'm not proud of it. He reached out to take her arm again, and this time she let him. Come on, let me walk you back to your car so we can get out of here. Okay, she said, beginning to walk with him. But tell me something. Did he say anything? Anything at all? Who? Did Charles Lee Ray say anything before he died? Yes. Mike said. He threatened to kill me and Eddie Caputo. They reached the sidewalk and turned left up the street. Karen strode beside him, her mind full of confusing and terrifying possibilities. Chapter 13 A Loose End Mike drove in silence along the sleepy streets of Chicago, not hearing the smooth sounds of Coltrane and Davis floating from the speakers. He was a complete loss. Look at him, running behind a woman he barely knew like some Arthurian knight honor-bound to rescue the damsel in distress. Sure, he was a cop, but he'd be lying to himself if he didn't admit that he had more than a professional interest in Karen Barkley. What was it about her that drew him in? Was it the way her hair brushed along her shoulders when she walked, or the passion he saw in her eyes when she was angry? Let's not forget about the fact that she is more than half way to being uh, certifiable, he thought as they turned the corner onto her block. Do crazy ladies do it for you now? He wasn't sure about that. The one thing he was certain of at the moment, though, was that Karen Barclay did do it for him, and that was not a good thing. Putting aside the normal ethical considerations that went along with him being a law enforcement officer and her being a witness, there was the not inconsiderable fact that her son might be a deranged murderer. Wouldn't that be a great topic of conversation for a first date? How do you like the salad, Karen? Oh, by the way, how is Andy's shock treatments going? Is he drooling yet? Brilliant. He said, pulling up to the curb in front of her apartment building and shutting off the car's engine. Just what have you gotten yourself into here? No answer was forthcoming from the empty car, it seemed, so he opened his door and joined Karen in front of the lobby door. They paused at the threshold like a couple reluctant to let the night end. He met her gaze and saw that the spark that had been ignited back in the clearing was still blazing. He wondered what she was thinking. He placed a hand on the lobby door, ready to open it for her like a proper gentleman. I'm sorry you couldn't find anything to help Andy. He said. Karen studied him for a moment, a frown creasing her face and then shook her head. But I did. I found out that Chucky is Charles Lee Ray. I just don't know how he got inside the doll. See, Mike? She's a wackadoo. Get your head in the game and walk away from this insanity before you get drawn in any further. Good night, Mrs. Barkley, he said, turning back to his car. The click of her heels on the sidewalk told him she was following. Wait a minute, she said. I need to know where Charles Lee Ray lived. Oh, no, you don't, he thought, as he rounded the rear of his vehicle and reached the driver's side door. No more nighttime strolls on the wrong side of the tracks for you. Please, he said. I'm begging you to let this go for now. Go inside and get some rest. Karen reached out and placed her hand over the door handle before he could open it and climb behind the wheel. Just tell me where he lived. Don't you understand? Andy's life depends on it. Now it's a matter of life and death. Just tell her what she wants and get the hell out of here, Mike. She's not your responsibility. Fine. He sighed. Ray lived at 730 Stony Island on the south side, but you're wasting your time. I already checked the place out. There's nothing there. Are you sure? Positive. He said, gently removing her hand from the car door and pulling it open. Karen put a hand on his arm, preventing him from shutting the door. Wait a minute, where are you going? Home. He replied. To get some sleep. Her grip grew tighter, almost painful through the fabric of his coat, holding him in place. You can't do that. Can't you see? You just said it back at the clearing. Chucky killed Eddie Caputo, so that leaves you. That's it! Mike cried, pulling his arm out of her grasp. I've had enough! Karen put her hand on the open car door. 
I'm telling you the truth. Why won't you believe me? Because I'm sane and rational, Mrs. Barkley. Sane and rational. Dead people stay dead. Souls don't get stuck inside children's toys. And clouds can't see you. Clouds? What? Shit, he thought. Your own crazy is starting the show, buddy. It's nothing. He said, gripping the car door. Do you mind letting go? All right, she shouted, slapping the car's roof. All right. Do you remember what you said to me in my apartment the night Maggie died? You said you don't like loose ends. Well, I'm a loose end. You can't just let go of what I said tonight without checking it out. Sure I can. He snapped. Watch your fingers. He pulled the door to, forcing her to let go, and then rolled the window down. She stood just outside, her chest raising and falling rapidly, her eyes wide with anger and fear. He hated seeing her that way, but enough was enough. Mike! For the last time, good night. He said, cutting her off before she could build up another head of steam. He cranked the ignition and pulled away. He watched her grow small in his mirrors, hoping to see her head inside before he turned the corner and she vanished from his sight. She didn't. Well, so what? You already decided that she wasn't your responsibility anymore, right? That's right. He muttered. John Coltrane and Miles Davis had been replaced by a more contemporary artist on the radio. He reached out to turn up the volume, hoping the blaring horns would drown out his racing thoughts. I'm a loose end. You can't just let go of what I said tonight without checking it out. Sure I can. You're not a loose end. You're batshit crazy. You're out of your pretty little mind. He came to a red light, reached to turn on his blinker, and hesitated. Home and sleep lay to his right. The police station and insanity lay to his left. The choice was simple, right? Chucky killed Eddie Caputo. That leaves you. The passion in her eyes, the wounds on her arm and leg, just the right size to have been made by that little doll's mouth. Shit. He muttered. The light turned green and he turned left, headed towards the station. Chapter 14, Mike's Visitor The street and parking area beside the police station was as quiet as it ever got in Chicago. Two detectives huddled together on the front steps, leading to the entrance, their coats drawn close around them, cigarettes burning in their gloved hands. A gray tomcat crossed under a parked car, his matted fur and scarred face a testament to the hardships of a life lived on the streets. None were aware that they were being watched. It had been one hell of a night for Chucky. Sure, he wished he could have finished what he started with Andy's bitch of a mother, but that would have invited too many questions. Better to save her for later and let Andy stew in that nut hatch while he focused on what was really important, killing the last rat bastard responsible for the mess he found himself in. He leaned back against the brick wall of the alley as he stared through the gap between the metal trash cans out at the parking lot, savoring the memory of Eddie's last moments, how he had enjoyed taunting the traitorous prick. The look of shock and terror on his face had been priceless. He hoped that Mighty Dambala was playing a funeral dirge on Eddie's exposed nerve fibers in that void between the stars. He wished that he could hear the screams. Still, there was so much more to life than good memories, and he couldn't wait until he got his hands on that pig detective. He was going to make Mike Norris eat his own entrails. A car appeared on the street. It slowed, turned into the parking area, its headlights splashing over Chucky's hiding place. Chucky wasn't concerned. Hiding was easy, despite his brightly colored clothing and hair. Perks of being so small, he thought. The car came to a stop near the corner of the police station, and Mike Norris stepped out into the orange glow of the streetlights. I got your ass now, you son of a bitch. Mike shut the car door and strolled up the steps, exchanging a few words in passing with the two smokers before vanishing inside. 
The two men put their smokes out on the stair railing and followed him a moment later. It was time. Chucky broke from cover and sprinted across the asphalt, a blue and red streak. He was still amazed at how easy all of this was. Hell, he seemed to be moving even better than he did the day before. His movements more fluid, his artificial body less rigid and far more responsive. He felt like he could run forever. He reached the car, tried the handle, and found it unlocked. Tiss, 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 Mikey, he said as he climbed inside and shut the door. You should know better than to leave your car unlocked in the big city. You never know when some maniac might come a-prowling. <laughs> he crawled over the seats into the back, cackling madly. The car was clean as a whistle, and there was nothing to hide under. Chucky shrugged and pulled a large butcher knife from inside his overalls. He thought it would be fine. The interior of the car was dark, and in Chucky's experience, the average person never bothered to glance into the back seat before getting into their vehicle anyway. He sat in the floorboard behind the driver's seat to bide his time, excitement coursing through him. Funny, it was almost like he had real blood pumping through his veins. Oh, how he loved the anticipation before the kill, the dance of death that would end on the cutting edge of his blade. Detective Lieutenant Mike Norris was about to have the worst night of his life. Mike strode into his dark office and went to the rusty filing cabinet without bothering to turn on the light, incredulous that he was entering Karen Barkley's madness. He knew what he should do. He should turn around, get into his car, and drive straight home. He'd pour himself a nice glass of bourbon, put a jazz record on his old turntable, and settle into the couch where he'd busy himself with forgetting the whole sorry mess. Sure, he thought, as he slid the file drawer open and fished out the file marked Charles Lee Ray. What is it about her? She's gotten under your skin like a splinter so deep you can't dig it out. Maybe, but wasn't there more to it? There was the cloud to consider. Perhaps there was more to the world than fit in his small view of it. Maybe, or maybe it was Karen Barclay's eyes. He found himself seeing them printed on the inside of his own each time he closed his eyes, no matter how much he tried to convince himself that it was a very bad idea. Right. He muttered to the empty office as he shut the drawer. It's a horrible idea. But I do wonder what it would feel like to see her smile. It would feel incredible, you damn fool. You still shouldn't go there. Mike walked out of his office and down the hall towards the police station's entrance his heart hammering in his chest. This was all new ground for him. Normally, he was so sure of his path. He was a decisive, take-charge kind of guy. And the fact that he was floundering made him feel like an iron band was wrapped tightly around his broad chest. He passed through the front doors and down the steps, shivering in the blast of frigid air that chapped his face. He crossed to the parking area and climbed behind the wheel of his car tossing the case file on the seat beside him and starting the car. Music filled the cabin and he found that it could reach his heart now, calming his frayed nerves. He shifted the car into drive and pulled out of the parking lot into the street. His stomach rumbled and he realized he'd skipped dinner with all the evening's excitement. He passed a Chinese restaurant, considered stopping, and decided he could do without the heartburn. I wonder if Karen would like to go get some Chinese with me sometime, after all this blows over. Thelonious Monk gave way to Duke Ellington, and Mike found himself snapping his fingers to the beat. There was just something about jazz that spoke to his soul. He fished a cigarette from the pack in his jacket, and pushed the car cigarette lighter into its slot to heat the coil. Something shifted behind him, and suddenly Mike found himself struggling with the set of jumper cables that had been wrapped around his neck. Surprise, asshole! Chucky crowed as he dug his feet into the back of Mike's seat and pulled on the cables with all of his strength. Mike glanced into the rearview mirror above the dash, saw bright red hair, plastic freckled cheeks, and the brightest blue eyes. 
Jesus Christ, Karen was telling the truth. The little bastard's alive. <laughs> Mike let the unlit cigarette fall to the floorboard, and he reached behind him with the hand not clutching the will, trying to grab his demonically cackling harrier. Chucky pulled harder and the car veered onto the sidewalk, sending trash cans flying through the air. Mike guided the wheel back to the street with one hand and gripped the cable with the other. There was no give. His lungs were on fire. He couldn't breathe. Isn't this fun, Mikey? Chucky howled. Bet you wish you hadn't fucked with me now. <laughs> Black stars were exploding at the corners of Mike's vision, threatening to eclipse the world. He had ten seconds, maybe less, before the dark took him. He flailed out with his hands, seeking anything he could use. He felt a round knob against his fingertips. It was the lighter. He yanked it free from the dashboard and jammed it backwards. He felt it strike something hard, heard a sizzle, and the doll scream. Chucky dropped out of sight, releasing the cables. Mike yanked them free and took in a ragged breath. The stars receded as his oxygen-starved brain came back to life. I've got to pull over before he finds something else to strangle me with. I, I can't fight him like this. He gripped the wheel, put his foot on the brake pedal, and then yelled as agony flared in his lower back. He leaned away from the seat, looked back to see the business end of a butcher knife sticking out, its tip crimson with his blood. Oh, shit! The blade plunged again and again, missing him by millimeters. It withdrew from the seat back, and a second later it emerged from the seat a half an inch from Mike's crotch. Mike jumped up, pushing against the back of the seat, his feet on the dashboard, desperately holding himself just out of reach of the knife. The blade jabbed up over and over again, seeking his buttocks and thighs. Mike reached down, trying to grab Chucky or the knife, the road completely forgotten. A flower of pain bloomed across his palm as Chucky slashed him, drawing blood. Mike pulled his hand back just as Chucky's upper body emerged from beneath the seat. Let's go for a ride, Mikey. <laughs> The doll slammed his hand down on the gas pedal, sending the vehicle charging forward into the side of a car parked along the curb. Mike's car careened off in a shower of sparks, took out a mailbox, and screamed on. Mike slammed his foot down on the brake pedal, fighting with Chucky, but it was no good. Chucky was far stronger than he should be and easily pushed Mike's foot away. The car mounted the curb and Mike looked up in time to see the corner of a building looming large. He opened his mouth to shout, and the car's hood slammed the building, sending the vehicle careening to the side in a shower of mortar and falling bricks. The slide turned into a roll, and suddenly Mike's world flipped upside down. He hit the door, the roof, the seat. The first thing he was aware of was the steady ticking of the car's stalled engine as it began to cool, and the tires spinning on and on as if they would never stop as if they had become impromptu perpetual motion machines. The next was agony in his back and head. He opened his eyes and saw that the car had come to rest on its roof, with him staring up at the shredded car seat. He groaned, turned his head, and saw the murderous visage of the good guy doll holding the butcher knife over his head. Hiya, Mikey! Chucky cried gleefully, lunging forward, intent on burying the eight-inch knife in Mike's face. Mike jerked his head to the side at the last instant, felt the blade carve a shallow gash above his ear before it was embedded in the car's frame. Mike reacted instantly, trying to grab Chucky, but the doll was far too fast. Hidey ho, motherfucker! <laughs> Chucky crooned as he skittered through the broken passenger side window, out, and vanished out into the shadows. Bet you can't catch me! Footsteps all around, Mike reached inside his jacket and drew his revolver from its holster. He glanced back and forth, trying to see every direction at once. That won't do you any good, Mikey, laughed Chucky. You can't hurt me! <laughs> The bastard's voice came from the right. Mike twisted and snapped off two quick shots. 
missing the blue and red blur by feet. Chucky laughed again from somewhere out in the dark. <laughs> What's wrong? Your hands shaking? The footsteps grew silent. Mike waited, his muscles tensed to spring at the slightest noise from the demonic doll. The game must be coming to an end if Chucky was tired of taunting him. He had to be ready. Hiya, Mikey! Oh God, he's right behind me! Mike rolled away, lifted the gun. Chucky yanked the knife from the frame and flitted out of sight before he could pull the trigger. Mike heard running footsteps and then the nightmare sound of metal on metal as Chucky scraped the knife along the side of the car. Freddy Krueger eat your heart out, Mike thought. Screaming to his left, Mike turned the gun, saw Chucky charging towards him with the knife, and pulled the trigger. <laughs> this time, the bullet struck home, hitting Chucky in the left shoulder and sending him flying like the rag doll he almost was. The timber of the doll's scream changed, anger and hate giving way to agony. Mike found that he liked this much better. He leaned up, craning to see where the doll had landed, and caught a glimpse of him fleeing along the streets, impossibly fast. He was swallowed by the night in seconds, leaving Mike alone in the ruined hulk of his battered car. Mike watched a moment longer, unsure if this was another trick, and then let his head fall back onto the car's roof. What a night, he muttered, closing his eyes. Chapter 15, Andy at County General The elevator rumbled to a halt with a loud squill of gears in much need of attention, and the doors trundled open to reveal a long corridor painted a hideously institutional shade of baby puke green. Andy hesitated, listening to the muttering hum and babble of the insane. He took a breath and grimaced at the astringent hospital odor of bleach and urine. This was a terrible place. He glanced up at the tall, older man standing beside him, sure that a mistake had been made. He wasn't supposed to be there where little boys and girls howled like animals or stared blankly off into the middle distance where scenes only they could see played out endlessly. Dr. Ardmore smiled down at Andy and put a gentle hand in the center of his back to move him forward. There had been no mistake. This madhouse was to be Andy's new home. Fear and crushing loneliness settled on his little shoulders, threatening to bring him to his knees. He clutched his small suitcase to his chest and stepped out. A huge orderly met them at the door, a clipboard in his hairy, knuckled hands. The man did not even glance down at Andy. He was not a friend. Dr. Ardmore exchanged a few words with the man, and the man nodded, turning to place a key in the elevator panel to the right of the doors. They slid shut with an electric buzz, and a light changed from green to red on the panel. The door was locked tight. There would be no escape that way. Come along, Andy, Ardmore said. A large, fake smile spread across his pale lips. He wanted Andy to see him as a friend, but Andy could see the truth behind the smile and cold clinical eyes. He didn't really care about Andy at all. Where are we going? Andy asked, his voice trembling. I'm going to show you to your room, Ardmore replied. I'll let you get settled in for a bit, and then you and I will have a chat to get to know each other better. Hmm, how's that sound? Like doo-doo, Andy thought, but did not say. He knew what the doctor wanted, so he forced a smile and said that that sounded good to him. Excellent, Ardmore said, prodding Andy deeper into the corridor. Andy walked in silence beside the man staring wide-eyed at the kids in their white gowns and shorts. They ranged from younger than Andy himself all the way to teenagers. Each face wore the same slightly confused expression as if the world around them were just out of reach and they didn't know how to touch it. They passed an open door on the left side of the hall and Andy looked in. 
It was a rec room of sorts. More kids sat listlessly around the room, staring off into the void or at white static on the TV screen. One blonde girl sat muttering to herself at a table in front of an unfinished puzzle. Suddenly, she frowned and leaned forward, hanging her forehead down on the tabletop, sending puzzle pieces flying. Andy and the doctor passed on. They came to another door where a small boy about Andy's age was wrestling with two orderlies who were attempting to stuff him into a straitjacket. Would they do that to him? What was he supposed to do if he had an itch on his nose? Andy thought that having an inch that you couldn't scratch would drive him crazier than the doctor already thought he was. Here we are, Ardmore said as they came abreast of another open door. This is where you'll be staying, Andy. I hope you like it. Of course I won't, Andy thought as he walked through the open door and looked around. The room was smaller than his room at home and painted the same horrible shade of green as the corridor outside. There was a sink and a metal toilet on one wall and a single bed and desk on the opposite wall. Andy crossed the room to the sole window and peered out between the bars on an external stairwell that wound up the corner of the hospital. Another building beyond rose up beyond that, forming a small square between. A gray morning sky hung over it all, melancholy as the little boy's mood. Nice, isn't it? Ardmore asked as he stepped into the room behind Andy. Of course, I'm sure it will be even better once your mother brings you some of your own things from home. Andy shrugged and walked towards the bed where he froze when he saw a familiar tuft of red hair sticking up from the floor between the bed frame and the desk. The doctor had been waiting for this reaction and asked Andy what was wrong. Andy pointed silently at the good guy doll seated on the floor. Ardmore walked over and picked the doll up in one hand. Yes, that's right. It's Chucky. But see, he's only a doll. Ardmore flung his arm out, throwing the doll against the concrete wall. It struck hard and bounced off, coming to rest on the doctor's feet. Ardmore bent to pick it up and then showed it to Andy. Did you see that? Do you think Chucky would have let me do that to him if he were alive? Andy shook his head. That's not Chucky. Ardmore frowned. Of course it is. Look at him. He just looks like Chucky. Ardmore stared at Andy for a moment and then shrugged. All right, you win. That isn't Chucky. But Chucky is a doll just like this one. Chucky is dead just like this one. No, he isn't. Andy said, shaking his head. Chucky's alive and he's going to come here and get me. Ardmore put a comforting hand on Andy's shoulder. Don't be silly, Andy. Chucky isn't coming for you. He can't. He's a doll. Besides, he couldn't get into the building even if he were alive. Andy turned his back on the doctor and the doll and walked back over to the window. He'll find a way. I know him. He'll find a way to come here and try to kill me. You don't have to worry about that, Ardmore said. I'm here and I'll protect you. I promise. Now why don't you try to get some rest, huh? You had a very long night and I know you didn't sleep much. Ardmore didn't wait for a reply. Andy listened to his footsteps recede as he left the room with the doll and shut the door behind him. Andy heard the sharp clack as the doctor locked the door behind him. You won't be able to stop him, Andy said to the now empty room. No one will. He's going to come here to kill me. Andy gripped the cold metal bars as tears began to fall. He wanted his mommy and the nice policeman that had kept him company after Aunt Maggie fell out the window. The policeman could save him from Chucky. Then mommy could take him away from the hospital and they could be happy again. If only they were there. If only. Chapter 16. Pieces Fall Into Place The dimly lit corridor was 
redolent with the stench of mildew mold and the fetid odor of the sweaty fat man walking beside her. The tag on his shirt said his name was Edward, the building superintendent. Looking around at the graffiti-covered walls and mounds of trash heaped high against the passage walls, Karen couldn't help but think that he wasn't very good at his job. <clears throat> Here we are, Ed said as they came abreast of an intricately defaced door. Strange runic symbols had been carved into every inch. I can't say that I'm uh, sad to see this creepy bastard in the ground. Uh, sure, the clientele here leave much to be desired, what with all the druggies and whores, but this guy was a step above the rest. You know, I remember this one time. Sir, interrupted Karen, shoving a $20 bill into the man's moist paw. I don't mean to be rude, but this is really important, and I don't have time to talk right now. Big Ed put the money in one pocket with a self-deprecating grin and unlocked the door without another word. He was used to dealing with people who expected him to mind his own business while they tended to their own. The job didn't pay enough for him to care. Thanks, Karen said as she walked inside Charles Lee Ray's apartment and shut the door behind her. Her first thought was that Chucky wasn't great at cleaning up after himself. Her second was that she was glad she was up to date on her tetanus shot. Beady eyes stared at her from the kitchen counters and stovetop. She heard rats' small squeaks and the rustle of their fat tails dragging across dirty dishes. More eyes stared from the corners of the adjoining living room, watched from beneath the torn sofa and smashed television. Karen shivered. This was a dark place where bad things had been done. She felt the stain on the air like a physical presence. Better get a move on before the locals decide to take a bite out of you, she thought. There was a door to her left. She crossed the living room and tried it. The knob turned, but the door would only move an inch before it caught on the floor. Determined to not be balked now, she shoved with all of her strength and the door gave way before her, nearly spilling her to the grimy floor on the other side. She straightened up and looked around with a gasp her slender hand going to her mouth. This must have been Chucky's bedroom. A soiled queen-size mattress lay on the floor in the middle of the room, surrounded by a tableau of images that told the story of Charles Lee Ray. The first wall showed a well-dressed white man with long brown hair and wild, crazy eyes, kneeling before a black man dressed in an elaborate Haitian costume. The black man had a very distinctive face and kind eyes. She looked to the next wall where a second mural showed the white man, now completely nude, holding his left arm out. He held a knife in his right and was using it to make seven cuts across his forearm. Blood dripped from the wounds down onto a simplistic wooden effigy. The third image in the series was on the wall to her right. She looked and recoiled at what she saw. The naked white man was once again kneeling, now with the wooden effigy hanging from a leather strap around his neck. A huge being seemed to be coming from a dark, lightning-filled cloud. It towered over the man, its lower half that of a man, its upper half that of a hideous snake. Its forked tongue hung out over the man, and thick venom dripped down on him in a vile baptism. She turned a final time to take in the last wall and saw the white man laying dead at the feet of another man who now wore the effigy. Karen looked closer and saw that this new man had the same wild eyes and demented grin as the dead man. She glanced up and read the words that Charles Lee Ray had painted over the figures, finally understanding what it all meant. Oh, thank you, mighty Dambala, for life after death. This is how he did it. This is how Chucky got into the doll. She stared around at the room in horror, new gulfs of terrible possibility opening before her, and a flyer resting on the end of the mattress caught her attention. She walked over on unsteady legs and lifted the paper by the corner, disgusted by the merest touch of anything in the apartment. A black man in ceremonial garb stared back at her from the picture. The words Dr. Death emblazoned across the top in white letters. She looked to the bottom and read, John Elsop Bishop. 
Papaloiza Voodoo. Your wish is his command. There was an address below this in smaller font. Karen glanced from the flyer to the mural and nodded. The man in the flyer and the shaman on the wall were undoubtedly one and the same. Karen. She shrieked and spun around, hands raised to defend herself, and then relaxed when she realized that it was Mike standing in the doorway. What are you doing here? He stepped closer to her, looking around at the room in disgust. After I talked to you last night, I decided to go to the station and get Ray's file. I learned a few things. His nickname was Chucky, and he spent a lot of time in the company of the man in the mural. He reached into his jackets and produced a black and white mugshot of a middle-aged black man. Karen compared the mugshot to the flyer and the mural. It was the same man. She looked up into Mike's eyes, curious. What is this? You're acting like you believe me now? Why the change of heart? Mike held his bandaged hand out for her to see. I met Chucky last night. He'd hidden in my car and tried to kill me. I shot him and he got up and ran away like it was nothing. Something huge bloomed in Karen's chest. She wasn't alone anymore. She reached out and gripped Mike's lapels, pulling him closer. This is great! He stared into her eyes, smelled peppermint on her breath, and smirked. An evil doll trying to carve me up like a Thanksgiving turkey is great. I know I didn't seem like I was on your side to begin with, but don't you think that's a little excessive? It's great because we can prove Andy is telling the truth. We can get him out of the hospital. Mike grimaced, shaking his head. No dice. People won't believe me anymore, they believe Andy. Hell, they'll probably pack both of us off to the hospital in straitjackets. I'm sorry, but we're on our own here. Karen's face fell and she pulled away. He grieved the loss of her proximity, her warmth, especially that oppressive place. She looked down at the flyer, still clutched in her hands, and came back to life. She held it up and pointed to the address printed at the bottom, and then to the mural where Charles Lee Ray knelt before the benevolent-looking man. Maybe we aren't on our own after all. I think he might believe us. Mike looked up, considered, and then nodded. It's worth a shot. Come on. I want you to follow me back to your apartment. I'll leave your car there and you can ride with me. Karen frowned at him. Why? Mike shrugged. Glad for the shadows in the room that hid his sudden blush. Well, I'd just feel better if you were nearby. That way I could make sure you were alright. Besides, it's kind of exhausting tracking you down all over the city. Karen smiled, charmed by his stumbling response. Did he really want her close by? Sure, she said. Let's go. Chapter 17, Dr. Death The servitors gathered on the steps leading up to the Papaloi's home, singing and dancing to encourage the Iwa to come among them for one of the spirits were sorely needed that morning. They could hear the child coughing and crying even over their songs. He was not a month old yet, born to desperately poor parents who could not afford Western medicine and did not trust in it regardless. They were in need, and the servitors knew that the Papaloi would provide. Inside, the Papaloi's voice rang out over the child's coughing and his young parents' soft sobs. Dr. Death, born John Elsop Bishop, hovered over the child, speaking words of power. He was dressed in the traditional garb and headdress of the Onguan, and he held in a son a ritual rattle used in ceremonies close to the child's chest. The light seemed to dim as his voice rose in volume, and his resuscitation grew faster. The syllables coming in rapid fire, staccato burst. The parents felt a breeze ruffle their hair despite the closed windows and doors. Something had come among them. The Papaloi's chant reached its crescendo, and then he subsided, seemed to shrink back into himself to become less than he had been the second before. He sighed, looking down on the now quiet child, with a fatherly smile on his dark face. It is finished, he said, placing the son into the mother's hands. Take this with you and make sure to keep it with him at night. Do this and he will not cough any more. 
Fresh tears rolled down the woman's tired face as she stared up at him. She was like all the others gathered outside and that lived in the small community that had been swallowed by the larger world outside the neighborhood. They all needed something and expected him to provide. Sure, this time was a pleasure. John had always had a soft spot when it came to children. But he had his own needs too and his energy was not limitless. He found there were times he had to bite his tongue to keep from shouting in the selfish servitors' faces when they came begging for a boon. Some wanted more money but didn't want to change their habits or get a job. Others wanted their receding hair to come back or their wrinkles to vanish. Some even asked to be magically more attractive to the opposite sex, though they were loath to stop overeating. It all came down to the same thing for most of them. Feed me. Thank you, doctor, the little mother said as she held her sleeping baby boy to her chest. Thank you so much. You are very welcome, John replied as the father shoved a few wadded up dollar bills into his hand. John could tell from the feel that it was far less than he would normally ask for his services, but he kept quiet and watched the family until they stepped out his front door into the waiting crowd outside. A cheer rose up a moment later, and then silence returned as the servitors moved on about their day, content that they had played a part of the healing with their dance and songs. John turned from the door and walked deeper into his home, away from the public area where he did his work. He stepped into his kitchen, removing his headdress and ceremonial costume. He hung each on a coat rack in the corner and deposited the money in a jar on top of the refrigerator. The smell of brewing tea filled his nostrils and he smiled. There was nothing better in the world than relaxing with a good book and a hot cup of mint tea. Perhaps he would crack open the new Tom Clancy novel he'd bought at the bookstore down the street last weekend. The Cardinal of the Kremlin. What an interesting title. Hello, John. John nearly dropped his teacup, spinning towards the horribly familiar voice that suddenly filled the room. He didn't see his visitor until Chucky jumped up on the counter and performed a twirl as if he were the first ballet dancer to ascend from the depths of hell. Hi, Chucky said, finishing his little pierrot with a bow. What do you think? Did the gree grease work? John felt a deep cold in the pit of his soul as the teacup slipped from his numb fingers to shatter into so many porcelain splinters on the kitchen floor. This was wrong. This was perverse. Of course, Chucky continued. I wasn't close to another human being when I was dying, so I had to use the next best body available. Freaky, huh? John nodded once, unable to speak yet, unable to tear his eyes away from the creature capering before him. You know, when I came here to learn all that stuff, about how to beat death. I thought maybe you were pulling my chain, Chucky said, shaking one stubby plastic finger in the air. But not now. No, sir, not now. There's only one problem. John cleared his throat and finally found his voice. What? This, Chucky replied, pointing to a small tear in his rainbow-colored shirt that was stained with crimson. I didn't think anything could hurt me. After all, I'm in a doll's body, right? But last night I got shot. You know something? It hurt. It hurt like a son of a bitch. It even bled. Now why is that, John? You wouldn't think something like that would happen, would you? John felt his head swimming, began to fear he might pass out. That would be very bad. Who knew what Chucky would do to him if he were to faint on him right now? John grimaced and bit down on his tongue. He tasted the coppery taste of his own blood, but was pleased to see the world coming back into sharper focus. It is because you are turning human, John replied. The more time you spend in that body, the more human you'll become. Lungs, heart, blood vessels, even human skin. 
Flint sparked in Chucky's eyes, and his face contorted into shapes the doll's face was never meant to make. John thought he'd never seen a more hideous sight. No fucking way, spat Chucky. You got me into this mess. Now you're gonna get me out. John shook his head, a steely resolution solidifying in his heart. I can't do that, Chucky. Chucky frowned at his former teacher, the promise of imminent violence thick around him. And why not? Because you are an abomination, John shouted, loathing and rage washing over his fear like a whelming wave. You are an outrage against nature. You have perverted everything I have taught you and used it for evil. You have to be stopped. The phone was nearby. John stepped towards it and then froze when Chucky pulled a small effigy made of straw and wood from behind his back. The small figure's rudimentary face bore more than a passing resemblance to John. You know, said Chucky as he waved the figure at John. I thought something like this might happen. That's why I prepared for it. Recognize this? It's your own personal mojo, Doc. Made out of your hair, your clothes, even bathed in a little of your blood. Rage receded, overcome by stark terror the likes of which John Bishop had never felt before. His life was now quite literally in the hands of a madman. He took a step towards Chucky. His hand held out. Give me that. Sure. How do you want it? Broken leg? <laughs> Chucky grabbed the effigy's fragile right leg and snapped it in half. John felt an explosion of agony as his leg bent in half above the knee. Felt the jagged bones rupture out of his skin. He screamed and collapsed to the floor. The world was pain, so much, too much for him to bear. He reached out his hand again, pleading for mercy from the merciless. Chucky jumped down from the counter and approached John, shaking his head in mock sadness that did not reach his gleeful eyes. You shouldn't tell your customers where you hide shit like this, John. It'll get you into trouble every time. Now, how do I get out of this body? No, John groaned. I won't tell you. Oh, really? Chucky asked, grabbing the effigy's left arm and bending it backwards. There was a horrendous crack, and John's arm bent backwards above the elbow. John's screams echoed off the ceiling and floors, redoubled in the man's ears. Chucky waited for the clamor to die down, a huge grin on his freckled face. You know, there are so many more bones in the human body, John. Do you want me to break more? No, John shouted. No more. Then tell me what to do. Please don't make me. That's it. Chucky spat, reaching into his overalls and withdrawing an ornate knife decorated with red and silver filigree running along the sharp blade. He held the blade over the effigy. My fucking patience has run out. Tell me what I want to know or die, John. It's your choice. John looked up at his diminutive tormentor and found that he had reached the limits of his nobility. He bowed his head in shame and began to speak. Okay, I tell you, you have to transfer your soul out of the doll into the body of the first person you revealed your true self to. Chucky lowered the knife laughing. <laughs> okay, you mean the first person I let in on the fact I was really alive? I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. <laughs> the first person I let in on my little secret was a six-year-old kid. I'm going to be six years old again. A child, John thought. Oh, what have I done? 
Chucky leaned down near where the broken man lay, smiling at his handiwork. Well, it's been fun, but I gotta go. I have a date with a six-year-old boy, and you have a date with death. The knife rose high over the effigy, a guillotine ready to fall with head-chopping razor teeth. John tried to grab the mojo from Chucky, but he was far too slow. The blade descended, catching the glow of the light overhead, and pierced the effigy's chest. Ribs and flesh were cleaved in two, sending a large gout of blood spraying from the wound. Drops hit the light bulb and sizzled on the hot glass. So long, John, Chucky said as he turned from the dying man and tossed the mojo onto the floor beside him. John watched him climb onto the counter and then duck out the open window above the sink before laying his head back on the cold floor and closing his eyes. Mike turned the corner, wheels squilling as he accelerated onto the straight street. Old red brick apartment buildings and wood frame houses with peeling paint and sagging steps lined the road on either side. Karen saw curious faces staring at them from porches and doorways. Which one is Dr. Death's? Karen asked. That one on the left. He replied, pulling to a skidding stop in front of a weathered single-story house and shutting the car's ignition off. They ran from the vehicle and up the steps. Karen felt her heart pounding in her chest, felt fear. Something was wrong. Was it Andy? Had Chucky already managed to reach him? They came to John Bishop's door and paused, taking in the lit candles and gifts left on the porch by those desperate for his favor. Mike lifted his hand to knock and froze when he heard a faint moaning from the other side of the closed door. He gripped the knob and found it unlocked. Hello? He called as he pushed the door open. Is anyone home? I'm in here. Karen rushed past Mike, deeper into the house, pushed open a door and found John laying in a growing pool of his own blood. Oh my God! She gasped in shock at the sight of the man. His limbs were twisted into unnatural shapes, his body covered in crimson. She went to her knees beside him, taking a hand towel from the stove and pressing it against the gaping wound in his chest. She felt ribs shift beneath her hands, heard a wet sucking noise each time the man drew a ragged breath, saw blood bubbles forming at the edge of the wound. His lung is shredded, she thought. What did Chucky hit him with, a fire axe? John opened his eyes and followed Mike with them as he crossed the room to the phone and called for an ambulance. John looked back to Karen and shook his head slowly. It's too late. Must save the boy. Chucky is headed there now. He must get his soul inside of the boy, just like he got it into the doll. What do you mean? Karen asked. He must transfer his soul from the doll or soon he will become trapped in that body. You must stop him before he can finish the chance. Kill him before he can say it. How? Nothing stops him. John lifted his good hand and touched Karen with one finger in the center of her sternum, leaving a single bloody fingerprint. The heart. His heart is almost human. It's the only way through the heart. He took a final breath, his eyes glazing over, staring into the middle space somewhere beyond Karen and all the pain. His hand fell away from her to land by his side. The paramedics are on their way. Mike said as he joined her at John's side. Karen reached out and gently closed the dead man's eyes. They're gonna be too late. Damn. Mike muttered, helping her to her feet. What now? Karen walked to the sink and washed the blood from her hands and then took Mike by the elbow, pulling him towards the door. We're going to the hospital. Chucky is going after Andy. What? Why the hell would he do that? 
I'll explain it to you on the way. Chapter 18, Andy's Visitor Andy ran down shadowed stone corridors, his sneakered feet splashing through vile puddles of filthy water that seeped from the moss-covered walls and dripped from the unseen ceiling that was lost in the darkness above. The only sounds were those of his labored breathing and the slap of his feet as he ran, and yet he knew he wasn't alone in that strange place. Something followed him through the midnight black tunnels, it watched him with alien eyes and unspeakable hunger. He could feel its mind touching his, could feel its hunger and desire to destroy him utterly. Whatever it was, it hated anything that belonged to the light. Innocent Andy was chief among its targets. He turned a corner and felt a rush of fetid air strike his sweaty face, smelled the decay of centuries and a bestial odor unlike anything he had ever encountered before. There was dim light ahead. Andy redoubled his speed, desperate to escape the tunnel and the monster that lived there. He came to an opening and stumbled to a stop, staring. The space was an, an immense circle surrounded by towering walls. There were openings all the way around, more tunnels like the one Andy fled through. It's like a maze, he thought, and I found the middle. This is bad. This is where it lives. A large, raised dais dominated the center of the space, its stone surface made of rock so black they seemed to swallow the dim light that filtered down from the starless sky overhead. Andy felt his feet begin to move of their own accord and tried to resist the pull. He did not want to go near the platform, found he feared it more than the unseen thing that had chased him this far. It wanted me to come here, this is where it eats! Maybe so, but that didn't matter. Andy couldn't stop himself from walking forward any more than he could stop the sun from rising. Details came into focus as he drew closer. He saw pictures carved into the stone that told a story of pain and terror. Every panel a new breed of violence. He reached the steps, started up, and felt his heart begin to shriek at what he saw. His mother and Mike lay on a large altar, their clothes removed and their abdomen slid open from pelvis to sternum. Wet coils of intestine were splayed out around them, and there was so much blood, yet their eyes were open and hatefully aware. They screamed and screamed. Chucky stood over them, a butcher's knife clutched in his plastic gory hands. Andy, do you like what I've done with the place? <laughs> <laughs> Chucky asked, cackling madly. Andy shook his head back and forth, telling himself that it was just a dream, only a bad dream. Then something moved above Chucky, and Andy looked up at a huge statue that loomed over the screaming adults and laughing doll. It was part human, part snake, and completely awful. The statue's eyes glowed crimson. A cloud roiled over above it all, dark and ominous. It moved strangely, not as if moved by the wind, but by something vile that slithered and crawled within. Lightning flashed down, striking the statue, making it glow bright as day. A voice spoke then, deep as the heart of a mountain, crackling with menace and desire. Boy! It growled. Andy felt his mind wanting to tear away from its moorings, wanting to run from the terror before it had him screaming into insanity. Andy closed his eyes, shouting no over and over again.
Andy fell from the bed in a tangle of blanket and hit the tile floor on his side. He sat up and looked around, his heart hammering in his little chest. He wasn't home, but the hospital was still better than the place he'd seen in his nightmare. He got to his feet, rubbing his sore shoulder, and looked to the locked room door. Would Chucky come at him from there? Would he be able to sneak past the watchful orderlies to bring painful piercing death? A strange scraping sound drifted to him through the open window. Andy turned that direction, a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. It wasn't possible. Andy's room was on the fourth floor of the hospital. Chucky couldn't possibly climb the side of the building, could he? Andy imagined the evil good guy doll scaling the sheer surface of the hospital like some demented spider and shuddered. The noise came again, so like the sound Andy's sneakers made when he slid to a stop on wet sidewalks on the playground at his school. He crossed the small room with trepidation and stuck his head between the metal security bars to look down. Chucky was there not crawling creepily up the wall like a spider, but shimmying up a drain pipe bolted to the side of the building, a foot from the small ledge outside the window. Chucky saw Andy peering down at him and smiled with wicked mirth. Hiya, Andy, he called out. Hold on a second. I'll be right there. <laughs> A pit seemed to open in the floor beneath Andy's feet, threatening to swallow him whole. He looked around the room in terror. There was nowhere to run and nowhere to hide from the demon drawing inexorably nearer every second. He had to get help before it was too late. He ran and grabbed a chair from the desk and dragged it in front of the locked door. He clambered up and stared wide-eyed out into the corridor through the postcard-sized window in the top of the door. Help me! He cried, his voice shrill with panic. He's coming to kill me! He was answered by a chorus of raised voices from the rooms around him, each echoing his pleas. Help me! He's coming to kill me too! He's almost here! He's in the room with me! Laughter followed, filling the corridor with hyena giggles. An orderly walked by and didn't even acknowledge the clamor. He was a veteran of the children's wing and had heard this and many other outbursts over the years. Every kid had their nightmare in that place and it wasn't his job to comfort or counsel. He left that to the doctors. Andy jumped down from the chair and sprinted over to the window. He looked down and screamed, Chucky was only five feet away. Hold on, Andy. <laughs> Just you hold on. What do I do now? Andy thought. His eyes fell on the little desk by the bed, and a light bulb went off in his head. He crossed to the desk and dragged it across the room, upending it in front of the window. It wasn't quite tall enough to cover the whole opening, but it would have to do. Andy grabbed the chair and pushed it against the desk for a little extra weight, and then he sat against the barrier. A second later, he heard tiny footsteps on the ledge outside and felt pressure from the other side as Chucky tried to force his way in. Do you think a table will stop me, boy? No way! No fucking way! More pressure, and then Chucky's arm slipped through the side of the window and flailed around, seeking Andy in vain. Finally, Chucky gave another curse and withdrew his arm. You're gonna be smart about it, are ya? Chucky said, kicking the desk. Well, not smart enough. You're mine, you little shit. Andy heard the squeak of Chucky's shoes as he walked along the ledge towards another window. He was going to find another way in. Andy leapt for the door and began to scream as loud as he could. A moment later, a familiar pair of eyes appeared at the viewport. He's here, Dr. Ardmore! Andy shouted, jumping up and down, his body telling him he must run even though there was nowhere to go. Chucky's here! Ardmore surveyed the state of the room behind the little boy, frowning disapprovingly. I don't see anybody. I'm telling you he's here. Chucky's here and he's gonna kill me. 
Ardmore reached through the small window and patted Andy's outstretched hand reassuringly. Don't you worry, son. I'm going to get something and I'll be right back. The man vanished from the door and Andy began to sob. He turned his back to the door and slid slowly down to sit on the floor, his eyes on the barricaded window. Chucky slid between the window bars of the orderly's break room and hopped to the floor as silent and lithe as a tomcat. He glanced down at his aching fingers and saw small cuts, seeping drops of blood, that he got from the drain pipe's jagged edges. The image of an hourglass appeared in his mind, the sand in the top globe almost gone. God damn it, I'm running out of time! A fat orderly sat in a threadbare lounge chair, reading a newspaper, his key ring left forgotten on the table behind him. Chucky crept across and paused a foot behind the oblivious man. How easy it would be to open the slob's throat. That would be a real blast, but there were more important things to take care of. The fun would come later. He took the keys and walked out into the corridor. The coast was mostly clear, save for a small girl dressed in a hospital gown sitting against the hallway wall. She was muttering to herself and rocking back and forth, striking the back of her head against the wall over and over again. Chucky looked around again, heard the heavy tread of an orderly coming near. He couldn't just walk down the hall to the brat's room. He needed help. She will do, he thought walking over to stand in front of her. He waited until she raised her eyes to look at him and then threw her a little wave, playing the part of good guy to the hilt. Hi, my name's Chucky. What's your name? Mona, she whispered. It's so great to meet you, Mona. Tell me, would you like to take me for a walk? The little girl nodded and Chucky jumped into her arms. That's great, listen. I want to go see my old friend Andy. His room is down the hallway. Can you take me there, Mona? Mona nodded again and stood up, starting down the corridor. An orderly noticed her with the doll as she passed and smiled at her. Hi, Mona, he said. Where are you off to? She nodded to the red-headed doll held in her arms, not quite meeting the orderly's gaze. He wants to go for a walk. That's nice, said the orderly, dismissing the crazy little girl as he went about his duties. Mona walked on and came to a stop in front of Andy's room. Chucky reached out from his position against her chest and unlocked the door with one of the stolen keys. Thanks a ton, Mona, he said as he jumped down from her arms and pushed the door open. You really did me a solid. Mona just stared after him in silence as he stepped into the room and closed the door behind him. He scanned the room for his prey and saw a huddled mass hiding beneath the covers on the bed. So you want to play hide and seek, do you? <laughs> he chuckled, tossing the keys to the side and pulling the red and silver ritual knife from his overalls. Andy made no response, but that was fine. Let him keep quiet. He was about to find there was no more time for words, especially after Chucky had finished the ritual and swapped bodies with him. He was sure Andy would have a lot to say when Chucky tossed the doll from the window. Oh, how Andy would scream all the way down until his new doll body was crushed on the asphalt below. Chucky climbed up on the bed and took the blankets in his free hand. He raised the knife, ready to threaten and cut if that's what it took to make the boy compliant. Andy, I've got you now. He yanked the covers back and froze. There was no Andy beneath the sheets, just a bundle of clothes and a pillow. What? Where are you, you little? 
noise from under him, and Chucky turned to see Andy crawl from beneath the bed and sprint through the unlocked door into the corridor with the orderly's key ring in his hands. No! Chucky yelled, jumping down from the bed to pursue the boy. Andy ran faster than he'd ever run before, his steps echoing along the corridor. Wide eyes stared from viewports as he passed, their owners hooting and shouting, lost in their own nightmares. He skidded to a stop beside a door labeled stairs and started trying different keys. The first and second were too big for the keyhole, the third too small. He raised the fourth and paused when someone called his name from down the hall. He glanced up to see Dr. Ardmore standing near the elevator with a hypodermic needle in his hand. Orderly, he shouted. The Barkley boy has escaped his room. Stop him! There was no time left. It would be the fourth key or nothing. He jammed the key forward and was filled with elation when it rammed to the hilt in the lock and turned easily. No, Andy, wait! The doctor was the really crazy person if he thought that Andy was going to stop. Andy ran through the door into the stairwell and fled down. If only he could reach the bottom floor and get away, he could find home from there. He would lock the door and hide from Chucky until Mommy found him. Then he would be safe again. But it wasn't meant to be. Doors slammed open from below and above him. Shouted voices filled the stairwell. They were coming and they would lock him back up in his room. He was as good as dead if they did that. There was a door on the landing beside him. He tried it, found it unlocked, and hurtled through it into a deserted corridor, the twin of the one on the children's ward above. He turned left and ran, hearing faint footsteps behind him. He looked back over his shoulder and thought he caught a glimpse of red hair ducking behind a gurney. He heard the rattle of the stairwell door as the hospital staff reached it and ducked through a door on his right. The room was flooded with darkness, lit only by a single dim security light overhead. He couldn't tell what kind of room this was, but he could make out a gurney in the center. He went to his knees and crawled beneath it, the overhanging sheets hiding him. A moment later, he heard thunderous footsteps as the doctor and orderlies ran by the room and kept moving further down the hall. Andy waited until their noise was gone and then climbed back out from beneath the gurney, moving towards the door. He had to keep going. He had to find a way out of the hospital before Chucky came calling again. Brilliant lights came to life, blinding Andy, and he spun around desperately trying to see. Going somewhere, asked a dreadfully familiar voice from behind him. Andy turned and looked up to a balcony that stretched the length of the room and saw Chucky in all his corrupt glory. The doll threw him a wave and then leapt from the balcony down to the floor. He struck with a soft thump, knocking a tray of surgical instruments over, before rolling away and disappearing. Andy picked up a scalpel from the spilled tools and began to back towards the door to the corridor, glancing around frantically for any sign of movement. Thought you were gonna get away from me, did you? Chucky asked, his voice soft but emphatic. There's no getting away from me, not now, not ever. Andy was almost to the door. Surely Chucky would attack before he reached it. Andy tensed his body ready to fight and screamed when the door opened behind him and a hand clamped down on the back of his neck. Easy, Andy, Dr. Ardmore said as he lifted Andy into his arms and pulled the scalpel out of his little hands. You don't need that anymore. But I do, Andy shouted, trying to break the doctor's grasp as Ardmore carried him to the gurney in the center of the room and set him down. Chucky is in the room. He's trying to kill me. Sure he is, Ardmore patronized. He pulled the hypodermic needle from his pocket and began to roll Andy's sleeve up. Please listen to me. He'll kill you too. Ardmore ignored him. He raised the needle. This will only hurt for a second, 
Then you'll feel much better. No! Suddenly, the doctor's whole body went rigid, and he collapsed to the floor with a shout of pain. Andy looked and saw the scalpel buried in Ardmore's thigh, saw the man's gray slacks turning crimson as the blood ran down his leg. What's up, Doc? Chucky asked as he emerged from his hiding place behind a ventilator. How's it hanging? <laughs> Ardmore stared up at the good guy doll, his mouth agape. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. No, 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 you aren't real. Oh, yes, 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 Chucky said as he stepped forward and slipped a strange apparatus down over the doctor's head. Tell me something, Doc. Is this what you used to make your crazy patients better? They're called shock treatments, right? Ardmore tried to pull the device from his head, and Chucky lashed out with the butt of a heavy bone saw, shattering the man's hand. No, sir, Chucky said, over Ardmore's cries of pain. No touchy. He, he climbed up onto a stool near a machine attached to the headpiece by a forest of wires and began to peruse the buttons and knobs. They used shock treatments on me once, but I don't think they worked. Doc, do you think they'll work on you? Ardmore's eyes grew wide as he realized what Chucky was about to do. He reached up with his unbroken hand to remove the headset, but he was too late. Chucky twisted a dial and electricity began to flow through Ardmore's body. Andy saw the man galvanized and jumped down from the table, charging towards Chucky. Stop it! Chucky saw him coming and picked up a large metal tray from beside the machine and swung it with all of his might. The tray caught Andy squarely in the face and sent him tumbling backwards. Andy hit the floor, dazed. How do you feel there, Doc? Chucky asked turning back to Ardmore, who was still spasming under the current. Are you cured yet? Nah, you're not cured. You need more. <laughs> Chucky grabbed a lever and shoved it all the way up, turning the voltage to the maximum setting. Ardmore arched his back as if he were trying to bend in half. Smoke began to rise from his charring skin. Blood began to seep from his ears, eyes, and nostrils. There were two mushy pops as his eyeballs ruptured, leaking vitreous fluid onto Ardmore's cooking cheeks. Now you're better, Doc. <laughs> Chucky cackled. He was so involved in his sick game that he didn't notice when Andy climbed to his feet and stealthily left the room. Chapter 19, One Step Behind The elevator doors opened onto pandemonium. A wave of sound from the patients struck them like a solid wall, their shouts and laughter filling the air. Mike grimaced and glanced over to where Karen stood, shaking beside him. What must she be feeling at that moment, knowing that her only child was forced to live in a place like that? Would she blame him? She saw him watching her and nodded that she was all right. Mike nodded back and led her past forensic technicians and uniformed police officers to where his partner, Jack Santos, leaned against one wall waiting for them. The detective perked up when he saw them approaching. Hey, Mike, Jack said. Where you been all morning? I've been trying to get a hold of you. I've been busy, Mike said tensely unaccustomed to being questioned by a lower-ranking officer, even if they were friends. What happened here? Jack glanced pointedly at Karen. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. 
He took Mike by the elbow and led him a few feet further down the hallway where they could talk without being overheard. Mike threw an apologetic look back to Karen and saw that she was kneeling down to speak to one of the patients, a pale little girl dressed in a white hospital gown. Mike looked back to Jack waiting. Jack cleared his throat and then whispered, Her kid killed Dr. Ardmore. Mike raised his eyebrows. You've got to be kidding. Jack shook his head. The kid fried the doc to a crisp with an electronic shock therapy machine. Christ, I've never seen a mess like that before. I, I don't think I'll ever eat barbecue again. Mike gripped Jack's shoulder hard, quieting the man and asked, What about the kid? Where is he? Uh, he escaped in the confusion. We've got security footage of him using a set of keys stolen from an orderly to unlock a service entrance downstairs. You know what I think? I bet Mommy Dearest knows where he is. Mommy Dearest? Mike thought, his anger flaring like a stoked flame. He didn't like Jack's tone or his insinuation about Karen and had to bite back a scathing retort. God, she's really gotten to me. What about Chucky? Mike asked. Have you seen him around? Jack furrowed his eyebrows in confusion. Uh, who? The boy's doll. The same one we had at the station house. Have you seen him around? No, uh, of course not. What the hell are you going on about, Mike? What would the doll be doing here? Mike turned away and walked down the hall, ignoring his partner's questions. There was no time to explain and no point. The pragmatic detective would never believe him. He reached Karen just as she was finishing her conversation with the girl. They think Andy killed Dr. Ardmore. He said, taking her hand to help her to her feet. I know, she said, nodding her head in the direction of Mona. This little girl said Chucky was here. He spoke to her. He was looking for Andy. Shit. Mike muttered. He wanted to lash out, to pound the bastard that was responsible for all their trouble into dust. Do you have an idea where Andy might be headed? He'll go home. That's where I've always told him to go when he's in trouble. Does he have a key? Sure, she said. There's a spare key hidden beneath a potted plant that sits in the hall outside the door. Mike cursed again. I bet your home will be the first place Chucky checks for Andy, too. Come on, we haven't got much time. They turned back towards the elevators and jogged down the corridor, ignoring the curious gazes of the officers and technicians who stared as they flew by. Hey, Mike, Jack shouted from behind them. Where are you going? Mike didn't have time to answer. They caught the elevator as the doors were beginning to close, cutting off the detective's raised voice. Karen hit the button for the ground floor as Mike drew his service revolver and opened the cylinder to make sure the gun was fully loaded. Would it be enough to stop Chucky this time? John Bishop said the only way was to shoot Chucky through the heart. Mike prayed that his aim was true and the dead man was right. Chapter 20. The Ugly Doll Comes Home Night had fallen over the windy city and the first stars of the evening were shining in the cloudless sky as Andy sprinted around the corner of the alleyway he had been hiding in and ran for the entrance to the apartment building. There was no one to take notice of him. The streets of the city seemed empty to Andy, in spite of the noise of the traffic a block over. Those people would be no help to him if Chucky jumped out of the shadows with his red knife and wicked smile. Andy had never felt more alone in his young life. He burst through the lobby doors and headed for the stairs, dismissing the slow elevator out of hand. He surged up the steps, taking them two at a time. And he did not slow until he stood panting before his own apartment's door. Quickly, he lifted the potted plant that sat in the corner of the hall and withdrew the spare key his mommy had left there for an emergency just like this. He fumbled the key into the lock with shaking, impatient fingers and stepped inside, locking the door behind him. He turned his back to the door and leaned against it, taking in the dark apartment. His mommy had left the light on in the living room and kitchen. Andy was glad she had. The thought of sneaking around the dark home in complete midnight black terrified him. There would be far too many places for Chucky to hide. He pushed away from the door and walked down the hall 
turning through the archway into the living room, where he proceeded to lock every window. Satisfied, he stepped into the kitchen and made sure that the plywood was secure over the broken window Aunt Maggie had fallen through. It was so, so he walked back into the hall and jogged to his bedroom. He checked the windows there, and then went to his knees in front of the toy chest in his closet. He flung the lid open, hard enough for it to bounce back at him off the wall. He stopped it with his hand and rummaged through the box until he found what he was looking for, his small wooden baseball bat. He felt the weight of the thing in his hands and nodded. Chucky would have his hands full when he came. Andy clutched the bat to his chest and sat down against the toy box to wait for the front door to open. Would it be Chucky come to kill him, like he had Dr. Ardmore? Or would it be his mommy come to save the day? He hoped it turned out to be her. Little Johnny Carpenter crossed the street in front of the apartment building his heart alive with wonder at the miracle clutched in his arms. It really was too bad that Chucky already belonged to another boy, but Chucky had said they could be friends and play together sometime. After all, Johnny lived two buildings down the block from the one that Chucky's best friend lived in. He stopped with the foot on the bottom step, leading up to the door and turned his head to whisper in the good guy's ear. Is this the one? This is it. Thanks a ton, kid. You're a real pal. Johnny giggled and then stopped when he heard footsteps approaching behind him. Hey, Johnny, called Mr. Johnson, waving to him. Mr. Johnson was dressed in a heavy brown coat and fur-lined hat that Johnny knew hid a slickly bald head. His wife, Mrs. Johnson, walked beside him, with their evil Yorkie dog named Fluffy held in her arms. The dog began to growl as they grew nearer, its black eyes locked on the boy. Hello, Mr. Johnson, Johnny said. Shouldn't you be getting home? Your mother's going to worry. I'm about to, Johnny replied. Chucky wants me to drop him off here first. Chucky, huh? Mrs. Johnson said, stopping beside Johnny and leaning closer to get a look at the doll. Isn't he one of those, uh, whatchamacallits, a good boy doll? He's a good guy doll. Fluffy growled deeper in his little chest as a strange scent reached his doggy nose. There was something bad, something that could hurt his person. He lunged forward, nearly jumping out of Mrs. Johnson's arms and snapping his jaws an inch from the doll's red hair. As if in response, the doll twisted its head to the left and seemed to stare at the dog. Wanna play? Chucky said, his voice low and menacing not like the normal voice of the good guy dolls that Mrs. Johnson had seen on commercials. Fluffy cringed back from it, all anger gone from his tiny frame, replaced by a tremor that ran through his whole furry body. The Yorkie yipped and twisted around to bury his snout beneath his mistress's arm. Mr. Johnson didn't seem to notice. He reached out to pat Johnny on the head. Chucky wants to be dropped off, huh? Well, you make sure you do that quick before you catch a cold out here. I will, Johnny said. Good night, Mr. Johnson. Good night, he said, walking on with a perplexed Mrs. Johnson at his side. Had she really heard the doll speak like that? Surely not. Maybe its batteries were just running low. That had to be it, right? Johnny watched until they were out of sight and then bent over to set Chucky down on the sidewalk. Chucky stretched and then pointed down the street. Thanks again, sport. You run on home now. There's some bad people on the streets tonight. <laughs> Chucky laughed crazily and walked up the steps. Johnny watched him go, wondering what was so funny. He shrugged and started for home as Chucky yanked the entrance door open and slipped inside. It was nice to have a new friend.
Chucky felt a strange sensation in his chest as he settled back against the wall of the elevator to wait for it to make its slow ascent to the top floor, where his friends at the end waited for him. It was strange but frighteningly familiar, like a small bird fluttering beneath his plastic skin. Is that a goddamn heartbeat I'm feeling? This can't be happening. I've got to finish this now before I become some freakish midget for the rest of my goddamn life. Hell, dear old mom would just laugh herself to death all over again if she could see me now. Well, fuck her and fuck this. I'm coming for you, Andy boy. I hope you're ready because I'm done playing Mr. Good Guy. A wrinkled, liver-spotted hand reached through the closing elevator door and pulled it open so that an elderly man and his wife could slip inside. Great, thought Chucky. The Jarrett's Hall kids are slowing me down. I hope you both get explosive diarrhea and have a heart attack while shitting your diapers. Look, Glenn, said the old woman, pulling on her henpecked looking husband. Some child left their doll in the elevator. Glenn glanced down with a sigh and saw Chucky, before lifting his head and pulling his arm away from the woman. Just you leave it alone, Brenda. Whoever left it in there will come back to look for it. The elevator doors finally closed and the car began its slow rise. Chucky glanced at the panel and saw that the couple were getting off one floor below his. Perfect, he thought. I was afraid I was going to have to sit here and take another ride in the elevator before I could move. Are you sure? Brenda asked. I'm positive, Glenn responded as the door slid open and they stepped out onto the landing. Brenda paused, looking back down at him with a grimace. What an ugly doll, she remarked as she walked away and the elevator started moving again. Chucky gave her a double barrel middle finger salute. Fuck you. The Barclay apartment was quiet as a tomb, yet it seemed to crackle with the anticipation, as if a large amount of energy was cascading out of control to some apocalyptic final release. Then the soft sound of ash falling like sand from the chimney broke the silence. Chucky appeared a second later, dropping down on top of the fake logs that hid the fireplace gas burners from view. He quickly shook the worst of the black dust from himself and then kicked the fireplace grate into the center of the living room, where it came to rest with a clatter against the coffee table. I'm sure the kid heard that, Chucky thought, as he drew the red and silver knife from inside his clothes and stalked down the hallway towards Andy's closed bedroom door. Well, it doesn't matter if the brat knows I'm coming or not. He isn't getting away from me this time. He reached the door, twisted the handle, and pushed it open. It swung inward easily, surprising him for a moment. He figured the kid would have tried to barricade the door. Maybe he'd given up. That would be easier if not as fun. Chucky much preferred the idea of Andy going to his fate with streaks of terror. Chucky started to step forward and then froze when he heard the subtle creak of a floorboard to his right. Oh, so that's what you're doing, sport. You set an old-fashioned ambush for your old friend to the end. Nice try, asshole. Chucky tensed his legs, took a breath, and leapt through the opening. Andy was there standing beside the door with a small baseball bat in his hands. Andy swung the bat, but he was far too slow, and the ash handle struck the door frame and was jarred free from his hands. Surprise! Chucky shouted as Andy ran from the room and ducked into the kitchen. Chucky started after him and then looked down at the knife in his hand. It really wasn't the best tool for the job at hand. It wouldn't do to carve up his fresh new body right before he took up residence after all. He pocketed the knife and bent to pick up the baseball bat. It was on the small side, but 
he thought it would do the trick just fine. Andy had moved into the living room. Chucky could hear his panicked breathing and the shuffle of his shoes on the thick pile carpet. He stalked forward and glanced through the archway to see Andy facing the kitchen, oblivious to Chucky's presence at the other door. Ready or not, here I come. He sprinted into the room with that bat raised over his head and launched himself from the couch. Batter up, Chucky cried with glee as he brought the bat down on the base of Andy's skull. There was a solid thud, and the boy crumpled to the floor in a heap. Good, Chucky said, tossing the bat away and kneeling down beside Andy's head. He placed one hand on Andy's forehead and the other on the center of Andy's chest. He felt the beat of the boy's heart, the twin of the one that fluttered now in his own chest. Goodbye, good guy. Hello, brand new world. <laughs> he began to chant. Chapter 21 Confrontation Mike slammed on the brakes, bringing the unmarked police car to a halt halfway on the sidewalk in front of Karen's building, and jumped out without taking the time to turn the engine off. Karen joined him near the front stairs leading up to the lobby door, and then ran into him when he suddenly stopped in mid-stride. What is it, Mike? He put a hand to the back of his neck and felt the hair standing on end. He knew this feeling, had felt it before, and had dreamt it almost every night since. Slowly, he tilted his head to look at the once cloudless sky, and felt his bowels turn to liquid. Where there had been stars shining in the firmament, there was now roiling clouds building over the building, their black sides undulating as if they were filled with snakes and maggots. Lightning flashed across the surface of the mass like so many veins full of iridescent blood. It sees me, Mike's mind screamed in abject horror. It remembers me. Karen's hands found his and squeezed hard, drawing him back to her. He shuddered as he ran a hand over his face to wipe away the sudden sheen of cold sweat that had broken out over his skin. It's like that night at the toy store, he said. It's like the night Ray died. It's happening all over again. The import of his words struck home and Karen pulled him forward up the stairs. Come on, he started the chant. They took the stairs, Mike passing her thanks to his longer strides. They reached the top floor, Mike drawing his revolver as he ran. They came to the door and found it locked. A frightfully familiar voice drifted to them from inside the apartment. Chucky beginning to shout the strange, foreboding words. Ah, day, dewey, damn bella, give me the power, I beg of you. Karen bent to retrieve the hidden key from beneath the plant. Mike shouted her down. There was no time. He charged forward and ran the door with his shoulder, shattering the lock and the frame on the first strike. His momentum carried him forward, and he fell down on the floor the gun slipping from his grasp. Karen rushed by him into the living room and saw Chucky staring at her with hate-filled, venomous eyes. She charged forward and yanked the demonic doll from the semi-conscious Andy, lifting him into the air, trying to hold him tight, but it was like trying to hold on to a greased pig. Chucky twisted around in her hands, shouting obscenities. 
He lunged his head down and sank his little teeth into the side of Karen's neck, shaking his head back and forth like a dog. Karen felt blood begin to flow and began to scream. Mike found his feet and rushed in, his gun raised, but dropped it back down into its holster when he saw there was no clear shot. Instead, he ran to Karen and pulled the flailing doll free, tossing it against the wall by the fireplace. Chucky bounced to his feet like a cat and ran for them, pulling his knife from inside his clothes as he came. Mike lashed out with his foot, trying to kick Chucky, but Chucky dodged easily and flicked the knife out to draw a deep slash across Mike's lower leg. Mike fell to his knees, and Chucky stabbed the knife into Mike's shoulder before sprinting out of the room, cackling madly. <laughs> oh, God. Mike moaned as he pulled the ornate blade from his back and dropped it to the carpet before stuffing a handkerchief beneath his shirt to staunch the flow of blood darkening his jacket. Karen was on her knees beside Andy, who was blinking now and looking around in a daze. He saw the bite wound on her neck and was satisfied that it wasn't life-threatening. He lifted his wounded leg and drew a small semi-automatic 25 caliber pistol from an ankle holster and held it out to her. What's this for? Karen asked, taking the gun with two fingers like it was something dirty. I'm gonna find the little bastard. Mike replied. That's how you can protect yourself if I don't get him. Mike, wait a minute, I don't know how to use this. Mike ignored her protests and limped out into the hallway, drawing his service revolver again and sweeping the shadowed passage with it. Nothing moved. He moved along the hall and glanced into the kitchen and found it empty. He looked towards Andy's bedroom and noticed a tiny handprint left in ash on the surface of the door to Karen's room and nodded to himself. I've got you now, Ray, he said. He moved forward and rushed through the door into her room, trying to look everywhere at once. He saw more black ash on the bed skirt and dropped painfully to the floor. He cocked the revolver's hammer back, stilled himself, and lifted the skirt to look under the bed. Running footsteps behind him, Mike set up, saw Chucky charging from the bathroom with a small wooden baseball bat in his hands. Mike tried to lift his hands to block the coming blow, but it was too late. Chucky rammed the end of the bat into Mike's sternum, knocking the breath from him. Mike bent over, gasping for air, and Chucky brought the bat down on the back of Mike's head. The detective crumpled to the carpet, unconscious. That's right, Mikey, Chucky crooned, raising the bat again, intent on finishing Mike off. You should have never messed with me. Leave him alone, you sawed-off ginger midget! Karen shouted as she stepped into the room with her gun raised. The bat started down and she pulled the trigger. The small bullet striking Chucky in the leg and sending him spinning across the room. Take that, you little bastard! She yelled in triumph, aiming the gun at the center of the doll's chest. This was it. The nightmare was about to end. She squeezed the trigger. Nothing. Chucky got to his feet laughing, the bat still in his hands. <laughs> What's wrong, gun jam? Screaming, Chucky ran for her and Karen fled back down the hall into the living room where Andy was sitting in a fog. She had to find something to defend herself with. The knife Chucky used to stab Mike. Where was the knife? She then saw it beside the couch and moved towards it. Not so fast, bitch, Chucky shouted. He raised the bat over his head and threw it, striking Karen in the back of her knees, sending her tumbling face first into the carpet. She groaned in pain and tried to stand and was driven back down as Chucky latched onto her back. She felt his hands reach around her throat, seeking to choke and kill, smelled his feeded breath as he screamed inarticulate hate into her ear. Her gaze fell on the fireplace grate on the ground near her, and a plan came together in her mind. Get off me! She shouted as she grabbed one of his thin wrists and flung him through the air into the open fireplace. He struck the back and nearly bounced back out of it. She had two seconds less. 
She surged to her feet, grabbing the fallen grate and slamming it back in place just as Chucky had risen. If his previous fury could be called a storm, it was nothing in comparison to the hurricane he unleashed now. He pushed against the barrier, kicked it, shook it with his strong hands. It was all Karen could do to hold him in. Oh God, she thought, I don't know how long I can keep this up. Does he even get tired? Please let, please let him be human enough for fatigue. You bitch, Chucky yelled. You're dead. Do you hear me? You're gonna wish you were never born a long time before I get through with you. Karen glanced to the small knob on the side of the hearth, the one that turned on the gas to the fireplace. She planted her right foot to steady herself and kicked out with her left over and over again, finally managing to twist the knob. The faint scent of gas began to waft from the fireplace. She tried to reach above her for the fake bundle of yarn that contained the matches and fumbled them onto the ground out of her reach. What now? I can't reach them without moving. She turned her head, saw Andy watching her with wide eyes. Andy, she called. Help me, get the matches. Andy moved to her side as fast as his little feet could carry him, and he bent to pick up one of the matches. He pushed the red tip of the match against the rough brick mantle, and suddenly Chucky grew quiet. Andy looked down and saw the doll staring up at him with big blue eyes and a big smile. Andy, no! Chucky crooned. We're friends to the end, right? This is the end, friend, he said, striking the match and tossing it into the fireplace. There was a womp as the gas ignited, and then Chucky was engulfed in bright orange flames. No, 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 God, he screamed as the fire reached his hair and turned him into a flailing candle. The heat was too much. Karen grabbed Andy and they backed away, watching as Chucky kicked the grate out and collapsed onto the carpet. Karen had never heard such pain in a person's voice before, though she would hear it every time she closed her eyes to sleep for a long time to come. Chucky rolled over and over, trying to put out the flames that melted and blackened his plastic skin. Finally, his struggles grew slower, and then stopped as the last of the flames flickered and died, leaving behind a smoking husk. Is it over? Did we do it? Mike's raised voice from her bedroom startled her, and she nearly jumped out of her skin. Turning from Chucky, she picked Andy up and the two of them walked into the hallway. They found Mike laying on his back, his pant leg and shirt soaked with blood from the knife wounds and a new trickle of blood from a gash on the back of his head. I heard shouting, he said, trying to sit up. What happened? Where's Chucky? Karen put a hand to his chest and pushed him back down. Don't worry, I took care of him. Now let's take care of you. Andy, run and get me the first aid kit from under the kitchen sink, okay? Andy nodded and walked back out into the hallway and through the archway into the kitchen. He glanced to his right as he went and froze. Chucky wasn't there, just a blackened patch of carpet and scraps of burnt clothing. Mommy, Andy called as he began to back away towards the archway. Chucky is gone. Karen hadn't heard him. She shouted for him to hurry up with the first aid kit. He turned and ran for the hallway, panic driving every thought from his young mind, save that he must get to his mommy and the policeman. They would know what to do. He passed through the arch, twisted to his right, and then felt his feet catch on something. He tumbled to the floor with a grunt and rolled over to see what had tripped him. Fear stole his voice. The creature that stalked towards him seemed freshly born from the pits of hell. Smoke still drifted from the remnants of the good guy overalls that hung from the melted and charred figure. Only one blue eye remained, staring balefully from a socket that had melted around it. Where the other orb had been was a black void as deep as the abyss that stretched endlessly beyond the stars. It came slowly, one step at a time keeping pace with Andy's slow crawl backwards. There was no rush now. It held the red and silver knife 
in what was left of a hand that had melted splinters sticking out of charred plastic fingers. It was invincible, it was immortal, and it would have what it wanted. Hello, Andy, Chucky said, raising the knife over his mostly hairless head. Mommy! Andy cried, scrambling to his feet and running into his mother's room. Karen saw him enter and saw what followed, her heart leaping into her throat. She ran to the door and slammed it, just as Chucky managed to get one arm through. How can he still be so strong after everything we've done to him? Karen thought as she pushed with all of her might against the immense counter pressure. She felt her strained muscles beginning to tremble at the edge of exhaustion. Give me the boy and I'll let you live. Do you hear me? Give me the boy. Karen found a last reserve of energy and pushed as hard as she could against the door. Chucky screamed in rage and felt pain and withdrew his arm from the door. Karen felt it latch shut, looked for a lock, and remembered that the door did not have one. Running footsteps echoed in the bathroom, and Karen felt fresh terror. He was going to come through the open bathroom door. She ran past Mike and Andy and slammed the door shut just as Chucky reached it. He yelled in fury, and then Karen felt the doorknob turning in her hand. She bore down, felt the door shake with a sudden impact, and screamed as the red and silver knife blade erupted through the wood inches from her nose. She jerked back as far as she could and still keep her hold on the knob. The knife withdrew and was rammed through again and again, coming ever nearer to her head. I'm going to die. He's going to stick that knife in my ear in front of my son. The blade flashed again, centimeters from her eye and then the pressure was gone from the door. She heard the footsteps in the hall too fast. There was no time to get to that door, and Mike wasn't up to helping. The door burst open, and the abomination charged in with flailing arms and cutting blade, ready to take her life and then her only child's very soul. Karen grabbed Andy by the hand, and they ran through the bathroom and out into the hallway. She kicked something heavy just outside her bedroom door as they ran and looked down to see Mike's revolver spinning like a top along the floor in front of them. It came to rest by the kitchen archway. She scooped it up and spun around to face their harrier, shielding Andy with her body. For the last time, give me the boy, Chucky said as he stalked towards them. His remaining eyes shone with malevolent hatred. Give him to me, or I'll cut the nose right off your face. Fuck you, Karen said, raising the big thirty-eight revolver and pulling the trigger. <laughs> the bullet flew true, taking him in the shoulder. He twitched but did not fall. He was so close now, he would not be denied. Karen took aim and fired again. The bullet passing just below his chin, sending his whole head rolling backwards down the hall like a macabre bowling ball. The headless thing kept coming. Impossible! Oh, please just lay down and die already! Another squeeze, and the gun bucked in her hand. There was a puff of stuffing as his left leg parted ways with his body. Chucky fell forward and began to crawl the blade of the knife scraping furrows in the hardwood floor of the hallway. Mommy? Andy whispered, his hands claw gripping the back of her blouse with deathly intensity. Why won't he die? Karen didn't take time to answer. She stepped forward to hover over the crawling thing and pointed the smoking gun down. She fired the last two rounds directly into Chucky's chest. The body bucked with each shot. The body bucked with each shot, trembled, and then went limp. Click, click. She pulled the trigger over and over again, seemingly unaware that she had fired the gun empty. She had to keep going, had to make sure. Was the monster gone even now? A noise behind her and Karen spun towards the open apartment door with the gun raised and saw Mike's partner, Jack Santos, standing in the doorway with his hands raised. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, hey! 
Karen lowered the gun, unsure what to say to this man who she knew would never believe her. He opened his mouth to speak and then stopped when Mike's voice rang out from Karen's bedroom, calling her name. Karen, Andy, and Jack ran to see Mike sitting up against the bed, his face pale and covered in sweat. Jack took the scene in and picked up the telephone receiver on the bedside table. He dialed fast and spat out quick orders to the person on the other end of the line. He was kneeling down beside his partner within seconds. An ambulance will be here within ten minutes, he said. Shit, Mike. What the hell happened here? Mike shifted, grimacing in pain. The kid was right. The doll is alive. It almost got the three of us. Jack glanced around between the three of the bedraggled people and laughed without humor. You're shitting me, right? Do I look like I'm shitting you? Mike asked. You don't believe me? Go ahead and take a look. The damn thing is scattered all over the hall, but don't touch it. Don't you touch one part of it. Okay, you got it, Jack replied, standing up and walking out of the room. He sniffed, wrinkling his nose at the smell of burnt cordite and something far fouler that still lingered on the air. He looked around, saw the scattered bits of the scorched toy, and stepped over to the head. Jesus, what did they do to this thing? He bent over and tapped the top of the decapitated head with one finger, and then laughed at himself. Mike really had him going there for a second. He picked up the head and carried it into the room, tossing it up and down like a basketball. He walked over to the small television set Karen had against one wall and set the head on top of it its single eye staring at them all. Okay, Mike, Jack said, patting the head with his hand. I'd like you to look at this thing. There's no way it's alive. Mike put protective hands around Karen and Andy. I thought I told you not to touch it. Come on, Mike, Jack snorted, slapping the head harder. Look, it's dead. The sound of metal grating against metal filled the room, and suddenly the air vent in the wall beside Jack's head flew free, and Chucky's headless torso burst out to wrap its fingers around Jack's windpipe. Kill him! Chucky's head began to shout. Yes! Kill him! Don't let go! Jack felt metal splinters like jagged fingernails seeking to dig their way beneath his skin and tear his throat out. He reached to pull the hand free and spun, sending the body and head flying across the room. The head landed in the far corner, facing them, and it continued to shriek orders to kill and to maim. Jack stumbled back and fell against the wall near the others, his eyes wide, his mouth unable to form intelligible words. The body was raising up in response to Chucky's demands. Mike glanced down, saw the twenty-five caliber pistol that Karen had dropped a few minutes before. He picked it up and worked the slide to clear the jam, and then aimed it at the body. Shoot him in the heart, Karen said, pulling Andy close. Mike took a deep, steadying breath and squeezed the trigger. The report seemed muffled in comparison to the bigger thirty-eight. The round struck the torso in the middle of its chest, passing through and splattering the wall behind it with the thick, viscous fluid. No! Chucky screamed. God, no, not now! The torso collapsed to the carpet, leaking black blood and went still. Chucky looked up at them as the evil light seemed to fade from his blue eyes. Hi, I'm Chucky. The voice changed then, as if Charles Lee Ray had finally gone, and was replaced by the pleasant timber of a real good guy. Wanna play? Silence filled the apartment then, as each stared at the doll's remains. Finally, Mike turned to Jack, as the sound of approaching sirens filled the room. So, do you believe me now? Jack put a hand to his bleeding throat and nodded. <laughs> yeah, but who's going to believe me? Mike shrugged. We can worry about that later. Come on, help me up. Karen and Andy put arms around him and pulled him to his unsteady feet. Jack moved to his side and took Andy's place, supporting most of the man's weight as they stepped out into the hall and started for the apartment door. 
Andy lagged behind, turning in the bedroom door to stare at Chucky's remains. It wasn't over. He knew in his heart Chucky would move. Any second now. Hey, kiddo, Karen said as she came back to take his hand. Come on, we're going to go to the hospital with Mike. She flicked the bedroom light off, plunging the room into shadow. Chucky's blue eyes shone out like a star in the night. Karen grabbed the doorknob and began to pull it closed. Andy shifted as it swung along its path, keeping his eye on the evil doll until the last second. The End <laughs> okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue of the fan novelization of Child's Play Part 1 by Jeremy Terry. Really enjoyed getting into the head of Charles Lee Ray and Eddie uh, there in the beginning of this prologue. Got a little more detail, which I really enjoyed, of what was going down before the events at the beginning of the movie Child's Play. I love that Mike Norris was uh, incognito, in disguise, uh, to trick the Lakeshore Strangler into attacking him. I really love how that led us into the scene where Charles, you know, runs, Eddie drives off. Now we know why Eddie did drive off. It wasn't just because he was a pussy, but it's because, you know, Charles Lee Ray scared the shit out of him. Um, but yeah, so I really enjoyed having a reason why Eddie drove off a reason why Charles was running from Mike. And I love that uh, while dying, Charles, his narcissistic, psychopathic uh, mentality was like, I can't die. I'm the main character of the story. What the fuck's going on? Really love that. And I love that we actually got a reaction and fear from Mike as the Dambala chant happen and the unnatural storms happening, the clouds he sees, and that he's seeing his own fear and stuff manifest in this cloud. Um, I love that uh, Jeremy is tying the backstory, uh, keeping with what Matthew Costello did with Child's Play 2 and 3 novelizations with uh, Mina Ray, or Mina Ray, I can't remember how I pronounced it in the other two books. Um, the whole fact that she was a little person and, uh, you know, Chucky despised that, and now he's going to get, <laughs> he's going to become a little doll. It's just so perfect, karmic justice. Love that backstory. Love that he was sacrificing people to Dambala. And uh, really enjoyed hearing Eddie call him Chucky, you know, before he was the doll. Dug that. I know Chucky's a nickname for Charles. I'm not saying I don't know that, but it's just really cool to actually hear him called that. And great uh, throwback to uh, Tiffany and to the whole plot uh, storyline from Curse of Chucky. You know, uh, great job there about him seeing the pregnant lady on the side. Eddie wouldn't know that, you know, he's kidnapping the pregnant lady on the side or whatever. But yeah, great stuff. Cannot wait to see what Jeremy does with the rest of the story. Uh, big thank you to Sean Campbell for guest voicing Mike Norris. He will actually be voicing him anytime Mike Norris pops up in this book. And Garbage Pell Queen, thank you. Uh, you're going to be hearing her. She voiced Andy in the Child's Play 2 novelization uh, back whenever I uh, put that one out. She's returned to voice Andy again to keep with the continuity. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 1 and 2 of Child's Play, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Great job, Jeremy. I'm really enjoying this book. I'm reading it for the first time as I narrate it, and it's a lot of fun already, and Chucky hasn't even taken center stage yet. I cannot wait to see uh, the psychology that you throw in there, you know, with how this is affecting Andy when Chucky shows up and everything, being his friend, um, you know, especially without having that father figure in his life, and also the psychology of what the detective and his mom and others think Whenever, you know, they're having to ask themselves, is Andy actually hurting people? Uh, you know, because of course they're not going to believe it's a doll. Uh, and then we get that awesome scene with no batteries in the doll. Getting a little ahead of myself. Point is, I really enjoyed tonight's chapters. And a big shout out to our guest voices, Garbage Pell Queen. Thank you not only for making that awesome slashy read, 
Garbage Pell Kid card for me that you see at the beginning of these uploads, but also for returning to the audiobook series of Child's Play to once again, retroactively, playing Andy. Uh, that's right, this is the same voiceover actress who uh, helped out and voiced Andy in the Child's Play 2 audiobook. And once again, nailing it. Great job as Andy. Thank you for returning, not just for continuity's sake, but for returning period. It's always a joy to have you on board. Also, big shout out to the voice of Mr. Criswell. It was actually Landon Turner, the author of the Friday the 13th 4 and 5 fan novelizations that I've narrated here on the channel. And just between you and me, shh, all you slashaholics, just between me and y'all, he's actually working on Friday the 13th Part 7, the new Blood fan novelization right now, and yes, it will be narrated here on the channel in the not-too-distant future. But until then, really enjoying this one, Jeremy Terry. Cannot wait to see what comes next, how you handle certain scenes, uh, the psychology, what's going through Andy's head, maybe even Chucky's head. Uh, really excited to find out, and I hope you listeners are too. And, you know, if Jeremy wants to throw in a quick little scene somewhere where Chucky kills Mr. Criswell, you know, and ask him if he's enjoying his job here in this life or something, eh, it'd be a little added bonus. Okay, Slashaholics, that was Chapter 3 of Child's Play, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Sorry for the short upload tonight. I'll be back very soon with more chapters. I'm really excited about this book, guys, and I hope you are too. Um, things are getting eerie. Chucky's obviously, you know, getting the lay of the land of his new surroundings, and I can't wait to see how Jeremy handles uh, maybe in Chucky's head or Andy's as Andy's communicating with Chucky and Maggie's kind of seeing it from, you know, the peripheral and everything while, like, the news is on. I'm sure that's coming in the next chapter. I'm really curious to see how he's going to bounce back between the characters. Are we going to know what Chucky's thinking when he's watching the news about Charles Lee Ray dying and all that? Um, really excited about this book. And I love that the neighbors' names were Glenn and Brenda. I caught it there, Jeremy. Uh, I see what you were doing there. Let me know what you guys thought of tonight's chapter. Okay, Slashaholics, that was chapters 4 and 5 of Child's Play, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Really enjoyed tonight's chapters. Again, as always, Garbage Pell Queen, great job as Andy. Whoever's voicing Chucky, welcome to the show. You did a great job. Yeah, I know, that was me. And I know some people think I sound like a, uh, what was the insult I got back on Child's Play 2? I think it was, um... He, cut, he said I sounded, some, some troll said I sounded like a gay Jack Nicholson on Family Guy. Well, you know what? I have fun voicing Chucky, and that's all that matters. I'm sorry if it's not close enough to Brad. Uh, I'm doing the best I can. God damn it, I'm trying, okay? But uh, I want to know what you guys thought. I really did enjoy not just getting the scene from the movie playing out uh, like, like novelizations do, but Jeremy took us into the head of not only Maggie and what she was feeling whenever she was seeing all this stuff happening and her irritation thinking it was Andy. But I love the Stephen King cameo thing with the It book, and I love, absolutely love, that we got to get into Chucky's head. You know, we're not going to play the guessing game like the movie did. Is it Andy? Is it the doll? Uh, we already know it's the doll, so I'm really looking forward to this to see how it goes on from here. It was fun getting into Chucky's head for that small moment for his first kill as the doll, and uh, I can't wait to see what happens next time. What's going to be on his mind whenever he's going out to find Eddie? You know, whenever he's trying to find uh, Andy, whenever Andy's being held at the hospital. So many possibilities coming up. Uh, I always thought Maggie's death was brutal, gruesome played out really well in the book. Amazing job, Jeremy. Everybody, let me know what you think of the book so far, if you're enjoying the narrations and Jeremy's story, and I'll be back very soon with more of Child's Play by Jeremy Terry. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 6 and 7 of Child's Play, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Really enjoyed these chapters. I always hated that the detective you know, just was kind of like hitting on the mom while suspecting the child of being a child murderer. 
and he was kind of a smart ass about it, you know, even in his head. Uh, first off, big thanks to Garbage Pell Queen for voicing Andy and Sean Campbell for voicing Mike Norris. Uh, great jobs, guys. Love having you on board for this. It's going to be a lot of fun to finish this out. Uh, sorry that I haven't dropped a chapter of this in a couple weeks. I was trying to get the Halloween 5 book going, get a few chapters out in time for Halloween, and over here where I live, the weather changed, like got really cold all of a sudden, then warmed up and got super cold again. I ended up with strep throat, was in bed for three days. Uh, after being down for a couple days with a sore throat, it turned into strep. So I'm just now back, going to get back into the rotation of dropping at least a couple chapters of each of these two books weekly. Uh, and when I finish these, I'm going to get back to uh, maybe Freddy vs. Ash and uh, Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. But yes, Jeremy Terry is doing a great job with this book. Uh, I do enjoy the aspect of Chucky back there talking to a six-year-old, saying, yeah, your Aunt Maggie was a bitch and deserved it. Uh, you know, just hearing Andy tell his mom that, Chucky said, Maggie's a bitch and deserved it. It's like, God damn. <laughs> God damn it, Andy. Your aunt's a bitch. But, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys thought of the chapters tonight. I thought Sean and Garbage Pell Queen did a great job. Really, really enjoying having them on board. Glad we can keep the continuity with Andy uh, from Child's Play 2, the audiobook. And it's always a pleasure to have my good friend Sean involved with anything here on the channel. Um, curious to see where this story keeps going with all the added stuff and backstory we're getting with the characters. Tonight was a little more straightforward from the movie, with a few little extra details. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying the way it's going. I'm enjoying, you know, the whole thing of Chucky. We're getting in his head a little bit as he's watching the door. You know, he could have slipped up and answered Andy at the end, but he knew that Andy's mom was still at the door. So, I like to be hugged. Yeah. Um, but I'll be back very soon with... This has been Chapter 8 of Child's Play by Jeremy Terry. I apologize for the short upload, and I also apologize that it took so long to release. My microphone that I've had for a, quite a while now, a blue snowball, uh, started malfunctioning about a week and a half ago. It was cutting in and out when I tried to do anything for the channel, and uh, I tried narrating with my webcam camera while I was waiting on this new microphone to come in. Um, just didn't work. Uh, but everything should be good to go now. And I want to thank Sean Campbell, a longtime friend and co-host of shows here on the channel. Uh, he donated this microphone to the channel. It is amazing. I hope you all enjoy the clarity of it. I hope it sounds great. Uh, I really enjoyed Chapter 8 tonight. And uh, I'm really looking forward to finishing this book. Um, Jeremy Terry is doing a fantastic job uh, bringing the Child's Play movie to life as a novelization. Throwing in little... Uh, Horror movie cameos here and there, a little Stephen King reference, a little Candyman reference. Great stuff. He's really writing Chucky well. And uh, he actually finally finished uh, the entire novelization. The entire thing will be available in ebook form on the Patreon uh, later tonight, uh, just for patrons. And if you do actually join the Patreon and read it, Jeremy asks that you wait until the audiobook's complete. Uh, before sharing it uh, off of the Patreon. But if you're curious and want to read the ebook before I finish narrating it, you can find it on the Patreon page uh, right now, actually. So you can join for as low as uh, $1 to 2 to $5 a month. Uh, the ebook tier begins at the $5 tier. Let me know what you all thought of tonight's chapter if you're enjoying this book so far. And again, I apologize uh, for the delay since the last chapters. But uh, things should be moving back at a regular speed going forward. You know, two, three, four chapters a week of each book is my plan. Uh, Jeremy's actually uh, about to start on his novelization of Jason Goes to Hell. And Adam Marcus is actually going to help him with anything he needs, any information, uh, script questions, things like that. For anybody that doesn't know, Adam Marcus wrote and directed Jason Goes to Hell. So um, I'm really excited about that. It's kind of a little collaboration. Uh, some of my story ideas are going to pop in. Original story ideas for Jason Goes to Hell uh, are going to be used. Really excited about that. Um, okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapters 9 and 10 of Child's Play 
by Jeremy Terry. Really enjoyed these chapters. Love this part of the movie. One of my favorite parts. Not just the, the whole thing at the police station. You know, where they're really... Because, I mean, if you'd never seen the movie... I guess a part of you might think that, that Andy is losing it. He's just taking stuff he's hearing on the news, you know, and making it fit with his little delusion. But just knowing that Chucky's sitting there listening to everything that's going on and getting a kick out of it, and he killed Eddie Caputo, it, it's just, it's it's funny in a morbid way. But I really love uh, when Mom gets home with Chucky, batteries fall out of the box, you know, and she threatens Chucky to the point you know, where he can't uh, ignore it anymore. He's got to reveal his secret or he's going to burn. Even though he says he's indestructible, right? Um, you know, I guess on Looney Tunes, that guy could have done that to the frog, you know, to prove to people that he could sing. Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. A lot of, like, younger people aren't going to get that reference, probably. Uh, but, yeah, so... It's kind of the same scenario there. Could have got the frog to talk, just like Mom got the good guy to talk. Um, I love that when he came to, he is just pissed off because this bitch has fucked up his plans. Uh, you know, just biting her. I mean, come on. <laughs> biting her twice. <clears throat> Go, Charles. Um, yeah, so I've got nothing but good things to say about these chapters. I love the way uh, that Jeremy's writing this book. I'm enjoying the story, even though I've seen the movie a thousand times. So I hope you're all enjoying it as well. Losing my voice over here doing the Chucky cackle too many times. Um, I hope my Chucky voice is okay. I know I'm no Brad Dourif, but I was having fun with the angry Chucky. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'd love to hear what you guys thought. Alex, this has been chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14 of Child's Play by Jeremy Terry. <laughs> Sorry. I love doing the Chucky laugh. But anyways, um, Jeremy's doing an amazing job with this book. Sorry it took me a minute to get back to it. Uh, that's why I gave you uh, all some extra chapters tonight. Uh, really enjoying the story so far, you know, just like I love the movie. Uh, I, I enjoy the back and forth between Mike and Karen. You know, as somebody that's seen the movie so much and loved the series, it's like, come on, dude, just believe her. But, you know, you put yourself in that situation. That's one of the last things you're going to believe, you know, in that moment. Um, I really enjoy how Jeremy, uh, how do I put it? Jeremy gave us, like, the perspective of Chucky, you know, watching and stalking uh, Mike at the police station. Really enjoyed that. And how he went to the car, opened it, got in. Just getting into Chucky's head at all has been a lot of fun in this book. Uh, the fact that Dambala's getting mentioned more. I hope there's more Dambala stuff coming up. Uh, that's, such, that's such a rich lore to dig into. And I'm glad that Jeremy's uh, you know, got the guts to give us stuff that wasn't in the movie. I know some authors that write some of these fan novelizations and stuff, they're afraid to use their own creative input. But I really appreciate what Jeremy's doing by going against that norm. And, you know, not just writing a shot-for-shot shot novelization of the movie, but giving us a little more, you know, just enough that it, it's like a whole new experience. Uh, so thank you, Jeremy, for that. I'm really enjoying that. I love the Freddy reference tonight. <laughs> Freddy Krueger, eat your heart out! Um, yeah, so this has been a great book so far. I cannot wait to jump back into it again after tonight. Let me know what you all thought of tonight's chapters in the book so far, I should say. Um, oh, by the way, Jeremy, the red and blue blur it was actually... Because uh, you, you mentioned that Mike saw the uh, shot at the red and blue blur or saw the red and blue blur. Uh, that was actually the name of Superman on Smallville, the TV show. They couldn't call him Superman once he went to Metropolis. Uh, but people would always see like a flat... He wore like a, a red shirt with a blue jacket. And people would only see like a quick blur. And it was always red and blue. So they called him the red and blue blur. <laughs> so when I was narrating the chapters tonight and I got to that part, I kind of chuckled a little bit and had to redo the line. Um, but yeah, anyways, great job on these chapters, Jeremy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, great job, Sean Campbell. Again, back voicing Mike Norris, the detective. Sean's a great friend. Really appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much for taking part. And if anybody listening would ever like to voice a character in any of the audiobooks we do here on the channel, 
If you're a patron at the $10 tier or higher, you have the option to voice a character in any book that I narrate. Uh, okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 of Child's Play, the novelization by Jeremy Terry. Once again, loving this book. Such a great job, Jeremy. Cannot wait to see what you're going to do with Jason Goes to Hell. It's going to be great. Um, as far as the stuff we covered tonight, you know, I love the fact that even at six years old, Andy knows when he's being bullshitted and when somebody's disingenuine like that doctor. I can't imagine the terror of knowing that the doll had threatened him, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. So that's all Andy knows is that he had to tell. Now he's dead. You know, Chucky's going to find him. The adults aren't going to help him. They're not going to listen to him, et cetera, et cetera. Very scary stuff. Great job getting that across in the book, Jeremy. Uh, great job, again, by Sean Campbell and Garbage Bell Queen doing Andy and Mike's voices. Loving that. Uh, if anybody listening is a patron or wants to become a patron of the $10 tier or higher and you want to voice a character in the book, in future books, excuse me, uh, you can do so anytime you want to. All you got to do is reach out and let me know that you're a $10 patron or higher and you want to voice a character and I'll set it up for you. Uh, also, right now, if you're a $10 patron or higher or become one uh, by February 1st, or if you make a $10 donation to the channel uh, through PayPal, Cash App, or getting a cameo, uh, you can actually get entered into a drawing where the winner will get a death scene in the Jason Goes to Hell uh, novelization by Jeremy Terry. Uh, not only will you get a death scene uh, as yourself, you'll get to pick how Jason does it within reason. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. If you want to do that, like I said, uh, look at the description or pinned comment below on how to donate or become a patron. Um, then we got into chapter 16 tonight. Uh, you know, the, the stuff with Mike and Karen, that's all great. I love that Karen got to Charles Lee Ray's house and we got to see, uh, you know, a little more than the movie would show into Charles Lee Ray's, uh, I don't know what, what you'd call it, into his psyche a little bit. He's got these murals on his wall. Uh, the like half man, half snake stuff, the Dambala stuff, uh, digging the hell out of this stuff, man. Jeremy, you're really knocking it out of the park. Great visualization there with the words. Uh, reading this has been a lot of fun, not just narrating it, but getting to read it. Uh, this movie has always deserved a novelization, and this one is fan-fucking-tastic. Uh, the scene we got between John and Chucky was brutal, and I thought it was even more brutal, more revealing than the movie did it justice. I think Jeremy did it so much better. A lot more detail. Uh, you know, just how joyful and uh, humorous it was to Chucky uh, that he was going to be a six-year-old again, you know? And I've always wondered, you know, if, if Chucky... I guess the TV show has kind of answered this. Uh, Chucky becomes Andy. Andy would become... would go into the doll, right? That would be an interesting dynamic there. <laughs> Um, but anyways, um, the fact that John, who does this voodoo stuff, and I'm sure I pronounced some words wrong during that chapter. If I did, I apologize. Um, it was fun playing a guy that's dying. Uh, it was fun being Chucky tonight, especially with uh, how humorous it was to him, uh, and then how pissed he was. Um, but, you know, John's supposed to be this, like, voodoo, uh, you know, controller of the gree grees and everything, and... Uh, he, he reached his breaking point of nobility. I loved that line. I think we all have that. We just, you know, we got to be pushed to that limit. And it's like, okay, fuck it. Here you go. Uh, but yeah, getting my femur shattered might, might do it before even getting my arm broken. Um, brutal stuff. Loved when Karen and Mike got there. Um, and I love that Karen's not alone on this. Mike knows what's going on after uh, the last narration I put out uh, with Chucky attacking him at the car. I really enjoyed the intensity and fear uh, that was portrayed on the page there in the hospital, you know, with Andy knowing that Chucky's coming. Whenever he sees him climbing up the wall and this little six-year-old has to put it together in his head a game plan, you know. Uh, I love the little scene with Mona that we got, the little girl that gave Chucky, you know, a little quick trip to Andy's room. 
I love that later on Mona was the one that explained that to Karen. Just really enjoying and loving all the little extra things that Jeremy's throwing into this book, into this story. He did an amazing job. Lots of hard work, I can tell, and it is appreciated. Uh, like I said, just great visualizations here. The whole shock treatment scene was gory as hell, insane, painful to even think about. But, you know, just the intensity of Andy escaping the room after tricking Chucky, you know, getting that, knowing that he only had time to try that last key, you know, and if it didn't work, it was over. But he got it in there, getting hit by Chucky by that pan, oh my God, bam. Um, you know, Mike actually knowing that Chucky's real, but his partner Jack's, you know, calling Karen crazy and shit like that. Just to see that Mike has come full circle here. He, he's actually getting upset. He really cares for Karen and Andy. Cannot wait to put out the conclusion of this book in the next narration. Only two chapters left. It's coming, folks. And I hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I know I will. Um, things are getting serious for Chucky. He knows that uh, he's going to be—he's mortal. You know, he can die if he doesn't uh, get a new body. So, cannot wait to dive back into this one. It's going to be very soon. Hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought of tonight's chapters in the comments below. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 20 and 21, the conclusion of the fan novelization of Child's Play by Jeremy Terry. And I gotta say, Jeremy, I really hope in the future, like after Jason goes to hell and maybe Hellraiser 2, whatever you got planned, I hope you will revisit Chucky. Because out of all the slashers, he's gotten the worst treatment in book form. Maybe... Maybe Leatherface has gotten the worst, but Chucky's right there with him. Um, so we would love, I know I'm speaking for myself and I think for a lot of fans of the channel and you, uh, that we would all love to, to read or hear uh, your version of The Bride of Chucky, Seed of Chucky, uh, you know, all of them in the future. You know, the sky's the limit, buddy, because this was great. You took a classic slasher movie that, that really deserved a book and you gave us one. You put your hard work and talent and creativity into this book. And you brought the story to life. And it wasn't just a carbon copy of the movie. You took chances, which is what I want to see from fan novelizations. That's what I look for. I look for uh, taking chances, gambling a little bit, you know. Throwing out your own creative original ideas into this story that we all know and love. And making it your own while still delivering a novelization for the hardcore fans of it. You know, and also adding a little something new to it. Not too little. It's got, you know, it's, it can't be too little. It can't be too much. You found the perfect balance. And I think everybody who's listened to this book so far loves it as much as I did. Uh, I really enjoyed the intensity of these last two chapters. I loved getting into Chucky's head. You know, I loved finding out how he got to the apartment, you know, with that other boy and everything. That was pretty cool. Um, what he was thinking when all this was going on. And just the intensity of the, that final showdown with everybody was great. Um, Jack showing up and not believing it until, you know, he's literally getting his throat ripped out. Just an amazing job, Jeremy. You really knocked this one out of the park. You brought us home. The conclusion was amazing. Totally one of my favorite books of all time here on the channel. It deserves to be published. It deserves to be the official novelization, in my opinion. I think Matthew Costello would be proud of your work on this, the guy that wrote Part 2 and 3. Um, I even told him that when you started writing this about it, I did an interview with him, and he thought it was really cool that somebody was taking, on, you know, taking up the mantle and writing this fan novelization. And I hate even calling it a fan novelization because, like I said, it is just as good as any novelization of any slasher that I've read here on the channel, if not better than most. Uh, great job. Cannot wait to narrate Jason Goes to Hell that you're working on. Um, please, everybody, please drop a thank you to Jeremy in the comments section below. Uh, this was a really great job by him. It took a lot of time and effort for him to make this for us, so please, please send him your thanks in the comments. Let us know what you thought of the book. Uh, tonight's chapter and the book as a whole in the comment section below. We'd really appreciate to hear from you. I love hearing from you guys and gals and discussing these with you. If you're listening to the unabridged version, thanks for sticking it out. Hope you enjoyed it. 
Uh, you just finished listening to book number 69 on the channel, folks. I mean, come on. Right? Right? <laughs> or as Chucky would say, it's book number 69. <laughs> I'm going to miss not getting to voice Chucky for a while. I might not do the best uh, Chucky impersonation, Brad DeRiff impersonation, but sometimes I feel like I'm nailing it with a laugh and when he's really getting pissed, you know, and cussing and stuff, maybe I get a little closer, but I'm doing the best I can, kind of made it my own. I wanted to keep just enough, at least a small percentage of what Brad sounds like with my version of Chucky. That way, at least there's like something familiar about it. And I hope I brought that to the table, because if not, I can see how it could be hard to listen to. Um, but yeah, just let me know what you all thought. I'll be back very soon with more Slasher Mayhem here on the channel. Uh, be sure to check out all the audiobooks. You know, we're uh, Friday the 13th Part 7, I think, is going to be like number 70, if I'm getting the numbers right on these, <laughs> um, for the channel. Lots of cool podcasts here on the channel. Great uh, movie riffs where we make fun of uh, really shitty or uh, cheesy horror movies. And sometimes slasher movies that we actually like, but still have some fun, you know, poking fun at them. Lots of stuff to enjoy here. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel, click the like button, drop a comment, uh, and uh, please consider supporting the channel through Patreon, or doing a PayPal donation, uh, Cash App donation, or even ordering a $10 Cameo video from the channel, uh, where I can wish you a happy birthday, anniversary, if you want to ask some questions, I can answer them through it, pep talk, whatever you need. Uh, you can uh, order the video and ask for it to be from me, from any of the other uh, people that work here on the channel, or me uh, doing a video in the voice of Chucky, or Freddy, or any character that I've uh, done a voice for here on the channel. Like I said, it's only $10 for a cameo video. Uh, if you look at the description below or the pinned comments, you'll find the Patreon, e uh, excuse me, the Patreon address, the email to donate uh, through PayPal, the Cash App handle to make a donation, and the address to go to Cameo and order a Cameo video from us. It's all the information is there. You're going to be helping this channel continue to go and grow for years to come. It's the only way to fund the channel since we can't be a YouTube partner because of the content. Uh, so we can't monetize the channel for ad money. So please consider doing that. Have a great night. And until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood, 80 Slasher Librarian, saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. Remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. And, for this last little Chucky narration, most importantly, you can't keep a good guy down. hee <laughs> hee!